in this lesson, we want to start talking about the properties of matrices. And specifically here, we want to do an introduction to matrices. All right, so over the course of the last few lessons, we learned how to solve linear systems with matrix methods. Specifically, we looked at the Gaussian elimination and the Gauss-Jordan elimination methods. So at this point, you had some exposure to matrices, but over the course of the next few lessons, what we want to do is just expand our limited knowledge and build a foundation for some other methods that can be used to solve linear systems. So when we talk about a matrix in math, normally we're speaking about an ordered array of numbers, or you might say a rectangular array of numbers. Now, when we talk about what's inside of a matrix, these numbers here, so for example, in this guy right here, you see if I read across, I have one, negative seven, five, and 13. And then here I have three, negative nine, two, and negative four. And then here I have six, negative two, one, and five. So all of these numbers inside of these brackets represent the elements or the entries of the matrix. Okay, so you might hear those two words interchangeably. Now, when we talk about a matrix, it's important to know when we're referring to a row or we're referring to a column. So you see you have an image of a guy rowing a boat, and that's meant to represent a row. Okay, so a row goes across. So you see you have a row here, a row here, and a row here. So this matrix has three rows. And you'll remember this from, again, our lesson on Gaussian elimination and Gauss-Jordan elimination, where we kind of labeled these rows. We said this was row one, this was row two, and this was row three. And I made that a B, I don't know why. So this was row three. Okay, so three rows, and then you see the image or the picture for a column, okay? Columns are vertical. So this is going up and down. So this is vertical, this is vertical, this is vertical, this is vertical. So this is a column one, this is a column two, this is a column three, and this is my column four, okay? So this guy has three rows and it has four columns. So when we look at that information, we can say it's a three by four matrix, okay? This is known as the order or the dimensions of the matrix. So I'm just gonna write here that this is a three by four matrix. Again, that's called the order or the dimensions of the matrix. Now, in this example, what would the order be? Well, again, if I go through, I can say I have a row here. I can say I have a row here, a row here, a row here. And finally, let me make that better, a row here. So you have five rows, right? One, two, three, four, five. Again, the rows are going across. Just picture the guy rowing the boat, okay? That's how you remember. The columns are going up and down, okay? So we're gonna say that we have one column here, we have a column here, a column here, and a column here. So you have five rows and four columns. The rows always come first, okay? The rows always come first. So it's a five by four, okay? When we're talking about the order, or again, the dimensions of the matrix. What about this guy? So here we have what? We have a row here, so this is row one. We have another row here. Again, the rows go across. Then the columns are up and down. So this is a column here, this is a column here, this is a column here. So this guy, if I talk about the order, it's a two by three, right? Two rows, three columns. So it's a two by three. All right, so in a lot of cases, we're gonna use capital letters to name matrices. And this has a lot of different uses. Mostly if you're going to kind of reuse a matrix over and over again, you might be performing several operations with it. So let's say you write capital letter A is equal to, and again, you have these elements, you have four and two in the first row and negative three and negative one in the second row. Well, I might have to do several things with A, so it's just useful to name it. That way I can keep talking about it without relisting the elements each time, okay? Now, another thing you might wanna know is that if a matrix has the same number of rows as it has columns, like we have here, it's referred to as a square matrix, right? So this guy has two rows and it has two columns, okay? So this is a two by two, otherwise known as a square matrix, okay? So if it's a three by three, a four by four, a 117 by 117, again, same number of rows as columns, it's a square matrix. So again, we have another example of a square matrix. So this is matrix B. And again, we have three rows. So one, two, and three. Again, they're going across and you have three columns, okay? Again, the columns are going up and down. This is a three by three matrix, or again, it's a square matrix. 
All right, so you also have a row matrix and a column matrix. So a row matrix is a matrix with only one row, and then a column matrix is a matrix with only one column. So this D here is an example of a row matrix. You only have one row here, okay? You've got several columns, so column one, column two, column three. So the order here is a one by three. And again, this is a row matrix because it only has a single row. Now, E is gonna be an example of a column matrix because it only has one column, okay? But it also has four rows, so it has a row one. Let me make that a capital letter. So a row one, a row two, a row three, and a row four. So this guy is a four by one, if we're thinking about the order. And again, it's a column matrix because there's just one single column. All right, let's talk a little bit more about notation. This is something you definitely need to know as we go deeper into this topic. So generically speaking, you'll probably see this in your book. You have this capital letter A and it's equal to, inside of the brackets, you have all these lowercase a's and you have this subscript associated with each kind of entry or lowercase a. So each guy here, let's say I start with this one right here. So this is a sub one one, okay? So the lowercase a is just a matter of having a capital A here. Okay, if I had a capital letter B, this would be a lowercase b. If I had a capital letter C, lowercase c, so on and so forth. The one one there is meant to say where I am in the matrix. Okay, it's like a location. So the first number, okay, the one here, the first one, tells me what row I'm in. And the second one tells me which column I'm in. Well, in this one, at the top, I'm in the first row in the first column. If I move one to the right, now I have a sub one two. So this guy right here is in the first row, second column. Move to the right, I have A sub one, three. Again, I'm staying in the same row, so I'm still having a row position of one, but my column is just increasing as I move to the right. So here it was one, here it was two, now it's three. Okay, but the row always stayed the same. And I'm gonna continue out till I get to A sub one N. So I'm still in the first row, but I'm in the nth column, okay? So then this notation as we go down, you see that in this case, all the way to the left, the column stays the same. It's always a one, right? Because I'm in the first column, but the row is now increasing as I move down. So we end up down here with the A sub M1. And if we go all the way here to the bottom right, I have A sub MN. So this tells me that what? For this matrix, it's an M by N, right? It's got M rows and it's got N columns. So generally speaking, that's what you're going to see. But you need to know how to find specific entries. They might ask you, hey, what's the value of something like A sub three, three, okay? So what that means is to go and find this entry in the third row in the third column. So I would say, okay, this is the third row, third column. So that's this guy right here, okay? Whatever that happens to be. In this case, it's generic, but in a normal matrix, you'd have some kind of number or symbol, or you'd have something there that you could say this is equal to this. So generically in your textbook, what they're going to write is they're going to say A sub I J. And again, all this means is that it's the element that's going to be in the ith row, or you could say row I, and the column J, right? Or the Jth column, if you want to say it that way. It's always row first and column second. Now, one thing I want to call your attention to, because this does cause some confusion, if you see it with commas, it's really the same thing. So I could say that A sub three, two, this is really the same as if I said A sub three and then put a comma there for the two. So some people get confused by that. It's just a difference in notation. If you have numbers involved that have two digits, you need to use a comma so that you understand what it is, okay? Let's say I had A sub three and then 12. Well, you don't know what this is. Is this A sub 31, two? Is this A sub three, 12? What is it? So that's why you'd put a comma in between them to say, hey, this location is on the third row, 12th column. Okay, so that's when you definitely want to use a comma. All right, so to give a little example, suppose we have uppercase B and it's equal to, in our first row, we have one, negative five, nine. In our second row, we have negative seven, four, and 12. So let's say I ask you to find lowercase B sub two, three. Okay, sub two, three. So again, it's row first, so this is the row, and then this is the column, okay? So what is in the second row? So second row is down here, and what's in the third column? That's here. So it's gonna be this guy right here. 
So I could say this is equal to 12. Okay, and that's all you want to do if you get this as a question. Let's say I wanted to find B sub 1, 2. Again, the first number, which is this 1, is the row. This guy is the column, the second one. So where's row 1? That's here. It's on the top. Column 2 is here. Okay, so that's going to be negative 5. Very, very easy. Suppose I gave you something like, let me just kind of erase this one. Suppose I gave you B sub 3, 2. B sub 3, 2. What's the answer there? Well, I know that I only have one, two rows, so I can't find a third row. So they might give you this as a trick question, right? There is a second column, but there's not a third row. So this element doesn't exist, okay? So you could just write does not exist. All right, so another thing that you might see in this section, it's pretty short and there's not a lot of questions, but they're gonna talk to you about how to determine if two matrices are equal. So the rule is that two matrices are equal if and only if they have the same size, okay, so the same order. In other words, one is a three by three, the other one's a three by three. One is a three by four, the other one's a three by four. They've got to have the exact same order, or you could say have the same size. And then each corresponding element has to be the same, okay, has to be the same. So let's say, for example, we have A and it's equal to, we have two and X in the first row, Z and five in the second row, and we have B and it's equal to, we have Y and 3 in the first row and 4 and W in the second row. So we might ask, what are the values for the variables that make the matrix equation true if we said that A is equal to B, okay? And all you'd have to do is kind of say, okay, well, I've got a 2 here and a Y here, so Y has to be equal to 2, okay? And then you'd say, okay, I have a Z here and a 4 here, so Z has to be equal to 4, okay? You get the idea. This is very simple. Then I have an X here and a three here. So X has to be equal to three. And then lastly, I have a W here and a five here. So W has to be equal to five. Because these guys are only gonna be equal. If we kind of set this up and say, okay, we have two. X again was going to be three. And then Z was four. And we had five as W. So we have this and we'll say it's equal to this. So two, three, four, five. Okay, kind of trivial. And it seems like, you know, why would you go through this? But it is something that is important to understand. So they will give you kind of questions like this. So every corresponding element has to be the same and the order has to be the same. So you have a two in row one, column one. You have a two in row one, column one. You have a three in row one, column two. A three in row one, column two. Right, so on and so forth. You have a four here and a four here in row two, column one. And then you have a five here, five here in row two, column two. So every entry has to be exactly the same and the order has to be the same. All right, one more of these and it's a little bit more complex. So again, find the values for the variables that would make the equation. We'd say A is equal to B, make that true. So here, all we're gonna do is end up setting up an equation in each case. So we would say three X is equal to nine. And so in this case, we know that X is three. Let me kind of do this off to the side. So we know X would be three because three X equals nine. We divide both sides by three, X is equal to three. That's very easy. Let's kind of grab a few more and let me kind of just erase that. So we know we got this one done. So let me just highlight the ones that we know. And this one right here, will have W minus one and that's gonna be equal to six. So let's solve that real quick. So we have W minus one equals six, add one to each side of the equation, we get W is equal to seven. So W equals seven. And again, very easy, you just have to go through these. It's more time consuming than anything. So you have Z plus two and that's gonna be equal to 12. So Z plus two equals 12, subtract two away from each side of the equation. You're gonna find that Z is equal to 10. So we've got those done, so now we just need to do these. So I've got 19 here and I've got a 5y minus one there. So 5y minus one equals 19. And again, just add one to both sides. You get 5y is equal to 20. Divide both sides by five, you get y equals four. So we have y equals four. And let's go back up. All right, so two more. So I've got this 15 here. And we're gonna set that equal to 4k plus three. So 4k plus three equals 15. 4k plus three equals 15. Let's subtract three away from each side of the equation. 4K is equal to 12, divide both sides by four. We get that K is equal to three, okay? 
So just one more now. Again, I know this is tedious, but it's just something that you might get asked. So it is important to cover it. So then the last one here, we have that Q minus nine is gonna be equal to 11. So Q minus nine, Q minus nine equals 11. Again, add nine to both sides. We get that Q is equal to 20, okay? So these are the values for the variables that are gonna make that equation A equals B true. You're just looking at the corresponding entries. We know that in each case I have three rows and two columns. Okay, so that's the first thing. The matrices can only be equal if and only if they're the same order. Okay, in this case, they're each a three by two. And the corresponding elements are the same. Okay, so that means that nine and three X have to be the same or equal. So we say three X equals nine. We find that X equals three, right? You do that for each one and then you find out the values for the variables. Again, we found that X is three, Z is 10, W is seven. Y is four, K is three, and Q is 20. So that's what you do if you get this as a question on your homework or on a test. In this lesson, we wanna to continue to talk about the properties of matrices. And specifically here, we're gonna talk about adding and subtracting matrices. All right, so we're gonna begin our lesson with the addition of matrices. First and foremost, we can only add two matrices together if they're the same size, or again, as we talked about in the last lesson, the same order. So these are the kind of dimensions of the matrix. It's how many rows you have by how many columns you have. So for example, if we had a three by four matrix, that matrix has three rows and four columns. And if you had two three by four matrices, you could add those two together. Okay, that would be perfectly fine. But if you had a three by four matrix and you had a two by three matrix, you couldn't combine those two with addition. That operation would be said to be undefined. So the first thing you would do is verify that, again, they're the same size or order. Once that's done, then you can simply add the two matrices together by adding the corresponding elements. It's actually a very easy process overall. So suppose I have matrix A, and matrix A is equal to, in the first row we have the elements three and negative one, in the second row we have the elements five and two. Then suppose I also have this matrix B, and in matrix B, we say this is equal to, in the first row, negative four and three, in the second row, one and seven. So in each case, I have two rows and two columns, so they're each going to be a two by two matrix, so I can find the sum of A and B. So to do that, if I want to find the sum of A plus B, it's just equal to what? Well, I'm just gonna sum the corresponding elements. So all that means is I just take the element in the first row and the first column, okay, and the element in the first row and the first column in each case, and I find the sum. So what is three plus negative four? Okay, and we'll do that in a minute. And then we just go through and do the same thing for kind of each case. So here I would have negative one plus three. So negative one plus three. Then down here I would have five plus, over here I have a one. Then I would have a two plus a seven. Okay, so that's all you're doing. You're just adding the corresponding elements from the two matrices. All right, so let's crank this out real quick. So we know that three plus negative four would give us negative one. Let me kind of slide down a little bit. So I'm just gonna say this is going to be negative one. Then down here, five plus one is going to give me six. And then negative one plus three is going to give me two. And then two plus seven is going to be nine, okay? So this is the matrix that is a result of adding A plus B. In your top row, you'd have negative one and two. In the bottom row, you'd have six and nine. All right, let's take a look at another example. So suppose now you have this as your matrix A and this as your matrix B. So if I wanna find the sum of A plus B, okay? First and foremost, I've gotta verify that the order is going to be the same in each case. So we see that for matrix A, I have three rows and three columns. So it's a three by three. And for matrix B, it's three rows and three columns. So again, it's a three by three. So because they're the same size or the same order or they have the same dimensions, however you wanna say that, we can add them together, right? We can find the sum. So again, to do this, it's very simple. I just add the corresponding elements. So if I start up here in row one, column one, I add those two guys together. And I'm just gonna do this right here. I don't need to write it out. So negative two plus negative one is going to be what? That's going to be negative three, okay? Then let me erase this and I'll highlight each one that I'm doing. So let's do this one now. So what is one plus six? That's going to be seven. And then what is seven plus two? That's going to be nine. Okay, so that's my first row that's done. 
So now let's move on here. And I'll just do these a row at a time now to make it a little bit faster. So what is 5 plus 8? That's going to give me 13. What is 6 plus 3? That's going to give me 9. What is 9 plus 4? That's going to give me 13. And then let me erase this. We'll go to this bottom row. So this and this. We'll say what is 1 plus 11? That's 12. What is 4 plus negative 6? That's going to be negative 2. And then lastly, what is 8 plus 10? That's 18. Okay, so this matrix here is the sum of the matrix A plus the matrix B. All right, now you can also add more than two matrices together. Again, they've all got to be the same order or the same size. And in this case, we have a matrix A, a matrix B, and a matrix C. And we're going to find the sum. So in each case, we have one, two, three, four rows and one column. So they're going to be a four by one matrix in each case. And remember in the last lesson, we said that these were a column matrix, right? Because there's only one single column. So to add these together, we do A plus B plus C. I want to just note here that the commutative property that we learned with addition of real numbers would hold here. I can add these in any order. Also the associative property, right? I can group the addition however I want. It won't change the sum either way because all I'm really doing is I'm adding things together. And with addition, we know that it's commutative. We know that it's associative. So nothing's really going to change the sum. So let's go ahead and set this up. So I'll just do this like this. And again, I'm just going to work here. I'll do three plus negative two plus negative eight. So three plus negative two is one. One plus negative eight is negative seven. Let me move down to kind of the next row. I'll do 5 plus 9 plus 14. 5 plus 9 is 14. 14 plus 14 is 28. And then let me move down to this row here. And I'll erase this one up here. So now I'm going to do negative 7 plus 3, which is going to give me negative 4. And then negative 4 plus 6 is going to give me 2. And then lastly, I'm going to have this bottom row. So I'm going to have 10 plus 1 plus 9. We know that 9 plus 1 is 10 and 10 plus 10 is 20, okay? So pretty easy overall. So A plus B plus C is going to give us this matrix that's still a column matrix, right? It's got the same dimensions as what we were adding. And we've got negative 7, 28, 2, and 20 as that column there, okay? So four rows, one column, it's still a four by one. All right, so let's move on and talk about subtracting matrices now. So again, when you subtract matrices, it's the same thing. You have to have two matrices with the same order or again, same size or dimensions, whatever you want to say. In this case, we're going to start out with A, which has the elements 5, 1 in the first row and 9, negative 5 in the second row. And then B, which has the elements 7, 2 in the first row and negative 9, 12 in the second row or the bottom row. So each of these is a two by two matrix, right? Two rows and two columns. Now, if we subtract, it's not commutative, right? We have to know that A minus B is not going to be equal to B minus A. You can kind of eyeball this and see that if I did, let's say this guy right here, so this five that's in row one, column one, and this seven right here that's in row one, column one. If I did matrix A minus matrix B, well, five minus seven would give me negative two. If I did matrix B minus matrix A, well, 7 minus 5 will give me positive 2. Those two elements wouldn't end up being the same, so those two matrices would not be equal, right? So A minus B would not be equal to B minus A. So for the purposes of what we're going to do here, I'm just going to do A minus B. And again, it's a very simple process. I'm just going to match up corresponding elements, and I'm going to do my subtraction in the correct order. So if I have A minus B, I'm going to take the element in matrix A and subtract away the corresponding element in matrix B. So in this case, I'm going to do 5 minus 7. Again, this is an A, this is in B. I'm going to do 1 minus 2, okay? I'm going to do a 9 minus a negative 9. Be careful there because you have a negative there, okay? So 9 minus negative 9. And then I'm going to do negative 5 minus 12, okay? So 5 minus 7, we know that's negative 2, okay? So this is going to be negative 2. And then 1 minus 2 is negative 1. 9 minus a negative 9 is 9 plus 9, that's 18. And then if we had negative 5 minus 12, that's negative 17, okay? So this would be the result of A minus B. Now, there's another way to do this, and this is probably what you're going to see in your textbook. I want you to remember that when we subtract integers, right, we learned that we could do A minus B, and I'm just using A and B as any real numbers, and this might get confusing, so let me use P and Q. So P 
minus q. p is a real number, q is a real number. We can say that p plus negative q is the same thing, right? So if I had five minus three, I could write this as five plus negative three, okay? So we're gonna use that same concept here, and we can say that if I have matrix A minus matrix B, I can say this is A plus the negative of B, okay? And we haven't talked about multiplication yet with matrices, we'll get to that in the next lesson. But essentially, if I have the negative of B, I can just go into my matrix B and I can change the sign of every element, okay? It's just like multiplying every element by negative one. So let's go ahead and set this up real quick. Let's say that we have the negative of B and I'll say this is equal to what? Instead of seven, I'll have negative seven. Instead of two, I'll have negative two. Instead of negative nine, I'll have positive nine. And instead of 12, I'll have negative 12. Now what I can do is I can say, let me make a little border here, A minus B, okay, so A minus B is equal to A plus the negative of B. So this will be equal to, let me set up this matrix. I'm gonna say five plus this guy right here, because I'm working with negative B. So five plus negative seven. Okay, and then I'd have nine plus nine, so nine plus nine. I would have one plus negative two, so one plus negative two. And then I would have negative five, negative five plus a negative 12. Now, because I switched this operation from subtraction to addition, once I'm adding the opposite, once I have this set up, I can add in any order, right? If I do negative seven plus five, or if I do five plus negative seven, I get the same answer but you can only do that once you've changed it into its opposite and you've set up the addition, okay? So don't make that mistake. You can't do that with subtraction. All right, so let's go ahead and crank this out. So five plus negative seven, again, we know this is going to be negative two. Nine plus nine, we know that's 18. And then one plus negative two, we know that's going to be negative one. And then negative five plus negative 12, again, we know that's negative 17. So it's the same answer, it's just a different way to kind of look at it. This might be easier for you, it might be harder for you, it doesn't matter, you get the same answer either way. So whatever you want to use. All right, let's take a look at one more example with subtraction. So suppose we have A and we have B, and we wanna subtract, let's do B minus A this time. So B minus A, okay. So I'm not gonna go through and say B plus negative A. You can do that if you want. Again, it's the same answer. I'm just gonna save time and do B minus A, okay? So what I'm gonna do, because these guys, again, are the same size, this is a one, two by one, two, three. So it's a two row and three column matrix in each case. So it's a two by three, so we can subtract them. I'm gonna do each element of B minus each corresponding element from A. So five minus a negative one, five, minus a negative one, and let me change colors. We would have one minus eight, one minus eight. We would have negative two minus two, okay? And then let me change colors again. We'd have negative four minus 11, and then we'd have nine minus 14, okay, nine minus 14, and then we would have 15 minus six. All right, so five minus a negative one is like five plus one, so that's going to be six then one minus eight is going to be negative seven. Then negative two minus two is negative four. And then negative four minus 11 is negative 15. So negative 15. And then nine minus 14 is negative five. Okay, so that's negative five. And then lastly, 15 minus six is going to be nine. So this is the result of B minus A. Again, if you wanted to, you could do B plus the negative of A. So to do that, you would change each element inside of this matrix A into its opposite, and then you could add and you would get the same result. All right, so now let's talk about the kind of zero matrix. This is a matrix that is also referred to as the null matrix. It's a matrix that contains only zeros as its elements, okay? So the zero matrix can be written as any size. So whatever size you kind of need to work with, you can make a zero matrix to kind of work with it. So if you need a two by three, a 30 by 30, a 715 by 220, you can do whatever you want. It's all going to be zeros. Now, generally speaking, we're going to notate this with a zero. At least that's how I'm going to notate it. A lot of books do different things here. You might see a zero with kind of the size. So in this case, I have one, two, three rows and I have two columns. So you might see them write a zero and then say it's a three by two, okay? 
If it's known what the size is, you typically just put a zero instead of writing out all these zeros. But there's other notations that you might come across. They might use a letter to represent this. So just stick to what your book gives you. Now, I want you to recall that when we worked with kind of real numbers, we said that zero was the additive identity. And what that means is that if I add zero to something, it's unchanged. So if I use P or Q again, let's just use Q, and I add zero to that, I'm going to get Q back. Okay, Q is just some real number. So for example, if I had 111 and I added zero, I get 111, right? If I had a trillion and I add zero, I get a trillion. So zero is the additive identity. Well, when we do matrix addition, because a zero matrix only has zeros as its kind of entries, what happens is every time you add the zero matrix to another matrix, you just get the original matrix back. So the zero matrix is the additive identity in matrix algebra. So for example, here, if I add, if I add A plus this zero matrix, I'm just going to put a zero there. Okay. I'm just going to get A back because all I would be doing is saying that I would set this up and say, let me kind of do this. I would do five plus zero, which is five. I would do two plus zero, which is two. I would do one plus zero, which is one. I would do seven plus zero, which is seven. Let me make this a little bit longer. I would do eight plus zero, which is eight, and negative four plus zero, which is negative four. So I get A back, right? This is equal to A. I haven't changed anything because in each case, I just added a real number to zero. And so I got that real number back. All right, now additionally, we saw that if you added a real number and it's additive inverse together, you got zero. OK, so it's going to be the same thing or the same concept when we work in matrix algebra. If we have some matrix A, OK, and we add to it the opposite or the negative of A, you're going to end up with a zero matrix. So in other words, if I have this matrix A and I have these entries here, 3, negative 5, 8, 11, and then 6 and 4, I could say the negative of A is what? We talked about this earlier. I'm just going to multiply each kind of entry here by negative one. So this would be negative three. This would be negative eight. This would be negative six. This would be positive five. This would be negative 11. This would be negative four. OK, so what happens is if I add a plus negative a, I'm going to end up with a zero matrix. And in this particular case, I'm going to have a zero matrix. That's what it's one, two, three rows by two columns. Right. So it's a three by two. You could write that if you want. Or again, it's going to be obvious that it's a three by two. So you can just leave that zero as the notation. And again, you can go through and kind of crank this out to prove it. Three plus negative three is zero. Negative five plus five is zero. Eight plus negative eight is zero. 11 plus negative 11 is zero. Six plus negative six is zero. And four plus negative four is zero. So again, you end up with this zero matrix. And instead of writing all this out, you just put a zero, okay, to notate that you have a zero matrix. All right, so let's wrap things up with an introduction to matrix equations. This is something we're going to be dealing a lot with kind of in this chapter and also as we progress in math in general. So with a matrix equation, we have an equation where variables are used to represent matrices. So at this level, it's very, very simple. Let's say I have a matrix A and a matrix B. They're both a two by two matrix, so we know we can add them together. And we have matrix A plus this matrix X, which we don't know what that matrix is. And we say it's equal to this matrix B. So if I want to solve for X, I can use the same strategies that we talked about when we solved linear equations here. OK, so I can subtract matrix A away from each side of this equation. And I can say that the matrix X is going to be equal to the matrix B minus the matrix A. OK, so you see where we're going with this. We can find out what X is by just doing B minus A. OK, so what is let me kind of make a little border here. What is B minus A? That would be equal to what? Well, I would just take each element from B and subtract away the corresponding element in A. So four minus two would be two. Negative one minus eight would be negative nine. OK, five minus a negative one is like five plus one. So that's six. And then nine minus three would be six. So this is B minus A. And it's also equal to X because we said X was equal to B minus A. So let me just write here that this is equal to two and negative nine for the top row and then six and then six in the bottom row. And you can check this. That's the good thing about kind of working with equations. You can always check. Well, if it's true that the matrix X, which is this guy right here, is equal to the matrix B minus the matrix A, 
Well, then it's also true that A, this matrix here, plus X, this matrix here, would give me B. You can check that really quickly. You can say, okay, if I had 2 plus 2, would I get 4? Yeah, that's a check. If I had 8 plus negative 9, would I get negative 1? That's a check. If I had negative 1 plus 6, would I get 5? That's a check. If I had 3 plus 6, would I get 9? That's a check. So our matrix X is this guy right here, right? With 2 and then negative 9 in the top row. And that kind of looks like 2 minus 9. So let me make that a little bit cleaner. And then 6 and 6 in the bottom row. All right, let's try one more of these. And then we'll just kind of call it a day on this. And in the next lesson, we'll look at some matrix multiplication. All right, so we have our matrix A, our matrix B. Again, they're the same size. In each case, we have a three by three, three rows, three columns. So we have that A, this matrix here, plus X, which is our unknown matrix, is equal to B, which is this matrix here. So again, I'm just going to solve for X. I'm going to subtract this matrix A away from each side of the equation. And again, we find that X is equal to B minus A. And I don't need to check this this time. We'll just crank this out real quick and call it a day. Let me kind of slide this over a little bit. And so what is B minus A? So again, we have 12 minus a negative one, which is going to be 12 plus one, which is 13, okay? And then we have 11 minus five, which is six. We have eight minus nine, which is negative one. We have 10 minus two, which is eight. We have negative six minus seven, which is negative 13. We have five minus a negative one, which is five plus one, that's six. We have 13 minus 15, which is negative two. We have negative nine minus 13, which is negative 22. And lastly, we have four minus a negative three, which is four plus three, which is seven. So X, our matrix that was unknown, again, is equal to the matrix B minus the matrix A, which gives us this matrix here. Again, in the top row, you have 13, six, and negative one. In the middle row, you have eight, negative 13, and six. And in the bottom row, you have negative two, negative 22, and seven. In this lesson, we want to talk about multiplying a matrix by a scalar. All right, so when we talk about multiplying matrices, there's going to be two scenarios that you're going to come across. The first scenario, which is much simpler, involves multiplying some real number called a scalar by a given matrix. The second scenario is where we're going to multiply two matrices together. Now, the second case is much more involved, and we're going to look at that process in the next lesson. All right, so how do we multiply a matrix by a scalar? Well, again, just to be clear here, when we say a scalar, this just means some real number, or to be more specific, a real number that is not inside of a matrix. Okay, so when we see this in matrix algebra, we call it a scalar. So if we take that scalar and we multiply it by a matrix, this is where we get the term scalar multiplication. Now, what you're going to see in your textbook is something like this. If matrix A is equal to, again, this just identifies the matrix by the individual elements that it's kind of made up of. So you say this lowercase a sub ij. Again, the i here is the row, the j here is the column. And again, this is just generic notation. So if this is an M by N matrix and K is a scalar, so some real number that's not in a matrix, the scalar multiple of A by K is the M by N matrix given by, and again, this notation is pretty simple overall, you have K times the matrix A. So the scalar K times the matrix A gives us a matrix that's made up of these elements here, which is K multiplied by each individual element of A, right? This lowercase a sub ij. And again, when you see this kind of notation, it may be a bit confusing, but let's just jump into an example. And you'll see that it's very, very easy to do this process. So suppose I have matrix A and it's made up of these elements here. Again, in the first row, we're gonna have three, seven, and eight. The second row will have negative two, 11, and one. And the third row will have five, two, and 22. So this is a three by three matrix, three rows, three columns. It's a square matrix. So if I asked you to find negative five times matrix A, what would you do? Again, all you want to do is multiply negative five, this scalar here, by each and every element of matrix A. So a very simple process. So let me just kind of write this over here. Negative five A is going to be equal to, I'm just going to multiply negative five by every element over here. So three times negative five is negative 15. And then if we do seven times negative five, that's negative 35. If we do negative five times eight, that's negative 40. And then if I do negative five times negative two, that's positive 10. If I do negative five times 11, that's negative 55. 
and then negative 5 times 1 is negative 5. For the last row, we have negative 5 times 5, which is negative 25. Then we have negative 5 times 2, which is negative 10. And then negative 5 times 22, which is negative 110. So this matrix right here, negative 5a, is a scalar multiple of the original matrix A. Okay, so that's all we're really saying. And let's just look at another example. It's pretty easy overall. So for the second example, we have matrix B. And we have, again, in the first row, 4, 6, and 16. In the second row, 2, 10, 12. And in the third and final row, we have 10, 4, and 14. So another three row and three column matrix. So again, it's a three by three, a square matrix. So if we want to find one half times B, again, all I would do is multiply every element in this matrix B by a half. Okay, that's all we're doing. Very, very simple process. So one half times four is two. One half times six is three. One half times 16 is eight. One half times two is one. One half times 10 is five. One half times 12 is six. One half times 10 is five. One half times four is two. And one half times 14 is seven. Okay, so this would be one half times B. So now let's kind of look at a combination of some things that we've learned already. So in this section, when you talk about scalar multiplication, you get a few problems on scalar multiplication, and then they kind of combine things together. So what we'll see is that we're going to do some problems with addition and subtraction with scalar multiplication involved. And then we're also going to look at some equations. So suppose we have matrix A, which is made up of with the first row 3, 1, and 5, and the second row negative 2, 0, and 6. And then for matrix B, we have the first row as 4, 7, and 2, and the second row as 0, 1, and 8. And each of these have two rows and three columns, okay? So it's a 2 by 3 in each case. So we know that since they're the same size, they can be added together. Now, our problem is going to be to do 3 times A and then add the result of 2 times B, okay? So 3A plus 2B. And so what I'm going to do first is find 3A, okay? I want to find 3A. So let me start by just rewriting A here real quick for reference, and then we'll delete it. So we have 3, 1, and 5, and we have negative 2, we have 0, and we have 6, okay? So if I want 3 times A, again, a very, very simple process, I would multiply every element in matrix A by 3, okay? That's all I'm doing. So 3 times 3 is 9, 3 times 1 is 3, 3 times 5 is 15, and then 3 times negative 2 is negative 6, 3 times 0 is 0, and 3 times 6 is 18. Okay, so let me erase this. And let me just drag this out of the way. And let me write down B here for reference. So for B, again, we have 4, 7, and 2. And then we have 0, 1, and 8. And if I wanted 2 times B, let me just write that here. So 2 times B would be what? I would multiply every element by 2. So this would be 8. This would be 14. This would be 4. Zero would stay the same, right? Because zero times anything is still zero. This would be two and this would be 16, okay? So now let me kind of arrange these in a way that we can see what's going on. So I know 3a equals this and 2b equals this. So I want the sum of these guys. Again, you can only add two matrices if they're the same size or order. And in each case, we have a two row by three column matrix. So we're good to go on that. So if I want 3a plus 2b, I would say it's what? Well, I'm just going to take every element from 3a and add the corresponding element from 2b. So 9 plus 8 would give me 17. 3 plus 14 would give me 17 again. 15 plus 4 would give me 19. And then negative 6 plus 0 is negative 6. 0 plus 2 is going to give me 2. And then 18 plus 16 is going to give me 34. Okay? All right, so this is our result, 3a plus 2b. So it's a very easy process to not only do scalar multiplication, but to combine it with some addition or subtraction operations. All right, so let's look at another problem that involves kind of combining the scalar multiplication with addition or subtraction. So we have 4a minus 5b. We're using the same two matrices. So here's our a and here's our b. If you want to copy those down real quick, you can. I'm just going to write them out real fast. So I'm going to say that a is equal to, again, we have 3, 1, and 5 in the first row, and we have negative 2, 0, and 6 in the second row. Then for matrix B, we're going to have 4, 7, and 2 in the first row, and we're going to have 0, 1, and 8 in the second row. All right, so if we want to do this 4A minus 5B, 
my suggestion to you when you have subtraction is to add the opposite. So let's just do plus negative there. So when I get to this scalar multiplication with matrix B, I'm gonna do negative five times B, and then I can just add the matrices, okay? It makes it a little bit easier to not make a silly sign mistake because the worst thing with working with matrices is you go through all this work and then you get the wrong answer and you basically have to rip the page up and start over, okay? So if I do four times A, four times A, this is equal to one. It's just four times every entry in A. So four times three is 12. 4 times 1 is 4, 4 times 5 is 20, okay? And then down here, 4 times negative 2 is negative 8, 4 times 0 is 0, and then 4 times 6 is 24. So I can get rid of this, I don't need this anymore. And let me just kind of slide this down out of the way. And then now I want negative 5 times B, okay? So negative 5 times B is going to give me 1. So it's negative 5 times every element, so negative 5 times 4 is going to be negative 20, Negative 5 times 7 is going to be negative 35. Negative 5 times 2 is going to be negative 10. And then we have negative 5 times 0, which is 0. Negative 5 times 1, which is negative 5. And lastly, negative 5 times 8, which is negative 40. Okay, so let me erase this. And I'll just drag this down here so it's out of our way. And now what we want to do is this operation here. So what is 4a plus negative 5b or 4a minus 5b as we originally saw it? Well, again, to add two matrices together or to subtract matrices, you have to have two matrices that are the same size or the same order. Again, in each case, we have a two by three matrix, so we're good to go, right? Two rows, three columns. So we're just going to add corresponding entries. So 12 plus negative 20 is going to be negative eight. Then four plus negative 35 is going to be negative 31. Then 20 plus negative 10 is going to be positive 10. Then down here in my second row, I'd have negative eight plus zero, which is negative eight. I'd have zero plus negative five, which is negative five. And I'd have 24 plus negative 40, which is going to give me negative 16. So this matrix here would be the result of doing 4a plus negative 5b, or again, 4a minus 5b. All right, so before we kind of move any further, I want to go over some of the properties of scalar multiplication that you're gonna see in your textbook, just so that these things are clear and you don't get confused by them. So let's define A and B to be these matrices of the order M by N, and then K and H are going to be these scalars, or again, these real numbers that are not inside of a matrix. So the first one is kind of the associative property. We know about the associative property of multiplication with real numbers, right? That tells us if we're multiplying three or more numbers together, we can group that multiplication any way we'd like. We always get the same result. Well, the same thing is true here, right? So if I had K times H done first, this is inside of parentheses, these two scalars, then the result of that is multiplied by the matrix A. It's the same thing as if you did one of the scalars times the matrix A first, and then took that result and multiplied it by the remaining scalar. Now, the next two are extremely obvious. If you have one as a scalar, meaning you have one times your matrix A, you get matrix A back. And the reason for this is because one is the identity element in multiplication. So if I'm going through and multiplying everything in matrix A by one, I just get that element back. So it's an exact copy of the matrix A. The next one is if we have zero as a scalar. So zero times matrix A will give us a zero matrix. And again, the notation for this varies, but generally speaking, you'll see a zero with the kind of order. We said these were M by N matrices. So we'll say this is a zero matrix that is of the order M by N. And let me make that M a little bit better, okay? And again, because I'm multiplying zero by every element of A, I'm getting a matrix with all zeros as entries, and it's of the order M by N. So that's why we define this as a zero matrix of the order M by N. All right, lastly, we have a distributive property with scalar multiplication. This one's pretty obvious as well. So we have something like K, a scalar, multiplied by these two matrices added together, so A plus B. We could say it's the same as doing K times A, plus k times b. All right, then the second part of this would be if we had k plus h, these two scalars, inside of parentheses, those guys are being added together first, and then the result is multiplied by this matrix A. This is the same as doing k the scalar times the matrix A plus h the scalar times the matrix A. All right, so let's look at a little matrix equation. 
We're going to see more and more of these as we progress through the chapter. And we're going to start getting into some scenarios where we'll actually be able to kind of solve a linear system with a method other than the Gaussian elimination and the Gauss-Jordan elimination. We'll see that we can kind of use matrices in a different way with the Kramer's rule and then also with kind of solving by using the inverse of a matrix. But we'll get to that later on. So for right now, we have this matrix A, which has negative one and three in the first row and four and seven in the second row, and matrix B, which has six and five in the first row and zero and nine in the second row. So they're each two by two square matrices. So what we're saying for our equation is that two, some scalar, times some unknown matrix X, plus our matrix A is equal to our matrix B. So we would solve this the same way as if we had a linear equation kind of in one variable, right? So I wanna isolate X, my unknown matrix. And to do that, the first thing is to subtract matrix A away from each side of the equation. So this would cancel. And over here, I'm just gonna write this in line and say this is B minus A. So now what I'd have is two times matrix X is equal to B minus A. So how do I get rid of this two from over here? Well, we can divide both sides by two, or what I'm just gonna say, since we're working in terms of multiplication, I'm gonna multiply both sides of the equation by one half, okay? So I'm gonna multiply this side by a half. Let me kind of move this down a little bit so it fits. So I'm gonna multiply this side by a half, and I'm gonna multiply this side by a half. Again, I'm gonna wrap this in some parentheses to make sure that multiplies each kind of matrix there. So I know that this is going to cancel and I'm left with just my matrix X, which is what I want. So what we have here is one half on the right times the quantity matrix B minus matrix A. And remember, because of our distributive property, we know that we could do one half times B minus one half times A, or we could do it this way. It doesn't really matter. So let's go ahead, kind of erase all this. We know what we wanna find. Let me kind of scooch this down a little bit. It's gonna be hard to kind of do this on one sheet. So let me just kind of copy this. Let's go down to a fresh sheet where we have lots of room to think and work. So let's start out by just doing B minus A first, okay? And then we'll multiply the result by the scalar one half. I think that's a bit easier. So if I do, again, matrix B, this was, we had six and five in our top row. In the bottom row, we had zero and nine. And then for matrix A, we had what? We had negative one and three in the top row. In the bottom row, we had four and seven. So again, if you want, you could do plus negative or you could do minus. So if I'm doing minus, I would do six minus a negative one. If I was doing plus negative, I'd end up doing six plus the opposite of this, which is positive. So whatever you wanna do, it's fine. I usually do plus a negative. Okay, it makes it a little bit easier. So I would change the sign of everything here. So this would be plus, this would be negative, this would be negative, this would be negative. Okay, it just makes it easier to keep track of the signs. So B plus negative A, we're gonna have what? B plus negative A is gonna be equal to, six plus one is seven. Five plus negative three is going to be two. Zero plus negative four is negative four. 9 plus negative 7 is going to give me positive 2, okay? So this is B plus negative A. And then to solve for X, I just want one half of this matrix, okay? So let's just do this real quick. We'll erase this, kind of scooch this up a little bit. And so what I'll say is this is equal to 1 half times 7 is 7 halves. We'll have 1 half times 2, which is 1. We'll have a half times negative 4, which is negative 2 and a half times two, which is one, okay? So our matrix X, what we're trying to find, is gonna have a top row of seven halves and one, and a bottom row of negative two and one. Now let me copy this real quick. And let me just kind of erase this. We don't need this anymore. I'm just gonna say that X is equal to, again, this matrix is gonna be seven halves and one, and it's gonna be negative two and one. Now, if you wanna check this, and I advise you to check these when you first start, Think about making sure that this equation makes sense, okay, that it's true. So two times X is what? It's two times every element in X. So two X is equal to, two times seven halves is going to be seven, two times one is two, two times negative two is negative four, and two times one is two, okay? So this is two times X. So if I then add this to A, what I get B? So again, you'd add corresponding entries. So seven plus negative one gives me six. Two plus three gives me five. 
negative 4 plus 4 gives me 0, and 2 plus 7 gives me 9. So we know here that our solution for x is correct. In this lesson, we want to learn about multiplying matrices. All right, so in our last lesson, we learned about multiplying a matrix by a scalar. Again, a scalar is just a real number that's not inside of a matrix. And we found that that process was extremely straightforward, right? You just took the scalar and multiplied it by every entry of your matrix to get your result. When you multiply two matrices together, however, the process is not so straightforward. It's not what you would expect, okay? And so what we wanna do is just kind of start out with a very basic, very easy example, and then just build up to the kind of tougher examples that you're gonna get for your test or your homework or whatever you are encountering. So let's say we have these two matrices here. We have R, which is a row matrix. It's got one single row with three, negative two, and five as its elements. Again, you could call this a row vector if you wanted to. Then C is gonna be one single column with negative one, zero, and negative three. So you could say this is a column matrix or a column vector. So what we wanna start out with is finding the product of R times C. So what is R? times C. So I can write these two next to each other like this, or I can put a dot in between them. It doesn't really matter. So what I want to do first is just write out the size of each. Okay, this is going to be very important. So I'm going to say that R is a one by three. It's got one row and it's got three columns. And I'm going to say that C is what? It's a three by one. It's a three by one. Now, this is very important. This is something you want to write down. You can only perform the multiplication if the number of columns in the first matrix, meaning the leftmost matrix, the R here, matches the number of rows in the second matrix or the rightmost matrix, the C here. So you can just circle these two inside numbers if you write it in this manner, and you can say, are they the same? And if they're the same, you can put a check mark there and say, okay, I can proceed with my multiplication. If those two guys are not the same, you have to stop. The multiplication is not going to be possible. Okay, so you can say the product doesn't exist. Now, the second thing you want to do here is figure out the size of the product. And the way you're going to get that is you're going to look at these two outside numbers. So you have this, the number of rows from R, and this, the number of columns, okay, from C. So this matrix will be a one by one. Okay, so this will be a one by one. So once I determine if I can perform the action, and then I've determined what the size of the product is, I go ahead and write out my matrix. I know it's a one by one, so it's just a matrix with one single entry. And at this point, I can erase all this. I don't need it anymore. And then I'm gonna go through a process that might seem a little bit weird at first, but it gets easier as you kind of do it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna think about the first element in this R, this first one right here, the first element in R or the leftmost one is a three, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply it by the top element or I could say the first element in C, okay? So this guy right here gets multiplied by this guy right here. So three times negative one, all right? Then you're gonna add to this, you're gonna move down by one and you're gonna move down by one. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do negative two times zero. Okay, so negative two times zero. And then I'm gonna add to this, I'm gonna do this trick one more time. I'm gonna move down and I'm gonna move down. So five times negative three, so five times negative three. I'm going to find this kind of result and that's gonna be what I'm gonna put in there. Okay, and this might not make any sense at this point. That's okay, as we practice, we'll start to see what's going on here. So three times negative one is negative three, plus negative two times zero is obviously zero then plus five times negative three is negative 15. So negative three plus negative 15 would be negative 18. So that is going to be the result of R times C, okay? And we're gonna find that we're gonna need to do a row vector times a column vector pretty often. So we need to make sure we understand what we did there. Again, we would start with this guy right here from this one times this guy right here from this one, okay? Then we would add to that this guy right here times this guy right here. Then we add to that this guy right here times this guy right here. Okay, so now that we have that down, what we wanna do is move on to kind of something else. We know that when we talk about multiplication with real numbers, it's commutative. If I do three times two, it's six. If I do two times three, it's also six. Three times two equals six. 
and then two times three also equals six. This is the commutative property of multiplication. With kind of multiplying matrices, it's not commutative, okay? So when you flip the order, generally speaking, you're not gonna get the same answer, and sometimes you're gonna find that you can't even do the multiplication, okay? So what happens if we change the order here? What if we did C times R? Well, again, let's kind of write this out and compare our size. C is what? It's a one, two, three row by one column matrix, and R is a one row by three column matrix, okay? So now, again, we're comparing the inside numbers. The number of columns from C, the first one, has to be equal to the number of rows from R, the second one, okay? So those match, these are the same, Again, if they're the same, you can put a check mark and say, okay, I can proceed. Then the size of this guy is gonna be given by the outer numbers. So it's a three by three, three rows by three columns. So let's erase this. And let me kind of slide this down a little bit. So we have C times R here, and this is going to be a three by three. So I always write this out first. Now, here's where it gets a little bit tricky, okay? I wanna write this out so you understand what's going on. This is row one, this is row two, this is row three. This is column one, column two, and column three, okay? So what I want to do here, if I wanna find this entry here, I wanna think about, okay, it's in row one, column one, all right? Row one, column one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply row one from the left one, or C, times column one from the right one, or R. Or you could say row one from the first one, or C, times column one from the second one, or R, however you wanna think about that. So row one in C is this guy right here, and column one in R is this guy right here. Again, because we have such a simple example, it's just gonna be you know three times negative one in this case. As we get to the tougher ones, then you're gonna have to go through what we did before, where you're finding a couple of different products and summing them together. But here it's very simple. So it's just three times negative one, which is negative three. Okay, so that's this guy right here. Then we move down to this one. Okay, so now I have my row one in column two. Okay, so I'm basically gonna stay with this one because again, when I think about the row, it comes from the leftmost one. It comes from C, it comes from the first one. You've gotta remember that. So I stay here. I'm still in my row one here, but I'm now moving to column two here. So I'm moving down. So negative one times negative two is two, okay? And then again, if I'm staying in row one here, okay, I'm staying in row one here, I'm just moving down to column three here. So I would have negative one times five, which is negative five, okay? And if this is not kind of gelling right now, it's okay. As we work through more examples, you'll start to pick this up. Now, I'm moving into row two here in my answer. So what I wanna do is move to row two, again, in C because I'm always getting my row from the leftmost one. So I'm in row two now here, and I'm gonna multiply to get this whole row by column one to get this one, by column two to get this one, by column three to get this one. Again, because I have column one, column two, column three. That's all I'm doing. Now, because zero multiplied by anything is zero, this whole row is gonna be zero. Zero times three is zero, zero times negative two is zero, zero times five is zero. Then, when I get to row three down here, again, I just changed the row I'm in for this first one. So now I'm here, okay? So row three, column one. Negative three times this guy in column one, so times three, it's gonna be negative nine. Then negative three times this guy in column two is going to be negative two, so negative three times negative two is six. Then negative three times this guy in column three, which is five, is going to be negative 15, okay? So that's how we get the entries as we get into a tougher example in a minute, you'll see that you have more work involved, but the process is basically the same, okay? So you see that R times C is negative 18, that one entry for that matrix, and C times R is not the same, right? They're not equal to each other. Completely different size. This guy has negative three, two, negative five, zero, 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 and negative nine, six, and negative 15 as its entries. All right, so let's go ahead and look at a tougher example now. So suppose we have matrix A and matrix B. So for matrix A, we have two rows and one, two, three columns. So A, I'm gonna write my size down, it's two by three. And then for B, it's what? It's one, two, three rows, okay? By one, two, three, four columns. So can we find the product of A times B? Again, you're looking at the inside numbers. The columns from A, the first one, and the rows from B, the second one. 
So do these numbers match here? Yeah, they're the same, okay? So we know we're good to go, and let me make that a little bit better. We know we're good to go on the multiplication here. Now, if I flip the order of the multiplication, if I said, can I do B times A, you're not gonna be able to. Because if I kind of change this up, and I said that, let me just kind of drag this over here, and let me drag them both over here so they fit. So if I look at this now, the two inside numbers do not match, okay? And this is very surprising, again, not being able to use this kind of commutative property that we're used to. If we do A times B, the product exists. If we do B times A, the product does not exist, okay? So we wanna go back to A times B. That's what we're gonna be working with. So let me just kind of slide this back over. And let me just kind of slide this back over. So we wanna find A times B. Again, we know that these numbers are the same, so it works. And we know that this guy is gonna be a two by four matrix, okay? So the very first thing we're gonna do is set up our matrix, it's a two by four. So A, B is equal to, okay? And let me write this out. So one, two, three, four entries, one, two, three, four entries. And another thing that I'm gonna do, I did this before, I'm just gonna put the columns the numbers in there just so we can keep track of what's going on. This is something that really helps the students that I've tutored in the past just to keep track of where they are, okay? Because a lot of times they go to a specific entry and they go, I don't know what to do, or they forget stuff or they kind of jumble it up. This tells me immediately that what? I'm in row one, column one. So where do I get that from? Again, the row always comes from the first one, the leftmost one. Just remember that. The column comes from the second one or the rightmost one. So I'm just gonna start in row one in A, and I'm gonna highlight that or circle it or whatever you wanna do. Just, you're gonna work with that for this entire row, all the way across, and all you're gonna do is you're gonna just keep going through the column. So you're gonna go this one times this one, then this one times this one, then times this one, then times this one. That's gonna give you your whole first row, okay? So for this first entry here, I'm doing this top row times this first column. Row one, column one, row one, column one. That's all it is. Remember when you do this, we have to go through the corresponding entries. So you have the first one here and the first one here. So two times nine, that's 18. Then plus, you have this guy here, which is the second one, times this guy here. Three times 10 is 30. Then plus, you have the third one here times the third one here. Zero times one is zero. So 18 plus 30 is 48, plus zero is still 48, okay? So it's not that bad overall but it does get you know a little bit tedious especially if you have something that's kind of bigger in nature so let's erase this and move down to this one so i'm still in the first row i'm just going to the second column now okay so let me highlight that we're going to do two times two which is four plus three times five which is 15 plus zero times zero is obviously zero so you can just leave that off four plus 15 is going to be 19. okay so that's how we get that one there and again we just move down so now i'm going to be in row one column three so row one column three, okay? So two times zero is zero, plus three times negative two is negative six, and then zero times seven is zero, so this is just negative six. So pretty easy, and let's erase this, and let's go into this kind of last column here. So we're gonna say that we have two times negative four, which is negative eight, plus three times 20, which is 60, and then plus, we know zero times anything is zero, so we don't need to worry about that. And negative eight plus 60 is going to be positive 52. So we've got the first row worked out, okay? So now what I'm gonna do, since I'm going to row two in the answer, I'm gonna move down to row two here. Again, the row comes from the first matrix. Just remember that, okay? So my first matrix is A, so I'm just gonna highlight that, and then I'm gonna work column by column, okay? That's all I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna say, okay, I've got this row times this first column to give me this guy right here. So we do negative one times nine, that's negative nine plus five times 10, that's 50, plus 11 times one, that's 11. So 50 plus 11 is 61, and then minus nine is going to give me 52. Okay, so this is 52. Okay, so let's erase this. And again, I'm just shifting one over. I'm going into column two and B because I'm in column two here, okay? So you've got negative one times two, which is negative two, plus five times five is 25, and 11 times zero is zero. So negative two plus 25 is 23. Okay, and again, I'm just shifting down, so now I'm in this column. And so negative one times zero is zero, plus you've got five times negative two, which is negative 10, plus you've got 11 times seven, which is 77. 77 plus negative 10 is 67. Okay, and then we have one more. So we have this column here, 
So we have negative 1 times negative 4, which is 4. 5 times 20, which is 100. And then we have 11 times 11, which is 121. So if I sum all these together, I know 4 plus 121 is 125. 125 plus 100 is 225. So there we go. We found our product A, B. Okay, not so bad. Again, I recommend writing this stuff in so you can figure out where you are. Row one, row two, column one, column two, column three, column four. Again, if I'm wanting this entry here, I find row one times column one. Okay, I always find the row from the left one and the column from the right one. Okay, or you could say the first and the second one, however you want to define that. Once you do this a few times, it becomes very, very simple. All right, let's go ahead and do another one. Again, this is one where you need a lot, a lot of practice. So we have matrix A and matrix B. So first and foremost, let's try AB. So AB, the size of A, it's a one, two by one, two, three. So it's a two by three. The size of B is a one, two, three, okay, by a one, two. So again, if these numbers match up, you are good to go. You can put a check and say, yes, we can go ahead and do it. And the size of the product comes from these outside numbers. So it's going to be a two by two matrix, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and set that up. I'm gonna say A, B is equal to, again, it's a two by two. So just draw this out. You've got four entries to fill out, okay? And again, this should help you when you start. This is row one, row two, this is column one and column two. So how do I get this entry? Again, again, again. I get my row from the first one, the leftmost one, however you want to think about that, it's coming from A. So I'm just going to highlight this row here, okay, that's where I'm going to be for here and here. And then I'm just going to go through, if I want row one, column one, I want row one times this column here, column one in B. So again, we go through and figure this out, negative two times one is negative two, plus you've got zero times two, which is zero plus you've got one times zero, which is zero. So this is just going to be negative two, okay? Then I'm gonna slide down because I'm now in row one, okay? Stay in row one, but I'm in column two. So row one here times column two here. So that's gonna be what? It's going to be negative two times five, which is negative 10, plus zero times negative three, which is zero, plus one times seven, which is seven. This would give me negative 10 plus seven is negative three, okay? So let's move on now. So we're in row two. So again, now I'm gonna shift from this row one down here to row two, okay? So since I'm starting here and it's in column one, I'm gonna multiply this row by this column, okay? So I'm gonna have five times one, which is five, plus nine times two, which is 18, plus negative five times zero, which is zero. Five plus 18 is gonna be 23, okay, 23. And then lastly, what I wanna do is this row times this column right here. Five times five is 25, plus nine times negative three is negative 27. And then plus you've got negative five times seven, which is negative 35. So let's figure out what this is going to be. Well, I know that 25 plus negative 27 is going to be negative two. So basically I would have negative two plus negative 35, and that's gonna be negative 37. Okay, so negative 37. So not that bad overall. We found that our entries here are negative two, negative three, 23 and negative 37. All right, so let's erase this and then let's figure out if we can do B times A. So B times A, the size of B again, is a three by two. And the size of A is going to be a what? It's a two by three. So two here and two here, the columns from B, the first one, match the rows from A, the second one, so we are good to go, okay? So we can do this multiplication. The size of the product is gonna be the outer numbers, so three by three. So BA, BA is gonna be this three by three. So I'm gonna have three numbers here, three numbers here. Let me make this a little bigger. So let me put my brackets in. And again, I'm just gonna do this. So row one, row two, row three, column one, column two, and column three. Okay, so for the first row, first column. So for this entry here, again, I wanna think about getting the rows from the first one or B. So this is my first row here, okay? And I'm gonna start with this row, okay, times this column here, because it's column one, so this first column here. So let me just kind of mark this one off. So one times negative two is negative two, plus you'd have five times five, which is 25, 
If I sum those two amounts together, I'm going to get 23. So that's my first entry. So this is going to be 23, okay? And I'm just gonna work through this first row. So I'm gonna get this one and this one. And so I'm staying with this first row with B. Okay, so that's why it's gonna be highlighted. So I'm just gonna go through this one first. So one times zero is zero, plus five times nine is 45. So that's gonna be 45 here, okay? And then I'm gonna move to this one, okay? So I'm gonna do one times one, which is one, plus five times negative five is negative 25. This is gonna be negative 24. So negative 24. So that top row is now done. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, since I'm in row two, I'm just gonna move this down to row two. Okay, so let me erase this. And let me highlight this row two here. And we'll start out with this one. So we're gonna do two times negative two, which is negative four. Plus we're gonna do negative three times five, which is negative 15. So negative four plus negative 15 is going to be negative 19. And let me erase this and let me erase this. And now we're gonna move into this one. So we have two times zero, which is zero, plus negative three times nine, which is negative 27. This is gonna give me negative 27 here. So let's erase this. We've got one more for this second row. So let me just circle this like this. Two times one is two plus negative three times negative five is 15. So this would be 17 here. Okay, so we just have one more kind of row down here to fill in. So let me just highlight this now and we'll go through them. So you basically only have to, this is a shortcut. If you see a zero here, you know that when you did kind of this one, this one, and this one, in each case, zero times this, the top one, okay, is going to be zero. So really all I have to do is figure out what is seven times five, that's 35. Then what is seven times nine, that's 63. And then what is seven times negative five, that's negative 35. Okay, that's a little shortcut. If you see things like that, always take that opportunity because again, if I did this guy right here, it would be zero times negative two, which is zero, plus you'd have seven times five, which is 35, okay? So I just shortcutted that process to get these numbers. All right, so we found BA and we've already found AB. So we've got that result. So now let's move on and let's talk about what happens when you multiply two matrices together that are square matrices, okay, of the same order. So if you're multiplying a two by two and another two by two, obviously you get a two by two. If you multiply a three by three and another three by three, you get a three by three. If you multiply 117 by 117 and another 117 by 117, you get 117 by 117, okay? So it's very obvious that you will always be able to kind of do the multiplication, okay? When you have two square matrices being multiplied together and they're of the same order. So in this case, A, again, it's a two by two, and B is also a two by two. So these numbers here are gonna be the same, and the outer numbers are gonna be the same. So we know that the product here, A, B, would just be a two by two matrix, okay? And so we'll just do this one more time. So this is row one and row two. This is column one and column two. So again, for row one, to kind of find this guy right here, I go to the row one from A the first one, okay? So this is my row one here. And for the column, I find it from here. So this is my column one here. So I take the product of this row times this column to find this guy right here. So 10 times negative two is negative 20. Plus we have 11 times five, that's 55. 55 minus 20 would give me 35. And then what would I do next? Well, I wanna move into this one. So same row up here, but different column over here, okay? So I would do 10 times nine, which is 90, plus 11 times seven, which is 77. And if I do 90 plus 77, I'm gonna get 167, okay? So again, very, very easy. Now I'm moving into row two in column one. So for row two, again, it comes from the first one. So this is my row two here, and I want my column one here. I want the product of those two. So negative three times negative two is six, plus I'd have one times five, which is five. This gives me 11. And then I just move down one. So I'm gonna do this column here now. So when we look at this, we have negative three times nine, that's negative 27, plus one times seven, which is seven. Negative 27 plus seven is negative 20, okay? So that's going to be my product AB. If you wanna flip this around just for practice and do BA, okay? Again, it's gonna be the same size, but the way that you calculate it's gonna be different because B is now first. So if I think about the row one, I've got to think about the row one from B, 
okay? So this guy right here, if I think about column one, the column one is going to be for A, okay? So I want to find the product of this guy times this guy. So this row vector times this column vector. So negative 2 times 10 is negative 20. Then plus 9 times negative 3 is negative 27. Negative 20 plus negative 27 is going to be negative 47. And again, we just proceed. So now I'm going to kind of move to this column here. And I'm going to find the product of these two. So negative 2 times 11 is negative 22. And then plus 9 times 1, which is 9. So negative 22 plus 9 is going to give me negative 13. And now what I'm doing is I'm moving into row 2. Okay, so moving into row 2. Again, that's from the first one. So this guy right here, I'm in row 2. And I'm going to start with column 1 here. So row 2, column 1, 5 times 10 is 50 plus 7 times negative 3 is negative 21. 50 plus negative 21 is going to be 29. And then we just have one more to do. Again, I'm just going to shift this column here to this guy because I'm in column 2 now. So I'd have 5 times 11, which is 55, plus 1 times 7, which is 7. 55 plus 7 is going to give me 62, okay? So hopefully this is clear for you. This is something that you do need to practice quite a few times to have it down, okay? You'll develop your own method, your own strategy for doing this. But typically, I like to write out the row and the columns like I did in these examples here to keep track of where I need to be in my multiplication. I found that a lot of students that struggle with this, if they just employ this kind of simple technique, they end up really being able to improve their result quite substantially. In this lesson, we want to talk about Gaussian elimination and also Gauss-Jordan elimination. All right, so over the course of the last few lessons, we've been talking about how to solve systems of linear equations in two variables and also three variables. We basically covered everything that you would see in a typical Algebra 1 and an Algebra 2 course. Now, what we're going to do is just go a little bit further, and we're going to talk about these kind of matrix methods that we can use. And we'll see a lot of these as we kind of progress through this chapter. Today, we're just going to start with Gaussian elimination and Gauss-Jordan elimination. Now, some of you saw this in Algebra 2. Others didn't. I just want to assure you that this is an easy process. Most of the difficulty involved with this is just keeping track of what's going on, okay? So to begin, I'm just going to revisit this first system using the elimination method, and then we're going to go into the matrix method from there, okay? So I'm going to start out with 4x plus 16y equals 28, and 5x plus 8y equals negative 1. So once again, I'm just going to label this as equation 1, and this is equation 2. Now, with the elimination method, we know that our goal is to eliminate one of the variables, okay? So we want to take one pair of variable terms, okay? And we want to make the coefficients opposites. So I look at the kind of coefficients for x, I have 4 and 5. Then the coefficients for y, I have 16 and 8. So it's easier to work with y, right? Because I can basically multiply this 8 by negative 2, and I would have negative 16 there. So this would give me a negative 16y and a 16y, okay? So what I want to do is I want to multiply equation 2 by negative 2. So I'm going to multiply 5x by negative 2 and get negative 10x. I'm going to multiply 8y by negative 2 and get negative 16y. I'm going to multiply negative 1 by negative 2 and get 2. Okay, so that's my transformed equation. Again, we're always allowed to multiply any equation by the same non-zero number and preserve the solution. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take my equation 1, I'm going to leave it as it is, so 4x plus 16y is equal to 28. Okay, so two things here before we kind of do the elimination. I want to make sure you understand that when you do the elimination method, you want to make sure that your equations are lined up properly. So in other words, I want to write everything in standard form. So ax plus by is equal to c. Okay, so ax plus by equals c, ax plus by equals c. And the reason for that is, is I'm adding the two left sides together and setting this equal to the sum of the two right sides. So I want to have like terms on each side, right? So when I go to add these two equations together, on the left sides, I have my negative 10x plus my 4x. That's going to give me negative 6x. Then over here, I have my negative 16y plus my 16y. And I'm going to go ahead and just cancel this, right? That's 0. And this equals 2 plus 28, which is 30. Okay, so let's erase this. We already know x is going to be negative 5. I can complete the process by just dividing both sides by negative 6. And I'll just write over here that x is negative 5, right? 30 divided by negative 6 is obviously negative 5. 
Okay, so pretty easy overall. We know how to do that. And we could just plug in for x in either equation one or two, find out what y is, right? Very simple. So let's just take equation two because the numbers involved are smaller. So five times negative five plus eight y equals negative one. We know five times negative five is negative 25. So plus eight y equals negative one. Let me add 25 to both sides. And if I add it over here, this is gonna cancel. So let me just erase it. And over here, this will be 24. So let's just quickly do this. We'll divide both sides by eight and we'll find that y is equal to three. Okay, so very simple, very easy. Something you've been doing since algebra one and also for the last few lessons in this course as well. What we wanna do now is think about how we could solve this using a matrix. So we're gonna start out with the kind of Gaussian elimination. Okay, this is usually the first thing that you learn. And for Gaussian elimination, the very first thing you need to do is you need to set up an augmented matrix, okay? So for an augmented matrix, I'm just going to take the numerical information only. But again, I got to make sure that these equations are written in the correct format. So I want to do AX plus BY equals C. And I'll explain why this is important in a minute. But essentially, I'm just going to grab this information and I'm going to write it in the order that it appears. So I'm going to take my 4, I'm going to take my 16, and I'm going to take my 28, okay? So this row going across represents the numerical information from this equation 1. Okay, so that's all that is. Then the second row that I'm going to form, which is going to be the 5, the 8, and the negative 1, that's the numerical information from equation 2. So the reason we want to write it in that AX plus BY equals C format is that I now know that this column here, this leftmost column, that numerical information corresponds to the coefficients of the X variable. Then I know that this column here is going to be the coefficients for the Y variable, and I know this column here is going to be the constants. So writing it in that manner is what allows you to know that immediately. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to put some brackets around this and I'm going to put a vertical line here that's going to separate the coefficients from the constants. Okay, so this is our first step and I'm just going to copy this now and go to a fresh sheet. Okay, so the goal is to use these what are known as elementary row operations or sometimes you'll hear them called matrix row transformations to put the matrix into what is known as row echelon form. Okay, so row echelon form looks like this. So we're going to have this. Let me put this. And I'm just going to use this symbol here to represent a real number. So what we're going to have is we're going to have ones starting at the upper left and going down on a diagonal. Okay, and then below it's going to be a zero here. Okay, so I want to make this a one and this a one. And I want to make this a zero. Okay, just using those row operations that I'm about to tell you. Now, these row operations are the same things we can do when we're solving a linear system with just equations, right? If we didn't have a matrix involved. So the first thing is we can interchange any two rows. So that means I could really write this matrix here by saying I have 5, 8, and negative 1. And then I have 4, 16, and 28. Okay, so I took the kind of second row and flipped it to the first one, took the first one and flipped it down to be the second one. This matrix represents the same linear system, okay? It's just like if we had these two equations and I chose to write this equation two up on top of equation one. That doesn't make any difference to the answer, okay? So you can always interchange any two rows. The second thing we can do, we can multiply or divide the elements of any row by a non-zero real number. That should make sense because, again, if we go back up, we remember that we multiplied equation two by negative two when we were solving this, right? We can always multiply both sides of an equation by the same non-zero number and preserve the solution. So since this is just the numerical information from the equation, in other words, if I took this matrix and I multiplied row two by, let's say, negative two, this would be negative 10, this would be negative 16, okay? And this would be positive two, okay? This would be positive two. And that's exactly what we saw when we were working with this kind of system, right? We multiplied equation two by negative two. And again, we got negative 10 X, we got minus 16 Y, and this was equal to positive two. Now the third and final elementary row operation tells us that we can replace any row of our matrix by the sum of the elements of that row and a multiple of the elements of another row. So this goes back to what we did when we looked at this, remember, we multiplied equation 2 by negative 2, and then we added that to equation 1. 
Well, it's the same thing that we are allowed to do here, okay? It's just that we're working with the numerical information only. Okay, so let me move this over here so that we can keep in mind what we're trying to do. And let's just go ahead and start on this. This doesn't take that long. When you first start doing this, you want to use a lot of scratch paper and you want to really take your time because it's easy to make very simple mistakes on this that give you the wrong answer. All right, so the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to get a one for this first position here, right? Because we need a one there. And then once that's done, I'm going to get a zero in this position here. Okay, so you want to finish a column at a time working from left to right. Okay, so what I'm going to do to get a one there, you got to think about what's legal. Again, you can multiply a row by a non-zero real number. Well, how can I get something there that's going to be one? Four times what would give me one? Remember, four times it's reciprocal, which is one fourth would be one. OK, so what I can do is I can multiply this whole row, row one, OK, by one fourth. Now, the way I'm going to show you this, OK, is something you might see in your textbook. So you'll see this abbreviated for row one. You'll see R with a one down there. So R sub one, or you could just say R one. It doesn't matter. And that just means row one. So I'm going to say one fourth times row one is going to replace row one. So I'm going to multiply four times one fourth. OK, and obviously that's going to give me one. I'm going to multiply 16 times 1 fourth, and that's going to give me 4. And I'm going to multiply 28 times 1 fourth, and that's going to give me 7. OK, so I'm going to replace the top row with what I just found. So let me write that right here. So I'm going to have a 1, I'm going to have a 4, and I'm going to have a 7. And then this bottom row stays the same. So 5, 8, negative 1. And let me close that off. And let's erase this. And we can even erase the original one. We don't need it anymore. Let's just move this up so that we have room to work. OK, so for the next step, I want to get a 0 here. right? I've already got my 1 here, so this is done. right? So now I want my 0. So how can I get a 0? Well, this is the tricky one. It's always harder to get zeros. But basically what you want to do is multiply row 1 by something and then add that result to row 2 so that this becomes a 0. OK, so in other words, I've got to add something to five to get that to be zero. So what can I add to five to get a result of zero? I want to add negative five. OK, and how can I get negative five? Well, I would multiply one by negative five. OK, and then add that to five to get my zero. That's all I need to do is multiply this top row or row one. OK, so row one times negative five. And then we're going to add that to row two. So that's all this is saying. So we're going to say that we're replacing row two with negative five times row one plus row two. So again, when you first see this, it's a bit confusing. But after you work enough examples, it becomes pretty easy. So if I take negative five and I multiply it by everything in row one, negative five times one is negative five. Then four times negative five is negative 20. And then we have seven times negative five, which is negative 35. OK. So I'm going to now add these values. Let me just take those results. So negative 5 plus 5 is 0. Negative 20 plus 8 is negative 12. And negative 35 plus negative 1 is negative 36. So I can just replace these with those numbers. So I'm going to have a 0. I'm going to have a negative 12. And I'm going to have a negative 36. OK? All right. So we just have one more thing to do. OK, so I'm going to just highlight this to show that it's done. So now what I want is I want this to be a one. OK, so again, getting a one is easy because I just multiply by the reciprocal of what I want to be a one. OK, so I would multiply row two by the reciprocal of negative 12, which is negative one twelve. OK, so zero, zero times negative one twelfth would be what? It would be zero. OK, so this is unchanged. This equals zero. Negative 12 times negative 1 12th is obviously 1. And then negative 36 times negative 1 12th, we know that this cancels with this and gives me a 3. Negative times negative is positive, so this is 3. Okay, So this is 0, this is 1, Okay, and this is 3. Now, at this point, at this point, we have achieved row echelon form. Okay, You have your 1s down this diagonal here, Okay, and you have a 0 below. Now, this is enough information for us to get a solution for the system. Remember, 
This column is the coefficients for x. This column is the coefficients for y. This is the constants, okay? So here's where this comes into play. So I'm going to take this row to this 0. That's the coefficient for x. Plus this 1. That's the coefficient for y. And this equals this 3, okay? So 0x plus 1y equals 3. What does that really tell me? 0 times x is 0. So really I have 1y or just y equals 3. So y equals 3 is part of my solution, right? If I go back up, we know y equals 3, right? So we found that part. And now what we can do is we can just back substitute and find x. So I can take this information here. This is 1x plus 4y. I know y is 3 is equal to 7. 4 times 3 is 12. If I subtract 12 away from each side of the equation, I'll find that x is equal to negative 5. And again, if I go back up, I see that x is negative 5. So again, it's not really that hard. It is a little bit time consuming when you first start because you have to figure out what's going on and you have kind of some new notation and some new concepts to wrap your head around. But once you kind of get going with this, this is a very, very quick process. Now, we talked about this Gaussian elimination and this rho echelon form. There's this other related concept, which is Gauss-Jordan elimination. So what happens with Gauss-Jordan elimination is we take this a step further. Instead of there just being a zero down here, now I would put a zero here, okay? So let's do that real quick. Let's transform this kind of entry here, this four, into a zero. And what we'll see is that this gives us all the information from the matrix directly, right? We don't have to do any substituting. And this is known as reduced row echelon form, okay? So reduced row echelon form. So how can I get this to be a zero? Again, I can use row two here. The fact that I have a one there, okay? And I can say, okay, one times negative four would be negative four, negative four plus four is zero. So multiply row two by negative four, and then add the result to row one, okay? So this is going to give me my row one. That's what I'm gonna replace it with. So we know zero times anything is zero, so this isn't gonna change, right? I don't need to do anything for that. 1 times negative 4 would be negative 4. Then negative 4 plus 4 would be 0. Okay, so that's done. And then 3 times negative 4 would be negative 12. And negative 12 plus 7 is going to give us negative 5. So you see that we have our answer now directly from the matrix. Okay, very easy to read because, again, this is 1x plus 0y equals negative 5. Or I can say that this is x equals negative 5. Okay, and then this guy right here is 0x plus 1y equals 3, or I can just say y equals 3. Okay, so directly from this matrix, I read the solution. And although it took longer for us to do it this way, that's just because we're getting started. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at another example. So the second example here, we have negative 10 equals 9y minus 10x, and we have negative 9x equals negative 4y plus 32. Okay, so the first thing we want to do, again, make sure this is written as AX plus BY equals C, okay? So for this guy over here, really all I have to do is just kind of flip it. I don't need to change anything. I can just say this is negative 10X plus 9Y equals negative 10. That's perfectly legal. Then for this guy right here, I have my negative 9X. I'm going to add 4Y to both sides of the equation, and this equals 32. Okay, so now what I want to do is just take the numerical information only. And I want to make sure I write it in the order that it comes in. So negative 10, 9, and negative 10. Then I want negative 9, 4, and 32. Okay, so I put my bar here to separate the coefficients from the constants, and we're ready to go. So let me copy this. We'll go to a fresh sheet. And let me paste this in here. And let me just rewrite this row echelon form. And actually, let's just use reduced row echelon form. So I want ones down the diagonal, and I want a zero above and below. And then over here, I'll just put this symbol here to represent two real numbers, okay? And you can use letters there if that makes you more comfortable. You could say, this is I and this is J. It just represents two real numbers. So I'll just put these symbols in here to represent that. Okay, so we're going to start out by getting a one in this position here. That's how I always start. And then I'll get a zero below, and then I'll move to the right. So again, if I want to get a one, it's really easy. Just think about what you're trying to make into a one and just multiply that row by the reciprocal of that. So for negative 10, the reciprocal is negative 1 10th. So I'm going to multiply the entire row one by negative 1 10th. 
So negative 1 tenth times row 1, that's where we're going to replace row 1 with. So negative 1 tenth times negative 10 would be 1. This would be 1. 9 times negative 1 tenth would be negative 9 tenths. Okay, and then negative 10 times negative 1 tenth, this would cancel, give me positive 1. Okay, so now that I have that done, the next thing I want to do, and I'm just going to mark this off and say this is done. The next thing I want to do is get a zero here. Okay, so I want that to be a zero. Again, not that hard because you have a one here. Okay, so I can just think about, I need to add a nine, a positive nine to make negative nine a zero. Okay, so the way I do that is I think about, okay, if I need that nine, I just multiply nine by this whole top row. Okay, and then I add the result to the second row. So I'm going to say that I have nine times row one, okay, the top row plus my row two, this is going to give me my row two. Okay, that's what I'm going to replace row two with. So let's do this down here so we can keep track of what's going on. So nine times one is nine. And then negative nine tenths times nine would be negative 81 tenths. So negative 81 tenths. And then nine times one would be nine. Okay, so I'm going to add these to these kind of corresponding entries. So 9 plus negative 9, we know that's 0. So this is 0. Let's erase this. If I had negative 81 tenths plus 4, that's going to be a bit of work. So let's do this one for a minute. 9 plus 32, we know that's 41. So let's just knock this one out real fast. And then this over here, i got to get a common denominator going. So I know this is going to be plus 40 over 10, right? If I took 4 and multiplied it by... 10 over 10, I'd get 40 over 10. And now this is going to simplify to negative 41 over 10. So I'll say this is negative 41 over 10. Okay, so that part's done. Pretty easy. Now I'm just going to check this off and say that's done, and I'll move on to this one right here. I always want to get my 1 first, okay? So I want to make this into a 1. That's super easy to do. Again, I just multiply that whole row by the reciprocal of that. The reciprocal of negative 41 over 10 is negative 10 over 41, okay? That has no impact on zero. If I multiply this by this, I get one, okay? I get one. And if I multiply this by 41, the 41s are gonna cancel and I get negative 10, okay? I get negative 10. At this point, we have our row echelon form, right? Our Gaussian elimination is completed. But we can take it a step further again and put it in this reduced row echelon form. Again, that's from the Gauss-Jordan elimination. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this guy right here into a zero. And the way I can do that, again, I'm going to use this one right here to my advantage. I'm going to multiply row two by what's necessary to kind of get rid of this negative nine tenths or change it into a zero. Okay, so if I had negative nine tenths, I would want to add nine tenths to make that zero. So I'm going to multiply row 2 by 9 tenths. So 9 tenths times row 2. Add the result to row 1. Again, I just use this symbol to say, hey, I'm going to replace row 1 with 9 tenths times row 2 plus row 1. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So I know that 9 tenths times 0 is 0, and 0 plus 1 is still 1. Okay, so that's no change. And then 1 times 9 tenths is 9 tenths. 9 tenths plus negative 9 tenths is 0. So we've got that. And then for this last one here, I'm going to have 9 tenths times negative 10, which the tens are going to cancel. It's going to give me a negative 1. So this would be negative 9. Okay, negative 9. And then I'm going to add the result to this row 1. So negative 9 plus 1 is negative 8. Okay, so this is negative 8. And we don't need to do any substituting. We already can just look at this and know our answer. We can say that 1x plus 0y equals negative 8, or we can basically say x equals negative 8. And we can say that 0x plus 1y equals negative 10, or just y is equal to negative 10. Okay, so again, not as quick as we're used to, but just because we're getting this kind of process started, once you really get going with this, you can do this very, very quickly. All right, let's take a look at one more of these, and then I'll show you the kind of special case scenarios and what happens with those. So we have 12x equals negative 11y plus 20, and then 12y equals 15x plus 78. So again, what I want to do is I want to start by writing everything in the format of ax plus by is equal to c. Okay, so over here, I have 12x. I'm just going to add 11y to both sides, and this will be equal to 20. 
Over here, I'm gonna subtract 15x away from both sides and then plus 12y, and this will be equal to 78. Now, one thing you wanna do, if you notice that everything in an equation is divisible by some number, you wanna take the opportunity to simplify it because it's gonna make your calculations easier. So if I look at this second equation or this bottom equation, everything's divisible by three. This would be negative five, this would be four, and this would be 26, right? I just divided every part of that equation by three. That's something you definitely wanna do because it's gonna make it easier to achieve your answer, okay? So let's scroll down just a little bit. I'll set up this matrix. So again, just take the numerical information. So 12 and negative five, 11 and then four, and then you have 20 and then 26. Okay, so let's go ahead and copy this. And again, what we're trying to do is get this reduced row echelon form. So one's down the diagonal and a zero above and below. And then over here, we're just gonna have real numbers. Okay, again, this is reduced row echelon form. And once more, if you have a number here, then it's row echelon form. Okay, so let's get started again by making this into a one. Very easy to do. We're just gonna multiply the top row by, again, the reciprocal of that number. The reciprocal of 12 is one over 12. So again, I'll write this as 1 12th times row one. That's what we're gonna replace row one with. So this would be one. 11 times one over 12 is 11 twelfths. So 11 twelfths. 20 divided by 12, let's write that over here. 20 divided by 12, each is divisible by four. So this would be five and this would be three. Okay, so this would be five thirds. So five thirds. Okay. So now I want to get a zero here. Let me kind of highlight that to show that it's done. I want to get a zero here. So again, if I have negative five, I know that if I add five to that, I'd get zero. So I'm going to multiply row one by five, add the result to row two. So five times row one plus row two, that's what I'm going to replace row two with. So one times five is five, five plus negative five is zero. Okay. And then 11 twelfths, times five, we know this would be what? This would be 55 twelfths, so 55 twelfths, and then plus four. To get a common denominator, I'd say this is 48 twelfths. So what's 55 plus 48? That's gonna be 103, okay? So this would be 103 twelfths, 103 twelfths, okay? And then for this guy right here, again, we have five times five thirds, five times five thirds, so that's 25 thirds. And then I'm gonna add that to 26. Again, 26 times three is 78, so I could say this is 78 thirds. And 25 plus 78 is 103. So you get 103 over three. Okay, so let's erase this, and I'll mark this one as done. And now I wanna get a one here, okay? I wanna get a one here. So again, that's very easy to do. We're gonna multiply row two by the reciprocal of this number. So I'm gonna have 12 over 103, okay, times row two. Again, I'm gonna replace row two with that. So I know that zero stays unchanged because zero times anything is just zero. And then this guy would be transformed into a one. And then this guy, I would have what? I would have 103 over three times 12 over 103. So we know this would cancel with this and this divided by this would be four. So I can erase this and just put a four here. So again, at this point, I have my row echelon form. So if I wanted to go back and substitute, I could find my answer at this point and I'd be done. But I like to take it to this form where this guy right here is a zero as well. And I can just read my answer straight from the matrix. So how can I get a zero here? Again, I wanna think about what can I add to 11 twelfths to make it zero? What would be a negative 11 twelfths? And so I would just multiply row two by a negative 11 twelfths and add the result to row one. So I'm gonna multiply negative 11 twelfths times row two, add the result to row one. Okay, that's how I'm gonna get my row one. Okay, that's what I'm gonna replace it with. Okay, so negative 11 twelfths times zero, I know is zero, zero plus one is still one. No change there. Then negative 11 twelfths times one is negative 11 twelfths, then plus 11 twelfths is zero. So that's what we want there. And then negative 11 twelfths, times four, this cancels with this and gives me a three. So I'd have negative 11 thirds, and then I'm gonna add this to five thirds. So negative 11 plus five is going to be negative six. 
So this would be negative 6 thirds, which is negative 2. So this is negative 2. And again, we found our answer. So we know that at this point, what? x is equal to negative 2. x is negative 2. And y is 4. Now let me show you what happens when you have a special case scenario. Again, you know that you have systems that have no solution. And you know you have systems with an infinite number of solutions. Again, if you end up with kind of a false statement, then you know you have no solution. If you end up with just a true statement, you know that you have an infinite number of solutions. So let's go ahead and start this in the usual way. I'm going to have a negative x. I'm going to subtract 3y away from each side. And I'm going to subtract 1 away from each side. And then over here, I'm just going to flip this and say this is 8x plus 24y is equal to 17. Again, that's perfectly legal. So the numerical information from this, I'm just going to take a negative 1, a negative 3, and a negative 1, and then an 8, a 24, and a 17. Okay? So we're good to go with this. Let me just copy this. And I'll paste it in right here for us. And again, I'm trying to achieve this form. One's down the diagonal, a zero above and below. Again, this is reduced row echelon form. And then these will just be numbers over here. And once more, just so we don't forget, if this is just a number over here and it's not a zero, then this is row echelon form. Okay, so that's the difference between the two. It's something you might get asked about. Okay, on a test, they might tell you to put it in row echelon form, or they might say put it in reduced row echelon form, and you need to know the difference between the two. Okay, so I want to get a 1 as the first entry right here. How can I do that? Again, we've been doing this all day now, so I'm just going to multiply row 1 by the reciprocal of that number. Okay, so negative 1 is the reciprocal of negative 1. Right? Because if I wrote this over 1, I would say that the reciprocal of it is 1 over negative 1. Again, it's just negative 1. So I would say that we have negative 1 times row 1. That's what I'm going to replace row 1 with. So negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. Negative 1 times negative 3 is 3. Negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. Okay. So now what I want to do is get a 0 here. So how can I do that? Again, we've been doing this all day. I know I need to add a negative 8 to 8 to get 0. So I'm going to multiply row 1 by negative 8. Okay, so row 1 times negative 8. I'm going to add the result to row 2. Again, this is going to give me my row 2. All right, so negative 8 times 1 is negative 8. Negative 8 plus 8 is 0. Then negative 8 times 3 is negative 24. Negative 24 plus 24 is 0 should already see that there's a problem. And then let's just do a, let's just keep going. Although you know there's no solution at this point, just let's keep going. Negative 8 times 1 is negative 8. Negative 8 plus 17 is 9. Okay? Is 9. So let's stop for a minute and consider what we have. We have 0x plus 0y equals 9. So 0x plus 0y equals 9. What is 0x? It's 0. What is 0y? It's 0. So uh, basically you have 0 plus 0, which is 0 equals 9, which is always false. So this is no solution, okay? And if we went back and we really observe this, we would see that we have two lines that are parallel or two lines that have the same slope. If I just look at this as 3y equals, you have negative x plus 1. Again, divide everything by 3 to put it in slope-intercept form. And the slope here is going to be negative 1 third, okay? For this one, let me write this as 24y, 24y is equal to negative 8x plus 17. I'm going to divide everything by 24. And you can already see that you have the same slope, right? You can erase this. Negative 8 over 24 is negative 1 third, okay, negative 1 third. And then 17 over 24, you can't simplify that, but you don't need to because you can see that this slope and this slope, those are the same. When we have parallel lines, again, we know that they don't ever intersect. So there's no point that lies on both lines. So there's no solution for the system. Okay, so this guy right here, you can put the symbol for the null or empty set. Or again, just write no solution. Let's look at one more problem just to kind of wrap this up. And then in the next lesson, we'll look at some systems with three variables. So now we have negative 1 equals 2x plus 5y. So I just have to flip this. So 2x plus 5y equals negative 1. And then for this one, I have negative 6x minus 15y equals 3. 
So we're good to go at this point. But before we even start, you can immediately notice that what? If I multiply equation one or this top equation by negative three, I get equation two, okay? 2x times negative three is negative 6x. 5y times negative three is negative 15y. Negative one times negative three is positive three. So you know that this is going to be an infinite number of solutions for the answer, okay? Because these two equations are the same. So whatever works in the first equation also works in the second equation. Now, let's show this with a matrix. We have two, five, and negative one. And then we have negative six, negative 15, and three. So let's copy this. So again, I'm looking to get this kind of reduced row echelon form. So one's down the diagonal, a zero above and below. And then these are just numbers, okay? So I'm gonna get a one here in this first position. We already know what we're doing. Multiply row one by one half, which is the reciprocal of two. So one half times row one. That's what I'm gonna replace row one with. So this would be one. This would be five halves. Okay, this would be five halves. And this would be negative one half. So this would be negative one half. Now for this guy right here, I wanna make this into a zero. And to do that, I'm just gonna multiply row one by six, add the result to row two. So I'm gonna multiply again, row one by six, add the result to row two. So that's what I'm gonna replace row two with. So six times one is six, six plus negative six is zero, okay? Then five halves times six, this cancels, it gives me three. Three times five is 15, 15 plus negative 15 is zero. Negative one half times six, the six cancels with the two and gives me three. Negative one times three would be negative three. So I would have negative three plus three, which is zero. So again, I'm gonna end up with zero equals zero, which is always true. So that's how I know I have an infinite number of solutions. So let's just write that out. We have an infinite number of solutions. In this lesson, we wanna to continue to talk about Gaussian elimination and also Gauss-Jordan elimination. All right, so in our last lesson, we learned about the Gaussian elimination and also the Gauss-Jordan elimination. And we saw that we could take a linear system in two variables. We could take the kind of numerical information and set up an augmented matrix. And through these elementary row operations, we could kind of pound our matrix into a specific form, okay? Now with the Gaussian elimination, it's this one over here on the left. This is referred to as the row echelon form where you have these ones down your diagonal, okay? So starting at the top left and then going down at a diagonal, okay? And then a zero below, okay? And what this tells you is that you can find out in the case of where you have your X variable, the coefficients are on the kind of left column and the coefficients for the Y variable are kind of next to it. You could say that this bottom row here is zero X plus one Y is equal to whatever this is. Let's just call it D for this video. So let's say this is D. So really you know that Y is D and you can go back up and plug in and find out what X is. So that's our Gaussian elimination. With the Gauss-Jordan elimination, it goes a step further. Okay, so now the matrix is put into something known as reduced row echelon form. So that's where we have these ones going down the diagonal, a zero above and below. And so now directly from the matrix, I can read my solution. What we're gonna do today is we're just going to kind of expand on this. And we're gonna look at some kind of linear systems with three variables. And then in the next lesson, we'll even look at some linear systems with four variables, okay? So I want you to see the kind of row echelon form for this. So you're gonna have ones down the diagonal, zeros below. And of course you have to back substitute to get your answer. And then the reduced row echelon form, you have ones down the diagonal, zeros below and zero above. So with the reduced row echelon form, you get your answer directly from the matrix, this guy on the right. On the left, the row echelon form, you have to do some back substituting. All right, so let's go ahead and start this with kind of an easier example. I am gonna warn you that this process does get really tedious. I'm going straight off of what your textbook would show you, which is where you get a one in your column first, and then you find your zeros, okay? There are faster methods to do this, and you can use those if you want, but I prefer to go with just what the textbook's gonna show you so you don't get confused. And then as we kind of progress, we're gonna find some easier ways to do this. All right, so let's go ahead and read this off. We have x plus y plus three z equals negative one. We have three x plus three y plus four z equals negative three. And we have negative five x minus three y minus six z equals 13. 
So again, I want all my equations in the format of, we have the AX plus BY plus CZ is equal to D, okay? The reason I want that is I want all my X terms to line up, my Y terms, my Z terms, and my constants, because when I write this augmented matrix, I want all the coefficients for X to be in one column, all the coefficients for Y to be in one column, all the coefficients for Z to be in one column, and then all the constants to be in one column. So let's go ahead and set that up. I'm just taking the numerical information only. We know that X has an implied coefficient of one, y has an applied coefficient of 1, we have a 3, and we have a negative 1. Then for this second equation, I have a 3, a 3, a 4, and a negative 3. For my third equation, I have a negative 5, a negative 3, a negative 6, and a 13. So let's just copy this. And let me paste that in right here. We know that we want to put a vertical bar here to separate the coefficients from the constants. And then I'm going to wrap this whole thing in some brackets. So the very first thing you want to do, if you're doing Gaussian elimination, you want to get ones going down the diagonal and you want zeros below. This is faster, right? Because you don't have to go through and keep manipulating the matrix to get it into reduced row echelon form from Gauss-Jordan elimination. I'm going to do both with you. I know it's going to be a lot of time. I know it's going to be tedious, but I want you to get a lot of practice with this. So for the first one, I'm just going to go through and do the Gaussian elimination. We're going to do row echelon form. We're going to back substitute, and then I'll go back into it, okay? And we'll, we'll pound the matrix further and get it into reduced row echelon form. So what I want is, in the first column on the left, I want the top entry to be a 1. It already is, so that's going to save us some time. So then I want this to be a 0 and this to be a 0. Okay. So the reason your textbook always wants you to get a 1 in your column is because it's easy to use it to get a 0. It's always easy to get a 1, hard to get a 0. So how do I get a 0? Remember, I can multiply any row by a non-zero number okay, and add the result to another row. So what's going to happen is I got to think about what I can add to three to get a result of zero. Well, three plus its additive inverse of negative three would be zero. And it's convenient to have a one there because one times anything is itself. So if I multiply this by negative three, I get negative three. And then if I add negative three to three, this is going to be zero. I don't care about any of this stuff over here. I'm only worried about getting a zero here. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to say, okay, I'm going to multiply the additive inverse of 3, which is negative 3, times this top row, or row 1. And let me just label these real quick. So this is row 1, row 2, and row 3. So negative 3 is going to be multiplied by row 1. And then I'm going to add to row 2, and that's what I'm going to replace row 2 with. Okay, so that's what that notation means. And then let me do this one too, real quick, while we're kind of working on this. We can do 2 at once. So we have this negative five here. So what would I need to add to negative five to get a zero? I would need to add positive five. So I would multiply this top row here by positive five. And it's really the same thing. I'm just changing this from row two to row three. And that's what I'm gonna replace row three with, okay? So let's go through this. It's a good idea to kind of write these things down on some scratch paper because one mistake here and it's gonna kill you, right? You're gonna get the wrong answer. and You gotta start the whole thing over. So negative 3 times row 1. That's what we're going to do first. So I'm just going to write these answers kind of down here. So negative 3 times 1 is negative 3. Negative 3 times 1 is negative 3 again. Negative 3 times 3 is negative 9. And then negative 3 times negative 1 is positive 3. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add these kind of results. It's just this part right here. I'm now adding it to row 2, okay, the corresponding entries. All right, so negative 3 plus 3 is going to give me 0. And then I'll have negative 3 plus 3 again. That's going to be 0. I'm going to have negative 9 plus 4. That's going to be negative 5. And then I'm going to have 3 plus negative 3, which is going to be 0. Okay. So I'm done with this, and I'm done with this. So I'm just going to erase this, and now I'm going to move on to this one. So if I do 5 times 1, that's 5. 5 times 1, again, that's 5. 5 times 3 is 15. And 5 times negative 1 is negative 5. So now I'm adding these results, okay, this part right here, to row three. Okay, if you ever get lost in what you're doing, just look at your notation. It's going to help you keep track of what's going on. So five plus negative five is zero, and then five plus negative three is going to be two, and then 15 plus negative six is going to be nine, and then negative five plus 13 is going to be positive eight. Okay, so this part's done. Now, I've got one up here, I've got zeros below. So as I move to my next column, I want this to be a 1. 
Again, if I'm doing Gaussian elimination, okay, Gaussian elimination, I want ones down the diagonal and zeros below. I don't care about anything else. In this particular case, I can't just multiply by the reciprocal, okay, because that's what I normally do, right? If I had a two in that position, I could multiply that whole row by a half and a half times two would give me one. But because I have zero and it's unique, because zero times anything is zero, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna switch row two and row three. Remember, we can always interchange two rows. So I'm gonna say row two is gonna switch with row three. And so this is gonna change and be, let me kind of write this up here so we keep track. So I'm gonna have zero, zero, negative five, and zero. So I'm just gonna erase this and I'm gonna copy this. So zero, two, nine, and eight. And then I'll write this in here, what I just did. So zero, zero, negative five, and zero. And it's just a good idea to use a lot of scratch paper because again, one silly mistake and the whole thing is blown. All right, so let's go through now and make this into a one. I'm gonna multiply the reciprocal of two, okay, which is one half, times that entire row. So times row two, that's gonna give me my new row two. And I want you to think about something. I'm not affecting this to the left because zero times anything is always zero. So there's no change on this. This becomes what we want, which is a one. So I really only have to worry about this being a nine halves and then eight divided by two is going to be four, okay? So that takes care of that. All right, so now to complete this row echelon form, I just need a one here and I'm done, right? I can go back and substitute and find my answer. So I would wanna multiply row three by the reciprocal of negative five, which is negative one fifth because negative one fifth times negative five would give me one. So that's what I'm gonna replace row three with. Of course, zero times anything is zero, zero times anything is zero, zero times anything is zero. So I only need to change this into a one. And at this point we've achieved our row echelon form. So we can just go back, substitute, figure out our answer, right? So we can say that since this column here represents the coefficients for Z, we would have Z or one Z is equal to zero. These two guys are zero, so those variables are eliminated. You can think about this as saying you have zero X plus zero Y plus one Z equals zero. Well, zero times anything is zero. So this is zero plus zero plus one Z, which is just one Z or Z equals zero. So now I can start back substituting. If I know Z equals zero, I can take these coefficients here. I can just say this is zero X plus one Y plus nine halves times Z, Z is zero, and this equals four. Well, I know that this is gone, right? Zero times anything is zero. I basically just have this gone and Y is just equal to four. Y is just equal to four, so that's pretty easy. And then in terms of X, I know that one X plus one Y, okay, Y is four, so just four, plus three Z, okay, Z is zero. So I can just say, leave that off. This would be equal to negative one. Well, okay, I can just subtract four away from each side of the equation and find that X is equal to negative five. So X is going to be negative five, Y is gonna be four and Z is zero. So at this point, if you're just told to find the answer and you wanna use a matrix method, you can just do it this way because this is a little bit quicker than going all the way through the process with the Gauss-Jordan, okay? If you wanna go through the remainder of this, which we're gonna do, what you need to do is you need to get a zero here, you need to get a zero here, and you need to get a zero here. And what that does is it allows us to kind of read the answer directly from the matrix. All right, so let's go ahead and crank this out. I'm gonna start off with this guy right here in my middle column. So again, I'm gonna use this one to my advantage. I'm gonna multiply row two. I'm gonna multiply row two by negative one, which is the additive inverse of positive one. I'm gonna add the result to row one. Okay, that's how I'm gonna get my new row one. So let's just go through and multiply negative one times everything in row two. So negative one times zero is zero. We have negative one times one, which is negative one. We have negative one times nine halves, which is negative nine halves. And then we have negative one times four, which is negative four. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna add these results here, this part right here, to uh, the corresponding entries in row one. So we know zero plus anything is gonna leave it unchanged, so I don't need to worry about that. Negative one plus one is going to be zero. I know that negative nine halves plus three, let's do that off to the side in a minute. And then I would have negative four plus negative one, which is negative five, okay? So let's work on this one right here. We're trying to figure out what this is gonna be. So to get a common denominator, I'd multiply this by two over two. 
okay? And I would have six, let's just write this as six over two plus negative nine over two. I know that negative nine plus positive six is gonna be negative three. So this would end up being negative three over two. So this is done, so let's erase this. So now what I need is a zero here and here to finish this up. It's actually gonna work out pretty conveniently here because we have a zero here, a zero here, and a zero here. So what does that actually mean? Well, remember, if I'm trying to work on things in column three, I'm gonna use this one in row three to kind of work off of. And what makes it easy is that when I multiply by zero, I get zero. If I add zero to something, it leaves it unchanged. So what happens is if I want to multiply three halves, the additive inverse of negative three halves, times my row three, in every case, it's gonna be zero, zero, and zero over here. So when I add those to the corresponding entries, nothing's gonna change. So the only thing's gonna change is this, okay? So if I add this to row one and I replace row one with this, I only need to change this and I'm just gonna change it into a zero. It's the same thing here. So if I multiply negative, okay, negative nine halves times row three, okay, for that one, and then I add the result to row two, that's what I'm gonna replace row two with. Once again, these zeros do not affect this, okay, because negative nine halves times zero is gonna be zero. Adding zero to something does not change it. So I'm only gonna change this guy right here and it's going to be a zero, all right? So we can see that we got the same answer by putting our kind of augmented matrix in this reduced row echelon form. We have our ones going down the diagonal. We have zeros above and below. So we find that X is negative five. We find that Y is four. And we find that Z is equal to zero. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at another one. Again, as we work more and more of these, they get easier and easier. So we have negative six X plus Y plus seven Z equals negative 32. Let me just write the negative six, the one for the coefficient for Y that's implied, the seven, and then the negative 32, okay? Just taking the information from the first equation. Then from the second one, you have negative 5x plus 5y plus 5z equals negative 10. Again, when you see something that can be simplified, meaning everything here is divisible by five, go ahead and take the opportunity to do that because it's gonna mean that you're working with smaller numbers. So if I divide everything by five, this would be a negative one, this would be a one, this would be a one, and this would be a negative two. So you'd have negative one, one, one and negative two, okay? And I can erase that. And then for the last one, we have a negative three, we have a two, we have a one. Again, that's implied to be one. And then we have a one, okay? So let me put my vertical bar here to separate the coefficients from the constants. And once again, I just wanna stress this. This is already written in the format of AX plus BY plus CZ equals D. If it's not already written in that format, you've gotta do that first, okay? All right, so let's set this up and let's copy this. All right, so let's paste that in. So again, I want this top left entry to be a one. So the easiest way to do that is just to multiply this first row here by the reciprocal of this number. So again, I can label this as row one, row two, and row three. You don't have to do this, but it's just nice to kind of show what's going on. So I'm gonna multiply negative one six, which is the reciprocal of negative six, by row one. That's gonna give me my new row one, okay? So if I do that, negative one six times negative six is going to be positive one. Negative one six times one is going to be negative one six. Then negative one six times seven is negative seven six. And then negative one six times negative 32, let's do that off to the side. So we would have negative one six times negative 32. We know that negative times negative is positive. So I can get rid of that sign there. So we'll just erase these, we don't need them. And then 32 and six, they're each divisible by two, right? So 32 divided by two is 16. Six divided by two is three. So this is gonna be 16 thirds. All right, so the next thing I wanna do is I wanna get zeros below this one. So I want this to be a zero and I want this to be a zero. So what can I do? Again, I just think about the fact that I have a one here already, okay? I have a one there. And the reason you get the one first is so that you can work with that. So all I need to think about is the additive inverse of negative one, which is positive one, okay? So I would just multiply row one by one, or you can just think of it as, I'm just gonna add row one to row two, okay? So what I'm gonna say is I'm gonna multiply row one by one. I'm gonna add the result to row two. That's gonna give me my new row two. 
Okay, so all I'm going to do is just add. So one plus negative one is zero. Negative one six plus one is what? I'm going to write this as six over six. And six minus one would be five. So this would be five, six. Then for this one, you'd have negative seven, six plus one. I'm going to write as six over six. Negative seven plus six is going to be negative one. So this would be negative one sixth. And then lastly, you would have 16 thirds plus negative two. So 16 thirds plus you'd have negative. I'll go ahead and say this is six over three. So 16 minus six is 10. So we can say this is 10 thirds. OK, so that's taken care of. So to get a zero here, again, I use the same concept. I'm going to use that one there. And again, the opposite of negative three is three. So I'm going to multiply row one by three, add the result to row three. So I'm going to multiply row one by three, add the result to row three. That's going to give me my new row three. So one times three is three. Negative one over six, negative one over six times three is one. This will cancel with this and give me a two. So this is negative one half. This is negative one half. And then negative seven, six, negative seven, six times three is one. This cancels with this and gives me a two. So this is negative seven halves. And then you have 16 thirds times three. The threes are going to cancel. So this will cancel with this and I have 16. All right, so let's add now. Three plus negative three is zero. So let me erase this. We'll have negative one half plus two. So negative one half plus two. So let me do plus four over two. So this would be what? Four minus one is three. So this would be three halves. So three halves. Okay, so this is gone. And then negative seven halves plus one. Let's add two over two. Negative seven plus two is negative five. So this would be negative five halves. And then lastly, you would have 16 plus one, which is 17. Okay, so this is 17. All right, so now we have the first column done and we're gonna move into the second column here. And again, I always wanna start by getting a one. I get the one and then I can get the zero above and below pretty easily. So to get the one, I just multiply row two by the reciprocal of this five six, which is six fifths. Okay, so six fifths times row two. That's what I'm gonna replace row two with. All right. So we know that this guy to the left isn't gonna be affected because zero times anything is just zero, okay? But this guy is gonna be a one, so I don't really need to worry about that. I really just need to do the calculations for these two. So I would have six fifths times negative one sixth, okay? So this would cancel with this and give me a negative one fifth. So this would be negative one fifth. Let me erase that. And then lastly, you would have your six fifths times 10 thirds. We know that this would cancel with this and give me a two. And this would cancel with this and give me a two. Two times two is four. So this would be four. So now we wanna get a zero above and below this one. So again, I'm thinking about the additive inverse of negative one sixth. So that's gonna be one sixth. So let me multiply row two. Let me multiply row two by one sixth. So one sixth times row two, then plus row one. This is gonna be my new row one, okay? So again, to the left of this, it's not gonna matter because zero times anything is zero, zero plus anything is just itself. So I really need to just think about, I know that this would turn into a zero. So I really just need to work on this negative one fifth times one sixth, okay? And then I'll add this result to this negative seven six. So I know that this would be negative one over 30. So negative one over 30 and then plus negative seven over six. So I'll multiply this by five over five. Negative seven times five is negative 35. So you would have negative 35 over 30. And negative one plus negative 35 is negative 36. So let's say this is negative 36 over 30, which is what? Each is divisible by six. This would be negative six over five. So I'll replace this with negative six fifths. And one more. Okay, we need to do one more. So let me write that a little bit better. Now. I also need to multiply four by one sixth. So four times one sixth, this would cancel with this. This would be a three, this would be a two. So this would be two thirds, okay? So two thirds, and then add that result to 16 thirds, okay? So 16 plus two is 18. 18 divided by three is going to give you six. And let's get this guy to be a zero now. So I'm gonna multiply row two 
I'm going to multiply row 2 by what? Again, I want the additive inverse of this, so negative 3 halves, then plus my row 3. That's going to give me my new row 3. I know that I don't need to really do anything this way because I'll be multiplying this by a 0, and that's going to be 0, and then adding it to this would leave it unchanged. So really, I just need to change this into a 0 because I know it would be 0, and I need to work on this one and this one. So I would multiply negative 3 halves times negative 1 fifth, and that would give us 3 tenths, okay? And then I would add 3 tenths to negative 5 halves. So 3 tenths, 3 tenths plus negative 5 halves, multiply this by 5 over 5. So this would be negative 25, negative 25 over 10, okay, over 10. So negative 25 plus 3 is negative 22. So you would have negative 22 over 10. So this is negative 22 over 10. And then lastly, I'm going to multiply negative 3 halves times this 4. Okay, that's going to cancel. Give me 2. Negative 3 times 2 is negative 6. So negative 6. And then add the result to 17. That's going to be 11. What we want to do now is get a 1 as this entry here. Okay. So how do we do that? We multiply row 3 by the reciprocal of that guy. So I'd have negative 10 over 22 times row 3. Again, that's going to give me my new row 3. So we know that this would be a 1. We know that this would be a 1. And we can just eyeball this and say that I know that 11 would cancel with 22, right? 22 divided by 11 is 2. So let's just erase this. This would become a 2. And negative 10 over 2 would be negative 5. Okay, so at this point, you have row echelon four. You have ones down the diagonal. Okay, let me highlight that. So ones down the diagonal, you have zeros below. Okay, so that's row echelon form. This is what we get from Gaussian elimination. But we're going to continue with the Gauss Jordan elimination and put this in reduced row echelon form. So I want a zero here and here. Again, it's not that hard because we're, we're almost there. Okay, I know this is very tedious and that's just because we're taking our time. So for this guy right here, this negative one fifth, I can make it into a zero by multiplying row three, okay, row three by one fifth, add the result to row two. So one fifth times row three plus row two would give me my new row two, okay? So I know I don't have to work this way, right? I don't have to worry about that because if I'm multiplying a zero, okay, in each case here, by this number, I get zero, and then if I add zero to something, it stays unchanged. So I really don't even need to work on this one because I know it's going to be zero. I just have to work on this one. Okay, so that makes it kind of quicker. So it's one fifth, one fifth times this guy right here, which is negative five. That becomes negative one. Okay, and that gets added to four, so that is three. Okay. So now the last one, we're going to multiply row three by six fifths. Okay, so by six fifths. And we're going to add the result to row one, and that's going to give us our new row one. Okay. Now, again, when I think about this, I don't need to do anything this way. Okay. I know I'm going to replace this with a zero. Okay. And I just need to work on this one. So six fifths times negative five, six fifths times negative five. This would cancel, give me negative one. So it's negative six. So negative six plus six would give me zero. So now I have my solution finally. Okay. So I can say that 1z equals negative 5, or z equals negative 5. I can say that 1y equals 3, or y equals 3. And I can say that 1x equals 0, or x equals 0. All right, so let's continue with the next example. So now we have negative 4x plus 7y minus 3z equals 33. So negative 4, we have 7, we have negative 3, and we have 33. Then we have negative 7x plus 6y minus 5z equals 19. So negative 7, 6, negative 5, and then 19. And then we have negative 5x plus 2y minus 4z equals 2. So negative 5, 2, negative 4, and 2. Okay, so let me put this bar here, and then let me put these brackets, and we're ready to go. So let me copy this. Let's go down here to a nice fresh sheet. And again, we want ones down the diagonal. We want zeros above and below, okay? So I'm going to start by getting a 1 in this position here. And to do that, I'm just going to multiply the top row or row 1. Let me label these real quick. So row 1, row 2, and row 3. 
I'm just going to multiply row 1 by the reciprocal of negative 4. So I'm going to do negative 1 fourth times row 1. Okay, that's what I'm going to replace row 1 with. Okay, so negative 1 fourth times negative 4 is going to be 1. Then negative 1 fourth times 7 is going to be negative 7 fourths. So negative 7 fourths. Then negative 1 fourth times negative 3 is going to be positive 3 fourths. And then negative 1 fourth times 33 is going to be negative 33 fourths. So negative 33 fourths. Okay, so that part's done. So now I want to get a zero here and here. So let me start with row two and getting a zero here. So again, because I have a one here, it makes it easy to get a zero here because I can just say, okay, I want to add a seven to this negative seven to get a zero. So I can multiply this top row or row one by seven. So seven times row one, and then I can add that result to row two. That's gonna give me my new row two, and this is gonna be a zero, okay? So this would be zero. And then for this guy right here, I would have seven times negative seven fourths. So seven times negative seven fourths. And then I would add that to six. So when that's done, I'm gonna add that to six. So this would be negative 49 fourths. And then if I added that to six, I would make this 24 fourths. So this would end up giving me negative 25 fourths. So I'm gonna put negative 25 fourths, okay? So now I wanna do three fourths times seven and add the result to this negative five. So this would end up being what? It would be 21 fourths. So 21 fourths plus negative five. So I could make this negative 20 over four. And 21 plus negative 20 would be one. So this would be one fourth. Okay, so I'll erase this and put a one fourth here. So let's erase this. And then lastly, I have this negative 33 fourths times seven, and then plus 19 when that's done. So this would end up giving me negative 231 fourths. So negative 231 fourths. And then I'm adding to this 19. Now, what I can do to get a common denominator, 19 times four is 76. So I can say this is 76 fourths. So negative 231 plus 76 is gonna be negative 155, and this is over four, okay? All right, so that part's done. Now we're gonna do something similar for this right here. So I would multiply five by row one. Again, think about that one. Five times one is five. Add that to negative five, you get zero. And I would add the result to row three, okay? So that's gonna give me my new row three. So if I do this one would be zero, then I would take negative seven fourths and multiply it by five and add the result to two. So this is gonna end up giving me negative 35 fourths and then plus, instead of two, I'm gonna write eight fourths. So negative 35 plus eight is negative 27. So this is gonna be negative 27 fourths. That's gonna go right here. So negative 27 fourths. Okay, the next thing I wanna do is take three fourths. So three fourths and multiply it by five and then add the result to negative four. So this is gonna end up being 15 fourths, okay? And if I add this to negative four, let's write this as negative 16 over four. So 15 plus negative 16 is negative one. So this will end up being negative, negative one fourth. Okay, so negative one fourth. And then lastly, what I wanna do is multiply five by negative 33 fourths. So negative 33 fourths times five. That's gonna give me negative 165. So negative 165 over four and then plus two. Again, I'm gonna write that as eight over four. So negative 165 plus eight is negative 157. So this is negative 157 over four. And let's move on now. So the next thing I wanna do is get a one here. Okay, I always wanna get a one first and then get my zero below and above in this case. So I can do that by just multiplying row two by the reciprocal of that. So I would have negative four twenty-fifths times my row two, that's gonna give me my new row two, okay? So this is not gonna be affected. This will turn into a one, okay? This will be a one. And then this guy right here, you'd have one fourth times negative four twenty-fifths. 
So what's going to happen is this will cancel with this. I'll have a negative 1 over 25. Okay. And then let me erase this. The last thing I want to do is I want to take negative 4 over 25 and multiply it by negative 155 over 4. So this is going to cancel. And you'd basically have this negative times negative, which would give you a positive. Between 155 and 25, you have a common factor of 5. So this would be 5 here, and this would be 31 here. Okay, so this right here is going to be 31 fifths. So let's erase this. So now we're done with that. And now I want a 0 here and here. So to get a 0 here on the bottom, I would multiply row 2 by 27 fourths. Okay, so 27 fourths times row 2. And then plus row 3. That's going to give me my new row 3. So again, I don't need to worry about this stuff over here. For this one, I know this is going to end up being a 0. So I'm really going to only have to work with kind of this part right here and this part right here. So I would have 27 fourths times negative 1 over 25. I'm going to add that to negative 1 fourth. So what's going to happen is between 27 and 25, there's no common factors other than 1. So really, I'm just going to say this is negative 27 over 100. So negative 27 over 100. For this, I can multiply by 25 over 25. So I'd have negative 25 over 100. And that's going to give me what? This would be negative 52 over 100. OK, so let me erase this. And we can simplify this before we write it. 52 divided by 4 is 13. And 100 divided by 4 is 25. Okay, So I'm going to write this as negative 13 25ths. And then lastly, I want to do 27 fourths times 31 fifths. And then add that to negative 157 fourths. So 27 times 31 is 837. So this would be 837 over 20. So 837 over 20. If I multiply this by 5 over 5, I would get negative 785 over 20. So if I do this addition, 837 plus negative 785, I'm going to get 52. Okay, so I would get 52 over 20. 52 over 20, which is going to simplify. Each is divisible by 4. 52 divided by 4, again, is 13. 20 divided by 4 is 5. So this guy right here is going to be 13 fifths. Okay? All right, so let's work on this and getting a 0 here. So again, I want to multiply row 2 by 7 fourths now and add the result to row 1. Okay, that's going to be my new row 1. And so I already know that this is going to be a 0. Okay? Then you would have 7 fourths times negative 1 over 25. Add that to 3 fourths. Let me scroll down a little bit. I'll come back up. So this right here would be negative 7 over 100 plus, if I multiply this by 25 over 25, I would have 75 over 100. Negative 7 plus 75 is going to be 68. So this would be 68 over 100, which would simplify. 68 divided by 4 is 17, so this would be 17 over 25, right? Because 100 divided by 4 is 25. So this would be 17 over 25. So 17 over 25. And then for this one right here, again, we're going to multiply 7 fourths times 31 fifths and then plus negative 33 fourths. OK, so 7 times 31 is 217. So you'd have 217 over 20. So 217 over 20. And I'll multiply this by 5 over 5. So this would be negative 165 over 20. So 217 minus 165 is going to give me 52. So I'd end up with 52 over 20. So 52 over 20. And we already know this is going to simplify to 13 over 5, right? Because 52 divided by 4 is 13, and 20 divided by 4 is 5, okay? So I'm going to replace this with 13 fifths. So now I want to move on to this column, and I want to get a 1 here, okay? So how do I do that? I multiply row 3 by the reciprocal of this. So... I would take 25 over 13, the negative of that, multiply it by row 3. That's my new row 3. Again, this one and this one are not going to be affected. This guy is going to be a 1. And then this guy right here, I'd have negative 25 over 13 times 13 over 5. 
the 13s are going to cancel. Negative 25 over 5 is negative 5. So this is negative 5. And at this point, again, you could stop. You have row echelon form, okay? So you could go back and substitute. You know z is negative 5 at this point. You could find out x and y. But we're going to continue. We're going to get a 0 here and here. Okay, so what I want to do to make this into a 0, I want to use this one here. The additive inverse would be 1 over 25, so times this row 3, and then plus row 2. Okay, so I know that I don't need to worry about this or this because multiplying by 0 would leave a 0 and then adding zero to that would leave it unchanged. This guy I know is going to be a zero. So I really only need to work with one over 25 times negative five and then plus 31 fifths, okay? So I know that this would cancel with this and give me a five here. So this would be negative one fifth. So this would be negative one fifth, okay? So plus 31 fifths would be 30 over five, which is six. So this is six. So we know z is negative 5, and we know y is 6. Let me just write that as we're doing this. So we know z is negative 5. We know y is 6, okay? Now, let's find out x. So what we're going to do is get a 0 here. So again, I'm going to use this row 3 with this 1 in it, and I'm going to multiply row 3 by the additive inverse of this, so negative 17 over 25, so then plus row 1, that's going to give me my new row one, okay? So I know that this guy and this guy are not going to be affected, okay? This guy is going to be a zero. All I need to do is figure out this guy. So it is negative five times negative 17 over 25, and then plus 13 over five. Okay, let's find out. So this guy would cancel with this guy and give me a five. Negative times negative is positive. So let's just get rid of that and say this is 17 over five plus 13 over five. That's 30 over 5, which is 6, okay? So this is 6, so x is 6, y is 6, and z is negative 5. In this lesson, we want to finish talking about Gaussian elimination and also the Gauss-Jordan elimination. All right, so over the course of the last two lessons, we learned about the Gaussian elimination and the Gauss-Jordan elimination. And we saw that we could use these two methods to kind of solve a linear system. We looked at two variables and then also one with three variables. And so now what we're gonna do is just take the next step and look at a linear system with four variables. This is very tedious, I'll just tell you that before we start, but I'm gonna do some things that just kind of speed us up so I'm going to just take this guy real quick and set up our matrix so we can just get going right away. So we know we want to take the numerical information from each equation here. And you might notice that we've labeled our variables a little bit different. In your book, if you're taking pre-calculus or college algebra, you might see X, Y, Z, and then W. Okay, So W will be first because it's in alphabetical order. But I didn't do that because a lot of times you'll also see this with the notation of x sub 1 through x sub 4. So whatever you're comfortable with is fine. If you don't like this, you can replace x sub 1 with w, x sub 2 with x, x sub 3 with y, and x sub 4 with z. Okay, So I'm just going to follow the format of x sub 1 coming first, then x sub 2, then x sub 3, then x sub 4. Okay, That's what I'm going to do. All right, so we're going to start out with this first equation. We'll have a 3, a negative 2, a 5 and then a negative 1 and a negative 8. Then in the second equation, I'm going to have a negative 1, a 3, a negative 1, a 4, and then a 9. Then in the third equation, I'm going to have a negative 2, a negative 1, a 4, a 9, and a negative 9. Let me make that a little better. And let me scroll down a little bit. Then in this last equation, I want you to notice that you don't have an x sub 2. Whenever you're missing a variable, you want to write a 0 as the coefficient for that variable to act as a placeholder. So I'm going to put a 1, and then again, for my x sub 2, I'm putting a 0 as the coefficient. Then for x sub 3, I put a 3, then my 2, then my negative 2, okay? So this guy is now set up for us, and we are ready to go. So let me copy this real quick. Now, the quickest way to solve this, if you only know kind of Gaussian elimination or Gauss-Jordan elimination, if you just get this, and this is where you are in your chapter, I would suggest just doing the Gaussian elimination putting this matrix in row echelon form, meaning I'm just going to get ones down the diagonal and zeros below. It's going to be really quick to do that and then kind of back substitute to get your answer. If you go through to reduced row echelon form, again, that's from the Gauss-Jordan elimination, it does take a little bit longer. 
That is what we're going to do today just to get a lot of practice on these elementary row operations because I feel like you do need it. It's just something that comes up, it goes away, and then later on, if you have to go back to it, it's something if you didn't practice enough, you kind of forget it, and then you might struggle with it again. All right, so the very first thing I want to do is I want to get a 1 as this top position here, and then I want to work below and get zeros. Okay, Every time I go to the right to a new column, I want to get my 1 first and then my zeros. So what I'm going to do... I could multiply this first row, which I'd label as row 1. Okay, let me label all these real quick. I could multiply row 1 by 1 third, but there's an easier solution. Remember, for the elementary row operations, I can swap two rows. So I can say row 1 is going to swap with row 4 because I already have a 1 there. And if I swap those rows, this guy would come up here. Okay, so let me just write this real quick. I have 1, 0, 3, 2, and negative 2. I'll just erase this from here. I'll just copy this here. 3, negative 2, 5, negative 1, and negative 8. And then I'll just copy this right here. So 1, 0, 3, 2, and negative 2. Okay, so now that I have my 1 in this position here, these ones going down are pretty easy to get. And I'm going to do multiple ones at once. Okay, we're ready to kind of speed up this process. So we know that if we want this to be a 0... I've got to add the opposite of that number to it, okay? So in this case, I've got to add a 1. In this case, I've got to add a 2. And in this case, I've got to add a negative 3. Well, this 1 is really convenient because whatever I multiply by 1, it's just itself. So what I'm going to do in each case is I'm going to multiply row 1 by whatever I need to add to this to make it a 0. And then I'm going to add it to that row. And then that's what I'm going to replace the row with, okay? So for the first one... I'm going to say that I'm going to have 1 times row 1 plus row 2. This is what I'm going to replace row 2 with, okay? And when you multiply something by 1, it's just itself. So really, you could just say row 1 plus row 2 if you want. Then for the next one, I'm going to end up saying that I'm going to have 2 times row 1, okay? So the opposite of negative 2 is 2. So 2 times row 1 plus row 3. That's what I'm going to replace row 3 with. And then for this last one here, I'm going to have negative 3, okay, because negative 3 plus 3 is 0. So negative 3 times row 1 plus my row 4 is what I'm going to replace row 4 with. Okay, so let's go through and crank this out real quick. So I know for this one, I'm just adding row 1 and row 2. That's what I'm replacing row 2 with. So 1 plus negative 1 is 0. 0 plus 3 is 3. 3 plus negative 1 is 2. 2 plus 4 is 6, and negative 2 plus 9 is 7. So this one is done. Then for this one, 2 times row 1 plus row 3, that's what I'm going to replace row 3 with. So 2 times 1 is 2, 2 plus negative 2 is 0. 2 times 0 is 0, 0 plus negative 1 is negative 1. Then 2 times 3 is 6, 6 plus 4 is 10. 2 times 2 is 4, 4 plus 9 is 13. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. Negative 4 plus negative 9 is negative 13. All right, so this one is done. So let's do this one. So we have negative 3 times row 1 plus row 4. Negative 3 times 1 is negative 3 plus 3 is 0. We know that this would be still negative 2. Negative 3 times 3 is negative 9. Negative 9 plus 5 is negative 4. And then negative 3 times 2 is negative 6. Negative 6 plus negative 1 is negative 7. Then lastly, we have negative 3 times negative 2, which is going to be positive 6. And then positive 6 plus negative 8 is negative 2. All right, so that part's done. I have a 1 here and zeros below. Now I want to move to my next column, and I want to get a 1 here, okay? I already have a 0 above, so I'm going to get that 1 first, and then I'm going to get the zeros below. Okay, so the easiest way to get a 1 in this position here, I can multiply any row by a non-zero real number. So I'm just going to multiply this whole row, row 2, by the reciprocal of 3, because 3 times a third would give me 1, okay? So I'm going to multiply 1 third times row 2. That's what I'm going to replace row 2 with. So this would be 1. This would be 2 thirds. This would be 6 thirds, which is 2. And this would be 7 thirds, okay? So that's pretty quick. And now I want to get a 0 here, and I want to get a 0 here. So I know the additive inverse of negative 1 is 1. So again, I could multiply 1 times row 2 and add that to row 3. That's what I could replace row 3 with if I want this to be a 0. And again, if I'm multiplying by 1, it's just itself, so you can just erase that. 
Then for this one, the additive inverse of negative two is two. So I wanna multiply two times row two, and then add that to row four. That's gonna give me my new row four, okay? So for this guy right here, I'm just gonna add row two and row three, and that's gonna replace row three. So one plus negative one is zero. Then you would have two thirds plus 10. Well, I know I could write this as over. I could multiply this by three over three, so this would be 30 thirds. And 30 plus two is 32, so this would be 32 thirds. So this would be 32 thirds. Then I'd have two plus 13, which is 15. And then lastly, I would have seven thirds plus negative 13. Multiply this by three over three, you would get 39 there over three. So negative 39 thirds. So negative 39 plus seven would be negative 32. So this would be negative 32 thirds. Okay, so let's erase this and this. This one's done. So now let me work on this row here. Again, I want that to be a zero. So I'm gonna multiply two times row two, add the result to row four. That's what I'm gonna replace row four with. So we know this is gonna be a zero. Two thirds times two is four thirds. Then plus negative four, multiply this by three over three, you get negative 12 thirds. Four plus negative 12 is negative eight. So this is gonna be negative eight thirds. Okay, then the next one is going to be two times two, which is four. Four plus negative seven is negative three. Then the last one's two times seven thirds, which is 14 thirds. Then plus negative two, which I'll write as negative six over three. So 14 minus six is going to be eight. So this would be eight thirds. So I'll put this as eight thirds. Okay, so let me erase this. So far, so good. So now I want a one here to get started, okay? These two columns to the left are done. I want this to be a one. So you already know the deal. I'm gonna multiply row three by three over 32. And this gets easier as we move on because I don't have to worry about this stuff over here. This is zero and this is zero. So multiplying that by the reciprocal doesn't do anything, right? It's still zero. This is going to be one, we already know that. So really the only calculation I have to do is 15 times three over 32, which is gonna be 45 over 32. And then you would have your negative 32 over three times three over 32. This cancels and this cancels, you get negative one. So this is negative one here. Okay, so let's erase this. Okay, so let's think about getting a zero here, here, and here. Okay, so three different things we wanna do. Again, in each case, because I've got a one there, think about what the additive inverse is of what you're trying to make into a zero multiply that by that row with the one in it, and then add that to the current row that you're trying to make that into a zero. I know I said a lot there, but basically if you think about this, for row one, I'm trying to make this three into a zero. So I'm gonna multiply row three by negative three, the additive inverse of that, add the result to row one. Okay, so that's gonna take care of that. That's what I'm gonna replace row one with. Same concept as we move on. So for row two, I'm gonna multiply negative two thirds, which is the additive inverse of two thirds times row three, okay, that one in row three, plus row two, that's what I'm gonna replace row two with. And then lastly for row four, I'm gonna take positive eight thirds, multiply it by row three, add the result to row four, that's what I'm gonna replace row four with. All right, so let's do these one at a time. So let's start with this kind of row one here. So I want negative three times this row three, Okay, I'm gonna add the result to row one. Now, because these two guys here are zeros, I don't need to worry about it. Zero times anything is zero. Adding zero to something doesn't change it. I know this would be zero. I don't even need to worry about that. I just have to do the calculation for these two. So I would start here with this kind of 45 over 32, and I would multiply it by this negative three, okay, by this negative three, and I would add to this, this value of two. Okay, so that's one of them that I have to do. Then the other one would be negative one, so negative one times negative three, and then I'm gonna to add to that negative two. So let's kind of slide down here and do this and we'll come back up. So 45 times negative three is negative 135, and this will be over 32. Then plus, for two to get a common denominator, I would write it as 64 over 32. So if I sum these, negative 135 plus 64 is going to be negative 71. So this would be negative 71 over 32. 
Okay, so for this one, negative 1 times negative 3 is 3, right? Positive 3. And positive 3 plus negative 2 is positive 1. So I'm going to have negative 71 over 32, and I'm going to have positive 1. So let's erase this. So we'll put this as negative 71 over 32. Let me make that better. So negative 71 over 32. And then again, this was positive 1. Okay, so now I can erase this. This part's done. Let me kind of slide this up. So now let's work on this one. So I know that this right here, again, I'm multiplying negative 2 thirds times row 3. So this and this are not affected. This is going to be a 0. This right here, I would have negative 2 thirds times, so negative 2 thirds times 45 over 32. And then the result of that would be added to 2. So let's figure out what this is. So this cancels with this and gives me a 16 down here. This cancels with this and gives me a 15 here. So this is negative 15 over 16. So negative 15 over 16. To get a common denominator going, I'm going to say this is 32 over 16. And then 32 minus 15 is 17. So this would be 17 over 16. So that's what I'm going to put right here. It's going to be, again, 17 over 16. All right, and then one more to do. So I'm going to multiply negative 2 thirds times negative 1. So negative 2 thirds times negative 1, which would just be 2 thirds. And then I'm going to add the result to this 7 thirds here. Okay, so 2 plus 7 is 9. So this would be 9 over 3, which is 3. So I'm going to replace this with a 3. Okay, so let's erase this one. And now we're just going to work on this one. So I've got 8 thirds times row 3 plus row 4. So if I go through, again, this one and this one, it's not going to change these. This guy's going to turn into a 0. So what I want to do is 8 thirds times 45 over 32. So this cancels with this and gives me a 4. This cancels with this and gives me a 15. So you have 15 fourths plus negative 3. So 15 fourths. You can go ahead and just say minus 3. 3 is 12 over 4. 15 minus 12 is 3, so this is just 3 fourths. 3 fourths. All right, then we want to do 8 thirds times negative 1, which is just negative 8 thirds. And then we want to go plus 8 thirds, which is obviously going to give us 0. So this will be 0 here. All right, so not much left. So we want to get a 1 here now. And to do that, I can just multiply row 4 by 4 thirds. Obviously, you can see that x sub 4 is going to be 0, right? Because when I multiply this by 4 thirds, this by 4 thirds, this by 4 thirds, and this by 4 thirds, it's all going to stay 0. This is going to change into a 1, right? So 4 thirds times row 4 is what I'm going to replace row 4 with. So this will just be 1, okay? All right, now I want a 0 here, here, and here. So to get the 0 here, I'm going to multiply row 4 by negative 45 over 32, add the result to row 3. Again, that's what I'm going to replace row 3 with. And then I'm going to multiply negative 17 over 16 times row 4, add the result to row 2. That's what I'm going to replace row 2 with. And then lastly, I'm going to multiply 71 over 32 times row 4, add the result to row 1, that's what I'm going to replace row 1 with. Now, before I do anything, you might want to notice that this is a 0, this is a 0, this is a 0, and this is a 0. So in every case, whatever this number is, it doesn't matter, when it multiplies these guys by 0 and I add it to whatever row it is, it doesn't change. So none of these entries are going to change anywhere except for here, here, and here. And in every case, I'm adding exactly what I need to make them into a 0. So I can just go ahead and put... 0, 0, 0, and so we have our solution. So remember, it's the coefficients for x sub 1, then x sub 2, then x sub 3, then x sub 4. So for x sub 1, it's going to be 1. For x sub 2, it's going to be 3. For x sub 3, it's going to be negative 1. And for x sub 4, it's going to be 0. So again, in this particular case, we just so happen to get x sub 1 through x sub 4. But if you had w, x, y, and z, remember, the leftmost column would be w, then x, then y, then z. It goes in alphabetical order. With subscripts, you go 1, 2, 3, and 4. You go in numerical order. In this lesson, we want to talk about finding the determinant of an n by n matrix. 
So when we work with a square matrix, or again, an n by n matrix, a matrix with the same number of rows as columns, we're going to have a real number that's associated with that matrix that's known as its determinant. So this is a very special number for us. We use it all the time when we're working with matrices. And we already saw that when we work with the inverse of a two by two matrix, there's a little shortcut that we can use that saves us a lot of time. And it involves taking the determinant of the given two by two matrix in order to kind of find the inverse. Okay, so that's part of the formula. So what we're gonna do today is just go very deep into this topic and we're gonna show you how to find the determinant of any n by n matrix. I'll show you the shortcut that you can use for a three by three matrix. And after this, in our next video, I'll show you the shortcut that you can use for the four by four matrix. Okay, it would be too much to put in one video. So we're gonna kind of break it up. All right, so we're gonna start out with the two by two matrix, which is the easiest scenario. So let's say we start out with this matrix A and it's equal to, so in the first row, you have this lowercase a and this lowercase b as your entries. In the second row, you have the lowercase c and the lowercase d as your entries. Basically, if I wanna ask for the determinant of this matrix A, I can put these vertical bars around A. Okay, that's one way you can ask for the determinant. Or you could also say DET of A like this. So depending on which book you're using, you'll see different notation. Just follow whatever your book is doing or whatever you're doing in your class, okay? But finding the determinant for a two by two matrix is very simple. You see I already have the formula written. It's A times D minus B times C. So essentially you can just think about multiplying down like this, and then you can multiply up like this, or you can multiply down like this. It doesn't really matter. Most books will go like this, okay? But realize the fact that C times B and B times C, those are the same, right? Because we're working with real numbers, so multiplication is commutative. So it doesn't really matter how you list that. If you wanna say it's A times D minus C times B, or if you wanna say it's A times D minus B times C, it's the same result in the end. So let's look at an example real quick. So we have A is equal to, we have two and negative one in the first row and five and six in the second row. So the determinant of A, okay, would be equal to, and another way you might see this, you could put vertical bars around the entries. So two, negative one, five, and six. And this is how you would ask for the determinant of something if you didn't have a name for the matrix. Okay, so that's one way you would see that. So the determinant of this is what? Again, I'm just going to multiply down. So what is two times six? That is 12. And I'm gonna subtract away. Again, you can multiply down or up, it doesn't really matter. I'm just gonna go ahead and multiply down. So negative one times five is negative five. And again, notice if you did five times negative one, it's also negative five, right? So it doesn't matter. 12 minus a negative five is 12 plus five. So 12 plus five, and that's 17. So the determinant of A is 17. All right, so let's look at one more of these, and then we'll move on to a three by three. So for A, it's equal to, we have three and eight in the first row and seven and negative four in the second row. So the determinant of A is equal to, Again, multiply down. Three times negative four is negative 12, then minus. I'm gonna just multiply up this time. So seven times eight is 56. So what is negative 12 minus 56? That's gonna be negative 68, okay? So that's my determinant of A. All right, so obviously that's a very easy process. When you get into a three by three or higher, if you use the kind of book method, it can be a little bit tedious, but it's really not that bad. It's definitely not as bad as finding the inverse. But luckily for us, again, we have a shortcut for a three by three, which is really easy to use. It takes under a minute to calculate the determinant of a three by three matrix. So it's a really good shortcut. And again, in the next lesson, I'll talk about the shortcut for a four by four. All right, so first and foremost, before we get into this kind of official method, we gotta talk about something known as a minor and a cofactor, okay? So these are terms that you're gonna use even outside of talking about finding the determinant. So it's important to understand what they are. So I'm gonna highlight this word right here. So if A is a square matrix, the minor, which is notated with this capital M sub IJ, remember this sub IJ, this is the ith row, jth column, that's just generic notation to say I'm at a given position in the matrix. So then of the entry, you have this lowercase a sub ij. Again, that just tells me I'm at some given entry in this matrix A. And we're saying is the determinant of the matrix obtained by deleting the ith row and jth column of A, okay? So remember, this generic notation sub ij here just tells you you're at a given position, some given row and column. 
So all this is telling you to do, if you want to find the minor of some given entry, delete the row it's in, delete the column it's in, and find the determinant of the matrix that is kind of left after you've done that. So to see this with a generic example, this is something you probably want to write down because it's very important. So if you have capital letter A to name this matrix and it's equal to, you've got all lowercase letters here as entries, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then G, H, I. If I wanted to find the minor of this kind of entry here, this lowercase a, what I would do is delete this column and I would delete this row, okay? So the matrix that's left is made up of these elements. You have E, you have F, you have H, and you have I, okay? So if I wanted to find the determinant of that, again, I could put these vertical bars around it, okay? And then I could just say it's equal to what? E times I, you multiply down, so E times I minus, you'd have F times H, so F times H. So this right here is the minor, okay, the minor of this A. So I can say M, capital M, sub 1, 1, okay? Some people put a comma between them to say it's row 1, column 1, is going to be equal to this right here, this E times I, and then minus F times H. And I know this generic kind of stuff will trip some students up, but I just want to give you a generic example first, and then we'll get into some ones with some numbers involved. So let me just do one more here, okay? Let me do the minor of this element here, so this lowercase b. So what's the minor? Again, I'm going to delete this column and this row. What's left? It's this d, this g, this f, and this i, okay? So I'm just going to put vertical bars around this to say I want the determinant. That's d times i, d times i, minus f times g, so f times g. So that's my determinant. So the minor, capital letter M, sub, again, I'm in row 1. But now I'm in column two. So you can put a comma there if you want, or you can leave it as one, two, because it's clear. This is equal to this. So it's D times I minus F times G. Okay, so very generic. And now what I want to do is just talk about a cofactor real quick. And then we can move on and we can talk about some examples with some numbers. And I'll show you how to use this to calculate a determinant. So what you're going to see in your book is that the cofactor now you have a capital C sub IJ of the entry. Again, this is just some generic entry in our matrix A, so lowercase a sub IJ, is this negative one raised to this power. So I plus J. Remember, I is the row, okay, generically, and J is the column, okay? So I'm just going to put COL to abbreviate column. So negative one to the power of I plus J, and then it's multiplied by the minor. Remember, this is the capital letter M sub IJ, okay? So what you need to understand here, if I go back to this example here, let me just kind of erase this real quick. And we already have our minor. So we have our minor for what? This is the minor for, again, this element here, which is in row one, column two. And let me slide this down. I want to make this crystal clear, okay? This is row one. This is row two. This is row three. This is column one, column two, column three. So I'm in row one, column two. Okay, so that's what that one comma two tells me. So if I find the sum of those two numbers, one plus two, that's three. So the cofactor, capital C, sub one, two, is equal to negative one raised to the power of this one plus two. The row number plus the column number. I'm in row one, column two. One plus two is three. So it's raised to the power of three. Okay, so we know that if we raise this to an odd power, it's going to be negative one. So it's going to change the sign of this guy right here. This D times I minus F times G. Okay, so if I get a result, okay, for the exponent that's odd, it's going to stay negative. If I get a result that's even, it's going to be positive. Okay, so for example, let me erase this real quick. If I go back to the earlier example where I found the kind of minor of A, this lowercase a, that M sub 1, 1, well, this was equal to what? It was equal to, we delete this and this, it was E times I, right, minus F times H, okay? It's just the determinant of what's left. So this guy right here. So E times I minus F times H. So it's this. Now the cofactor, okay, would be equal to what? It's negative 1 raised to the power of what? You're in row one, column one. So you can just look at these numbers down here. One plus one is two. So raised to the second power, I know this is even. So this is going to be positive one. So it's just going to be the same as the minor in this case, okay? 
So to make this really easy, you can make yourself a little matrix with the signs involved so that you don't get confused, okay? This is gonna come up pretty often. So when you talk about cofactors, you have to have the signs down. So again, if you just look at this, and I know this is confusing at first, but if you really think about it, it kind of starts to make some sense. So this is row one, column one right here. One plus one is two, right? So this is an even number. Then this is row one, column two. So one plus two is three. That's an odd number, so that's why this is negative. And this is one, three, right? Row one, column three. One plus three is four, so that's why this is positive. These signs are gonna alternate, right? If this is negative, this is positive, this is negative, this is positive, this is negative, this is positive, okay? So they alternate going across, they also alternate going up and down, right? Positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. So really, if you just remember the first one is positive, you can go through and make a little matrix of signs so that you can figure out what the cofactor is. All right, now let's look at an example real quick, and this is gonna lead to something. So I'm gonna ask you to find the cofactor, okay, for every number in the kind of first row up here, okay? So let's start by calculating the minor first of each one, and then we'll think about the cofactor, okay? Remember, that's just thinking about negative one raised to the power of the row plus the column, okay, times the minor, that's all it is. So what is, let's start with the minor, what is the minor of this element here? I'm gonna delete this, and I'm gonna delete this. The matrix that's left is a two and a four in the first row and a zero and a one in the second row. So again, the vertical bars tell me I want the determinant. So two times one is two minus four times zero is zero. So the minor here is going to be two minus zero, which is two, okay? So let me just write this down here real quick. We're gonna say that M sub one, one is equal to two. So the next thing is, what's the cofactor? So what is C sub one, one? That's equal to what? Again, it's negative one raised to the power of, in this case, this is row one, row two, row three. This is column one, okay? Column two and column three. You really don't need that because you can just sum these numbers down here, okay? But it's in row one, column one. One plus one is two. So again, this is raised to an even power. So we know it's gonna be positive one. So the sign of the minor is not gonna change when it becomes the cofactor in this case. So this is gonna be equal to two as well, okay? And we don't need the minor, we're just gonna keep the cofactor. So let's move this up, okay? And let's talk about the cofactor of this one. So again, I'm gonna find the minor first. So delete the column, delete the row. What's left? I'm left with seven, six, four, and one. So seven times one is seven minus, four times six is 24. If I do seven minus 24, I get negative 17, okay? So that's gonna be my minor. My minor is negative 17. So M, in this case, I'm looking for the minor of this guy right here. It's going to be in row one and column two, okay? So row one, column two. So this guy is going to be a negative 17. But if I want the cofactor of this, so C sub one, two, this is equal to what? It's negative one raised to the power of, again, use these numbers down here. It's row one, column two, row one, column two. So one plus two is three. This is an odd number, so this is gonna stay negative one. Times the minor, okay, which is negative 17. So this becomes positive 17, okay? So this is positive 17. All right, so let's erase this and let's drag this up. All right, so the last thing we wanna do is find the cofactor for this entry right here. So again, I'm gonna delete this column and this row, what's left. I have seven, I have six, I have two, and I have zero. So what's the determinant of this guy? Well, I'm gonna have seven times zero, which is zero, and then minus, I'm gonna have two times six, which is 12. So it's gonna be zero minus 12, which is negative 12. So let's erase this. So my minor, again, we're in row one, and now we're in column three. This is going to be a negative 12. So the cofactor C sub one, three is what? We know that we're in row one, column three. Okay, so one plus three is four. Negative one to an even power would be positive one. So the sign of this is not going to change, okay? So let's drag this up. And again, you can always reference the sign chart that we have here. So this one's positive, negative, positive, okay? And if we look back, we see that's exactly what happened. This one was positive, this one was negative, and this one was positive, right? So this sign didn't change, this one did, and this one didn't. Okay, so now that we have these cofactors, 
Let's talk about the method to find the determinant of any n by n matrix. This would work no matter what you're working with. Okay, so if it's a three by three, a four by four, a 200 by 200, whatever you're working with, you can use this method. So what you wanna do is you wanna multiply each element in any row or column. So it doesn't matter which row you use, doesn't matter which column you use, but you're gonna just use one of them, okay? So you're gonna multiply each element in any row or column of the matrix by its kind of cofactor, then the sum of these products would give us the value of the determinant. So in this particular case, I already have my cofactors for this whole row, okay? So what I'd wanna do is I'd wanna multiply five by its cofactor, so five times two, then plus negative one times its cofactor, which is 17. Let me change this notation up a little bit. I wanna be consistent. So if I use a parenthesis there, I want to use a parenthesis here, just so you don't get confused. Then plus, I'm going to have 3 times its cofactor, which is negative 12, okay? So if we go through and do this operation, we're going to end up with our determinant. 5 times 2 is 10, and then plus, you'd have negative 1 times 17, which is negative 17. And then plus, 3 times negative 12 is negative 36, okay? So what is this going to give me? 10 plus negative 17 is obviously negative 7. And then negative seven plus negative 36 is gonna give me negative 43. So this is my determinant of A, okay? So if I erase this, I can say that my determinant of A is going to be negative 43. Okay, let me slide it down just a little bit, just right here. Now, before we go any further, let me just show you the shortcut, okay? And we'll do some mixed practice. We'll, we'll kind of practice it each way. And I'll give you a generic formula that you can memorize in case your teacher tells you that you have to do it the long way, okay? So for the shortcut, let me kind of move this out of the way for now. For the shortcut, all you need to do is copy the first two columns, okay? So column one and column two, just copy them to the right of this. So five, seven, and six and then negative one, two, and zero, okay? So now what I wanna do is I wanna multiply the numbers starting at this top left, okay? I wanna multiply down this diagonal. So I'm gonna do five times two, which is 10, times one, which is still 10, okay? So that's 10. Then I'm gonna keep going, so I'm gonna to add to this. I'm gonna multiply these numbers going down this diagonal. So negative one times four is negative four, times six is negative 24. Then I'm gonna to add to this, I've got one more to do. 3 times 7 times 0, we know that's 0. So you can just erase this, okay? Now you have to be very careful with what you're going to do next. Put brackets around this so you don't make a silly sign mistake. You're going to now subtract away the whole thing. So put brackets. You're going to go up now. So starting at the bottom left, you're going to go up. So 6 times 2 is 12, times 3 is 36. And then plus, you're going to go up again. We know there's a 0 involved in that multiplication, so that would be 0, right? 0 times 4 is 0, 0 times 5 is 0. And then here, you're gonna go up one last time. So one times seven is going to be seven times negative one is going to be negative seven, okay? All right, so 10 plus negative 24 is negative 14. And then 36 plus negative seven is going to be 29, okay? So what you're gonna have here is negative 14 minus 29, which is also negative 43, okay? So either way, you find that the determinant is negative 43. So you can see how much faster that method is. It does take a few tries to kind of memorize it. Okay, and we'll practice this much more throughout this lesson. Let's go ahead and look at another example. So looking at this example, I wanna do another example where we talk about the cofactors again, and then we'll practice the shortcut. So let's go ahead and do this row again. So I'm gonna take this row right here. So I'm gonna start with this guy and I'm gonna find its cofactor. So I'm gonna eliminate this and this. And so I'm gonna have the determinant of zero, eight, three, and seven. What's that gonna be? Zero times seven is zero, minus eight times three is 24. So this is negative 24. So if I look at that one, remember this guy is in row one, column one. So my sign there, one plus one is two, that's an even number sign won't change, right? Because negative one raised to the second power is going to be positive one. So I would say C sub one one is equal to a negative 24, okay? And then I'm going to find this one. So I'm gonna delete this and this. So I want C sub, I want 
Again, row one, column two, it's equal to. The determinant of this guy, you would have six, eight, negative two, and seven. So six times seven is 42. And then minus, you have eight times negative two, which is going to be negative 16. This is plus a positive, right? Because you have minus a negative. So this is gonna end up being 42 plus 16, which is 58, okay? So this is 58. So I'm gonna put 58 here. But remember, I've gotta multiply this minor that I just calculated by negative one raised to the power of one plus two. One plus two is three, three is an odd number. So this is going to be negative, right? Negative one raised to the third power is negative one. So this would be negative 58 then. Then lastly, let's look at this guy right here. So I'm gonna delete this column and this row. So C sub one, three is gonna be equal to, we would take this determinant. So we have six, zero, negative two, and three. So six times three is 18. And then minus, you'd have zero times negative two, which is obviously zero. So this is going to be 18. And again, the sign isn't gonna change here because if I look at my numbers down here, I'm in row one, column three, one plus three is four. Four is an even number, right? Negative one to the power of four is positive one. So this will stay as 18. So now that we have our cofactors, we can multiply them by their given entries, okay? And then we can sum those amounts. So negative 24 times negative one. And then plus, we're gonna have negative 58 times two, and then plus, we're gonna have 18 times four. Okay, so what's that gonna give us? So this is positive 24. Let's just erase that and put that. Negative 58 times two is negative 116. So negative 116, 18 times four is going to be 72, okay? So 24 plus 72 is 96. So you'd have 96, okay, minus 116, and that would be negative 20, okay? So we can say our determinant is gonna be negative 20, right? So the determinant of A is negative 20. Okay, let's look at our shortcut again. Again, it's a very good shortcut. So copy these columns, so negative one, six, and negative two, your first one, and then copy your second one, so two, zero, and three. And again, I'm just gonna multiply, start at the top left, it's easy to remember, and go down. So negative one times zero times seven, we know that's zero, so I don't have to do anything there. Then two times eight times negative two, we know that two times eight is 16, 16 times negative two is negative 32, and then plus, multiply down this last diagonal, four times six is gonna be 24, and 24 times three is 72, okay? So let's sum this real quick so we don't make some silly sign mistake. If I do 72 plus negative 32, that's gonna give me 40. So I have 40 over here. And remember, I'm subtracting away this guy when I go up. So again, you're subtracting the whole thing away. So if you're not doing it all in one go, make sure you use brackets, okay? I'm just gonna put a bracket there so I don't make a silly sign mistake. All right, so let's go up now. So I'm gonna start here at the bottom left and I'm gonna go up. I've got a zero involved, so I know I can just skip that because zero times anything is zero. Then here, going up, three times eight is 24, times negative one is negative 24. And then going up one last time, seven times six is 42. 42 times two is 84, so plus 84. So what is negative 24 plus 84? That's gonna give me positive 60, okay? So what I have now is 40 minus 60, which is obviously negative 20. So either way you do this, you get a determinant that is negative 20, okay? So again, a very, very good shortcut overall, something you definitely want to use. Okay, so I wanna do one more example, but before I do it, I wanna to return to my generic example. So in case you're in a class that doesn't want you to use the shortcut, I've seen teachers do this, I wanna give you a generic formula that is very easy to remember. Okay, and this is based on what we've done so far, and I'll explain it as I go. So you wanna take, if you want the determinant of A, you wanna take this guy right here, your A, and multiply it by the determinant of this guy right here, okay? So we know the determinant of this guy right here would end up being what? It's E times I minus F times H, but this is probably a little easier to remember, so I'm just gonna leave it like this. Then you're gonna put a minus here, okay? And I'll explain why in a second. You're gonna put a B there, and then times the determinant of, again, what would be left if I marked this out? It would be D, it would be F, G, and I, okay? So that's that. And then lastly, you would put a plus here, okay? Times your C, and let me write this down here, because I won't be able to fit that all the way. Then times your determinant of, again, what would be left? Your D, 
your E, your G, and your H, okay? So this is a very easy way to remember this. A lot of books will actually give you this as the shortcut, and they will give you different notation based on what they're using as entries. But essentially, you just take this guy and multiply it by the determinant of this guy, okay? Then minus this guy times the determinant of, again, if I mark this out, this that's left. And then plus, you have this guy, this C, times the determinant of this guy, okay? So very easy to remember. The reason this is a minus sign here is, remember, you're in row one, column two. One plus two is three. So that's where your cofactor would end up taking the minor and making it negative. Okay, but in this case here, it's one and one. One plus one is two, that's even. In this case, it's one and three. One plus three is four, so it's even. Remember, your signs alternate. This one's plus, this one's minus, this is plus. If you're talking about getting the sign for the cofactor, right? Taking the minor and applying that kind of sign change if it's needed. All right, so let's go back. And I wanna just do one more example. Again, it's just, it never hurts to do a lot of examples of these things just to make sure that you have everything covered. All right, so let's do it both ways, okay? So I'm not gonna use the cofactor method. I'm gonna use the thing that I just told you, that method. So I'm gonna start by taking this and multiplying it by the determinant of this, okay? So I'm gonna say that the determinant of A is equal to negative two times the determinant of this. So let me just write that out. So one, three, zero, and six. Then minus, okay, minus, you have this, so five, times the determinant of, put the zero and the four, the three and the six, okay? And again, that just comes from marking this out and this out, that's what's left. And then lastly, you have plus this guy times the determinant of this. So let me fit this down here, negative one times the determinant, you have zero, one, four, and zero, okay? All right, so let's calculate the determinant here. One times six is six, and then minus three times zero, three times zero is zero, so this would just be six. So negative two times six is negative 12, so that's your first one. Then here, zero times six is zero, okay? You'd have zero, minus three times four is 12, so this is negative 12. So you'd have negative five times negative 12, which is going to be positive 60, so plus 60. So plus 60, okay? And erase this, and then what do you have here? You have negative one times, zero times zero is zero, then minus one times four is four. So basically what you have is negative one times negative four, which is plus four, okay? So when you use that kind of technique that I just showed you, even if you don't use the shortcut, it's not that bad, okay? If you just kind of memorize that, it doesn't take that long to do. It's just a few kind of practice problems away for you, and you'll have that one down as well. So negative 12 plus 60 is going to be 48, right? Positive 48, and then plus four would be 52. All right, so I wanna show you one more time the shortcut, just so you have that down as well. Again, it never hurts to practice. So copy the first two columns. So negative two, zero, and four, and then five, one, and zero. Again, multiply down, and let me make this a little bit better because it's not gonna line up. So again, zero and four, and then one and zero. So multiply down, so start here and go down. What is negative two times one, that's negative two times six, is going to be negative 12, okay? And then plus, you're gonna multiply down. Five times three is 15, times four is 60 then plus. We already know that's going to be a zero, so you don't even need to write that. Negative 12 plus 60 is going to be 48, okay? Then minus. Again, I'm going to put a bracket here so I don't make a sign mistake. It's so easy to make a sign mistake, so I always recommend putting a bracket. Start at the bottom left and go up. So four times one is four, times negative one is negative four, and then go up. You have a zero there, so don't even worry about it, and then go up. You have a zero there, so don't worry about it. So what is 48 minus the negative four? That's 48 plus four, which is 52. So again, either way you do this, you find that the determinant is 52. So again, this is a very good shortcut and we're gonna use it throughout our course. In the upcoming lessons, we're gonna talk about Kramer's rule, okay? And we're gonna be using this shortcut to find our determinant very quickly. And we'll see that we can finally solve a system of linear equations using these kind of matrix methods that really save us a lot of time. In this lesson, we wanna talk about finding the determinant of a four by four matrix. So in the last lesson, we talked about the Laplace expansion method, which is also known as the cofactor expansion method for finding the determinant. 
Now using this method, we know the determinant for any n by n matrix, any square matrix, can be found as the sum of the entries in any row, or you can do a column, multiplied by their respective co factors, okay? So we saw that for kind of working with a three by three, this process really wasn't that bad. It's a little bit tedious, but it's not that bad. And then we also found a shortcut for the three by three that made the process very, very simple and quite a bit less tedious. Well, when we start working with a four by four or higher, we might need to kind of look at an alternative strategy because we don't have such a shortcut for that. So I wanna introduce a strategy that you can use. In some cases, it's gonna be a little bit better than the kind of Laplace expansion method. In other cases, it won't be, okay? But at least you have another tool in your toolkit to kind of find determinants for something that's a four by four, five by five, a six by six, if you had to do it by hand. So the first thing we need to do today is introduce kind of a new term for us in our matrix algebra section. And this is known as a triangular matrix. So first and foremost, you have a lower triangular matrix, which occurs when a square matrix has all entries above the main diagonal as zeros. Remember, when we talk about these kind of diagonal entries, the row number and the column number are going to be the same. So row one, column one, that's that entry there. Row two, column two, that's that entry there. Row three, column three, that's that entry there, okay? So going down those kind of diagonal entries, you could say this main diagonal, if I look above that, the entry should be all zeros, okay, which is what we have here for the lower triangular matrix, or you could say this matrix is in lower triangular form. Now, similarly, when we look at the upper triangular matrix, this is going to occur when all the entries below the main diagonal are zeros. So again, here's your main diagonal and all your entries below are zeros, okay? So the reason we're kind of showing you this is because there's a very special property when you work with a triangular matrix, okay? So this could be the lower triangular form or the upper triangular form. Basically, your determinant can be found by finding the product of those diagonal entries, okay? So I can just go down the main diagonal and say that my determinant for this matrix U is equal to A times B times C, okay? That's all it's going to be. Similarly, if I come up here to matrix L, okay, I can say that the determinant, let me make that a little better, okay, the determinant for L is going to be again, A times B times C. So I think you see where we're going with this. We're gonna give you a four by four kind of matrix, and then essentially you're gonna use some row operations to put it into kind of this upper triangular matrix format, okay, where you have zeros below this kind of main diagonal, and then you can find the determinant by just finding the product of those entries along the main diagonal. Now, before we can kind of jump into this process, we have to talk about some of these properties of determinants. There's a few of these. I'm just gonna focus on three of them. The ones that involve what happens when you perform row operations on a matrix. So let's talk about the first one. The first one is where we swap two rows, or you could say interchange two rows, or you could also say this happens when you interchange two columns, okay? So first and foremost, what's the determinant of this two by two matrix? We know that we start by multiplying down, one times four is four. Then we subtract away, you can multiply up or you can multiply down, it doesn't matter. Two times three is six. So this gives me negative two, okay? So what happens if we swap two rows here? Well, what's gonna happen is the sign of the determinant will change. The absolute value will be the same, but the sign will change. So instead of negative two, you'll have positive two. So if I put three and four in the first row and one and two in the second row, again, the sign will change, it will be positive two. If I multiply down, three times two is six, and then minus, if I multiply up, one times four is four. So this is positive two. So it's just a sign change, okay? So that's all it is. The second one that you need to understand if we multiply a row, okay, a row by some non-zero real number, then essentially you can just multiply the determinant by that same non-zero real number. So let me give you an example of that. Let's say that I multiplied a row one here by positive two. So instead of one, I have two. Instead of two, I have four, okay? And I'm just doing this to row one. Row two will be unchanged. So that's gonna be a three and a four. So the effect it's gonna have is, it's gonna change this 
by a factor of two. So I can just take negative two, the old determinant, multiply by two to get the new determinant. So this guy will be equal to negative four. And again, you can prove this. If I multiply down, two times four is eight, and then minus, if I multiply up, three times four is 12. Eight minus 12 is negative four. Now this isn't gonna come up today, okay? But you do need to know this for future kind of lessons, especially if you get into a linear algebra course. Now, let me show you the one that we're gonna use the most today, and this is very important. We know that when we kind of perform row operations to kind of change an entry, let's say we want this to be a zero, for example, we can multiply one of the rows by some non-zero real number and add the result to a given row, okay? And we can replace the row with that. And the way your book will normally say this is it'll say, if you replace a row with the sum of that row and a non-zero constant multiple of some other row, when this occurs, you're gonna have no change to the determinant. Okay, so that's very important to understand. So let's say, for example, I went through and I multiplied the top row by two. So two times row one, okay, what would that be? So we would have two and then we would have four. And then I added the result to row two and that's what I replaced row two with. So let me kind of move this over because I'm gonna run out of room. I'm just gonna put this up here for now. And I forgot my plus sign. And so I know that multiplying two times row one would give me a two and it would give me a four. I'm gonna add these two results to this bottom row and the top row will be unchanged. So let me just kind of scooch this over for a second. So I'm gonna put one and two, those are unchanged, I'm not doing anything. Two plus three is going to be five and four plus four is going to be eight, okay? So everyone should understand what I did there. This is something we did when we did our Gaussian elimination, our Gauss-Jordan elimination. Again, I'm just multiplying a given row, which was row one by a non-zero row number, which was two. And then I added that result to the entries that were in this row two. That's what I replaced row two with, okay? So two times one was two, two plus three was five. That's how I got that. Two times two is four, four plus four is eight. That's how I got that. So what we're saying is if you perform this operation, there will be no change to the determinant, right? So the determinant should still be negative two, and it is. If we multiply down, one times eight is eight, and then minus, if we multiply up, five times two is 10, eight minus 10 is negative two, okay? So with that being said, let's take a look at an example. So we have this four by four matrix. Again, the vertical bars tell us to take the determinant. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna copy these kind of numbers. We'll go to a fresh sheet. So we have three, one, four, and 10. We have two, negative one, six, and three. We have zero, negative five, three, and negative two. We have one, zero, one, and five. Okay, so let me copy everything here and let's go to this fresh sheet and we'll have plenty of room. I'm gonna put my vertical bars here again to tell me that I wanna find the determinant. Again, I'm thinking about kind of this main diagonal here, all the entries below, I want those to be zeros, okay? If I achieve that through these kind of row operations, then what happens is the determinant will be found as the product of those kind of entries going down that main diagonal. But remember, if we end up swapping two rows, which we're gonna do here, you gotta take and make it the negative of what you find as the determinant there. And again, we'll see that as we go on. So let's start out by just kind of working on this first column. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this one, okay, to get a zero here and here, and then I'm gonna swap rows, okay? So let's go through that. I'm gonna multiply my row four by negative two, and I'm gonna add the result to row two, okay? That's what I'm gonna change row two with. So let me just go through and do the multiplication first. So negative two times one is negative two. Negative two times zero is zero. Negative two times one is negative two, and negative two times five is negative 10, okay? So now if I add these to the entries in row two, negative two plus two is obviously zero. Zero plus negative one is still negative one. Negative two plus six is going to be positive four. And then negative 10 plus three is negative seven. All right, so let's erase this and this. So I'm gonna use my one again to get this into a zero. So I'm gonna multiply row four, okay, row four, by negative three. I'm gonna add the result to row one. That's what I'm gonna change row one with. So negative three times one is negative three. Negative three times zero is zero. Negative three times one again is negative three. And then negative three times five is negative 15. Okay, so adding negative three plus three is going to be zero. And we know that zero plus one is still one. Negative three plus four is one. And then if we do negative 15 plus 10, that's negative five, okay? 
So good to go there. Let me erase this. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap row four and row one. So row one will swap with row four. OK. And again, if we do that, we've got to change the sign of the determinant. So I'm going to put a negative one out in front to remind me to multiply the determinant of this new kind of matrix that I'm forming by this kind of negative one to find the determinant of that original matrix, which is up here. OK. So if we go back, let me kind of copy this 0, 1, 1, and negative 5. So I can erase that. And let me grab this. So 1, 0, 1, and 5. And then I'm going to write this in here. So 0, 1, 1, and my negative 5. OK? So we're good to go. And again, I put that negative 1 out in front. If you want to keep track of it a different way, you can. You can put a negative on top. As long as you remember that, you know, when the end process, we multiply down that diagonal, you've got to take that and then multiply it by negative 1 to find the determinant of, again, that original matrix you started with. All right, so let's look at our main diagonal now. So that's this guy right here. And I want to make that negative 5 into a 0 and that 1 into a 0. So let's start with that negative 5 because it's a little bit harder to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply row 4. I'm going to multiply row 4, which has a 1 in it, okay, by positive 5. I'm going to add the result to my row 3. That's what I'm going to change row 3 with. So 5 times 0 is 0. 5 times 1 is 5. 5 times 1 is 5 again. 5 times negative 5 is negative 25. So let's do our addition now. 0 plus 0 is 0. 5 plus negative 5 is 0. We know that 5 plus 3 is 8. We know that negative 25 plus negative 2 is negative 27. Okay, and let's erase this. And now I want to make this guy into a 0. I can easily do that by just adding this row 2 to row 4. Okay, that's just like me saying that I have 1 times row 2 plus row 4. And that's what I'm going to replace row 4 with. Because again, if I had negative 1 and I added it to 1, that would give me 0. So 0 plus 0 is obviously 0. Negative 1 plus 1 is 0. We have 4 plus 1, which is 5. Okay, And then we have negative 7 plus negative 5, which is negative 12. So we're good to go there. And now all I need to do, again, if I look down these kind of diagonal entries, the last thing I need is to change the 5 into a 0. But you might be tempted to use this kind of 1 here, right? Because it's easy to say, OK, if I multiply row 1 by negative 5, add the result to row 4, this guy would be a 0. But you have a problem there because this is a 1, OK? So that's not going to work because you're going to end up changing this. It won't be a 0 anymore. So what you're going to have to do is use row 3 here. So I'm going to figure out what I need to multiply row 3 by that when I add row 3 to row 4, OK, this guy ends up being a 0. So in other words, 8, this entry right here, times what? Let's just say it's x, is equal to negative 5, which is the opposite of that number there. OK, so if I divide both sides by 8, I find that x is negative 5 eighths. So I would say negative 5 eighths times my row 3, this row right here, plus my row 4. That's what I'm going to replace row 4 with. So I know negative 5 eighths times 0 and times 0 again would be 0 and 0. Negative 5 eighths times 8 would give me negative 5, right? We already know that. And then negative 5 eighths times negative 27, we know that would be positive. What is 5 times 27? Well, that's 135, OK? So this would be 135 over 8. OK, so now let's go through and add. So obviously 0 plus 0 in each case is going to be 0. You can get rid of that. Negative 5 plus 5 is 0. You can get rid of that. So really, the only thing we have to kind of work on is this. So we're going to add negative 12. And so to get a common denominator, I would say this is negative 96 over 8. So if I do 135 minus 96, I'm going to get 39. So this would be 39 eighths. OK, so that's going to be that entry there. So 39 eighths. OK, so nice and easy. Not too bad. So now finding the determinant is pretty easy because we just go down this kind of main diagonal because everything below is a zero. OK, we can just multiply those entries. OK, again, this is when you're in upper triangular form, which is what we have here now. Don't forget, we swapped rows, so that's why we have this negative 1 out here. So I'm going to lead with that and say that my determinant would be negative 1 times 1 times, you've got negative 1, times, you've got 8, 
times you've got 39 eighths, okay? So what's gonna happen is you have a negative one here and a negative one here. Those will basically cancel, that's positive. So you can cancel this eight with this eight and you have 39 as your answer. So the determinant is positive 39. So if we go back, we could say this is equal to positive 39. In this lesson, we wanna talk about finding the area of a triangle using determinants. All right, so an application of kind of matrices and determinants is being able to find the area of a triangle whose vertices are given as points in our coordinate plane. So you have these three vertices that you're gonna be given. And the first thing you wanna do is you wanna label one as x sub one, y sub one, one is x sub two, y sub two, and then kind of the last one is x sub three, y sub three. And the first thing you're gonna ask me is, does it matter which point gets labeled as which? And it doesn't, okay? And I'll explain why in a moment. So then you're gonna plug into this kind of formula here for the area of a triangle. So you see it's equal to, you have plus or minus this one half times the determinant of this guy. Remember, if you see these vertical bars, it means to take the determinant, okay? So first and foremost, before I explain anything, just notice where you're plugging things in at. You've labeled stuff as x sub one, y sub one through x sub three, y sub three. You're plugging in x sub one, y sub one in this first row. So you have that there and there. Okay, and then you always have a one in the third column. Then you're gonna plug in x sub two, y sub two, always have a one. x sub three, y sub three, always have a one, okay? So that takes care of that, and then you're gonna take the determinant. Now this is where I need to start explaining things. So you have that plus or minus there that might be super confusing for you. And basically what this is telling us is that we wanna make sure that we get a positive area, okay? So if the determinant evaluates to be negative, you multiply by negative one half to get a positive area. If the determinant evaluates to be positive, well, then I can just multiply by positive one half, and again, I get a positive area. Now, the other scenario is you end up with an area that's zero. And we're gonna talk about this specifically in the next lesson. If your area evaluates to zero, the three points that you had are actually on the same line, okay? So that's gonna be our test for collinearity, and we're gonna talk about that specifically in the next lesson. For today, we're just gonna look at two problems, and neither is going to have an area of zero. So let's talk about the final question, and that's why am I able to label you know, any of these as x sub one, y sub one, or x sub two, y sub two, or x sub three, y sub three? Why well, don't have to go in a certain order? Well, it deals with the properties of determinants that we've already talked about. If I had something like two, three, four, five, like this, the determinant is what? Two times five is 10, minus three times four is 12. This is negative two, okay? What happens if we swap rows? So let's say I put the four and the five into row one and the two and the three in row two. Well, what happens is the sign of the determinant changes, right? The absolute value is the same. The absolute value will be two in each case, but now instead of getting a negative two, I'm gonna have a positive two. So four times three is 12, and then minus five times two is 10. So this is going to be positive two versus the negative two there, okay? So when we swap rows, okay, we just change the sign. Now, think about this here. If I had a certain configuration here, I've kind of labeled everything. If one yields a positive and then I switch what got labeled as kind of x sub one, y sub one with what got labeled as x sub two, y sub two, I'm basically just swapping rows. So it's just gonna change the sign of the determinant. The absolute value will still be the same. And I have this plus or minus here to take care of any situation where I get a negative. So I'm good to go. All right, so with that being said, let's jump into the first example. And so we have this triangle with the following vertices. We have this one comma three, which is gonna be this guy right here. Okay, one unit to the right, three units up. 5 comma 2, that's this guy right here. 5 units to the right, 2 units up. And then 7 comma 9, so 7 units to the right, 9 units up, so right there. So those are our three vertices. Let's just copy them real quick. So 1 comma 3, and then we have 5 comma 2, and then we have 7 comma 9. Okay, so let's copy this, and let's go back up. And I'm just going to paste this in here real quick. And we'll just kind of fill this out. We'll go to a fresh sheet, because I don't think I can fit everything. So the area is equal to plus or minus one half times the determinant of this guy. So I'm just gonna label these in order. I'll just say this is x sub one, y sub one. I'll say this is x sub two, y sub two. And I'll say this is x sub three, y sub three. And again, it does not matter what gets labeled as which. And just to prove that to you, I'll swap it after I do this, okay? So I'm gonna plug in a one, a three, and then I'll always have a one. Then I'm gonna plug in a five, a two, and again, I'll always have a one, and then a seven, a nine, and I'll always have a one, 
okay? So again, I'm just plugging in for x sub one, y sub one, that's how I got a one and a three. Plugging in for x sub two, y sub two, that's how I got a five and a two. Plugging in for x sub three, y sub three, that's how I got a seven and a nine. So let's copy this real quick. So how do I find the determinant quickly? Let's just copy this one, three, one, five, two, one, seven, nine, one. Again, the shortcut is to copy the first two columns. So you have one, five, seven, three, two, nine. And then you're gonna start at this top left and multiply down this diagonal. One times two times one is two. And then plus, you're gonna multiply down this diagonal. Three times one times seven is 21. And then plus, you're gonna multiply down this diagonal. One times five is five times nine is 45. If I sum that amount, two plus 21 is 23, 23 plus 45 is 68, okay? So the first part of this formula is 68. And then for the second part, we're gonna multiply up now. So starting at the bottom left, I'm gonna go up. Seven times two is 14, times one is still 14. And then I'm gonna multiply up. Nine times one times one is nine. And then plus, I'm gonna multiply up. One times five times three is 15. So 14 plus nine is 23, plus 15 is 38. So you have 68 minus 38, which is 30, okay? So the first part of this, is that the determinant became 30. So the area, okay, the area is equal to, in this case, because we got a positive determinant, I'm just gonna use the plus one half. So I'm just gonna say one half times 30, which is 15. Now, when you work with triangles, remember your formula from basic geometry, one half times the base times the height. Remember you have units involved with the base and the height. So you've got to think about the fact that it's going to be square units. So if you were working with inches, it would be, you know, square inches or inches squared or whatever that is. So you would really want to give a precise answer and say it's 15 square units. So I'll just say the area, and let me erase this, is going to be 15 square, okay, square units. Now, really quickly, just to prove this to you, let's say I swap these two rows. So let's say I put five, two, and one on the top. I'm just gonna erase that and I'll drag this up here. So really this would correspond to what? It would correspond to me choosing this point to be X sub one, Y sub one, okay? And this point to be X sub two, Y sub two, okay? And because I swapped two rows, the only effect this is going to have is going to change the sign of the determinant, right? So now the determinant is going to be negative 30. And so to get the area, I'm going to multiply by negative one half. And so I'm still going to get 15. It's going to be 15 square units. But again, let me prove this to you real fast because I know a lot of people say, nope, you have to go in a certain order. You do not. All right, so let me erase this. And let me paste this in really quickly. So five, one, seven, two, three, nine, one, one, one. And again, I'm copying the first two columns. So five, one, seven, two, three, nine. All right. So you already know the deal. We're going to start at the top left and we're going to multiply down five times three times one is 15. Then plus two times one times seven is 14. Then plus one times one times nine is nine. So you'll notice that this is 38 now. Okay, and you're going to be subtracting away 68, which is going to give you negative 30. But let's go through it. 15 plus 14 is 29, and then 29 plus 9 again is 38. Okay, so this is 38, and then minus, again, if we go up, 7 times 3 times 1 is 21, 9 times 1 times 5 is 45, and then 1 times 1 times 2 is going to be 2. Okay, 21 plus 45 is 66, plus 2 is 68. Again, 38 minus 68 is negative 30. So again, I've just proved this to you that swapping these two rows is basically like we've chosen different points to be X sub one, Y sub one, and X sub two, Y sub two. All I did was change the sign. And I can now just multiply this by negative one half to get a positive 15. And so again, my answer for the area is 15 square units. Okay, let's just look at one more of these. It's a very, very easy concept. So the vertices we're given now is six comma two, negative four comma negative five, and two comma seven. So here's your six comma two. Here's your two comma seven. Here's your negative four comma negative five. So let's copy those. You have six comma two, you have negative four comma negative five, and you have two comma seven. Okay, so let's copy this and let's just go to a fresh sheet. We should know the formula now, it's pretty easy. So the area is equal to one half. And again, you've got that plus or minus out in front times the determinant of, 
let's go ahead and label this. So this I'm going to call x sub 1, y sub 1. This I'm going to call x sub 2, y sub 2. And this I'm going to call x sub 3, y sub 3. So we know that the first row is coming from this, right? The x sub 1, y sub 1. So 6 and then 2. The last column, the third column is always a 1. So I can go ahead and just fill that in. Then this is x sub 2, y sub 2. So negative 4 and then negative 5. Then this is x sub 3, y sub 3, so 2 and 7. So very easy formula to remember. We don't need these points anymore. You just get rid of them. They're just going to take up space. And let me get rid of that and slide this up out of our way. And let me just copy our kind of matrix. So we have 6, 2, and 1, negative 4, negative 5, and 1, 2, 7, and 1. So copy the first two columns, 6, negative 4, and 2, and then 2, negative 5, and 7. So let's multiply again, starting from here and going down. 6 times negative 5 is negative 30, times 1 is still negative 30. Then we're going to multiply down this way. 2 times 1 times 2 is 4, then this way. 1 times negative 4 times 7 is negative 28. So we know that negative 30 plus negative 28 would be negative 58, and negative 58 plus 4 would be negative 54. Okay? So the first part of this is negative 54, then minus. Now we're going to go up. So we're going to start here and we're going to go 2 times negative 5 times 1. 2 times negative 5 is negative 10. And then times 1 is obviously still negative 10. 7 times 1 times 6 is going to be 42. And then we have 1 times negative 4 times 2, which would be negative 8. Okay. So negative 10 plus negative 8 is negative 18. So what is negative 18 plus 42? That's going to give me positive 24. Okay. So what you have here is negative 54 minus 24, which is negative 78. Okay, so negative 78. So let me erase this. The value of the determinant of this guy is negative 78. So our area will be equal to, because it's negative, you're going to use the negative 1 half. So negative 1 half times your negative 78. Okay, so what is that going to give us? Well, forget about the sign because we know it's going to be positive. 78 divided by 2 is 39. So this equals 39, and again, when you write your answer, you want to put square units. So let's just erase this, and we'll say that the area is 39 square units. In this lesson, we want to talk about testing for collinear points using determinants. So in our last lesson, we talked about how we could use determinants to calculate the area of a triangle given three vertices of the triangle. And really quickly, I just want to review the formula because we're going to use it here today. So the area is equal to, you have plus or minus this one half times the determinant of this guy. So you would label one of those kind of given points as x sub 1, y sub 1, another is x sub 2, y sub 2, and then the last one is x sub 3, y sub 3. We went through and proved that it didn't matter what got labeled as which, okay? Because we have this plus or minus here, so if the determinant becomes negative, okay, just multiply by negative 1 half. If it's positive, multiply by positive 1 half, and you're good to go. Now, what we didn't talk about in the last lesson specifically was what we do when this formula gives us a result of zero, meaning there's absolutely no area. Well, it turns out that if you have these kind of three points that you're given, they're supposed to be vertices of a triangle, and you plug it into this formula and you get zero, those three points absolutely lie on the same line, right? So those three points are collinear. Again, they lie on the same line. So we can kind of simplify this formula and say that, okay, if this part right here evaluates to zero, then we know those three points that you gave us are collinear. So let's go ahead and use this real quick and look at an example. So we're given these three points here. We just want to test for collinearity. We have four comma one, negative one comma negative two, and negative six comma negative five. So do they lie on the same line? So let's just say this is x sub one, y sub one. Let's say this is x sub two, y sub two. And let's say this is x sub 3, y sub 3. It does not matter which gets labeled as which. So let me go back up. I'll give you a chance to just copy this formula real quick. It's very easy to remember. The third column of this matrix is all 1s, and everything else goes in order. So you have x sub 1, y sub 1, then you have x sub 2, y sub 2, and x sub 3, y sub 3. So the notation here, the sub 1, matches that you're in row 1. The sub 2 matches that you're in row 2. The sub 3 matches that you're in row 3, right? So it's very easy to remember. So I'm just going to plug into that. So I would have my x sub 1, y sub 1. So I would have a 4 and then a 1. This third column is always a 1. Okay, so that's easy to remember. Then you'd have your x sub 2, y sub 2. So negative, negative 1. And then negative 2. And then this is always a 1. And then your x sub 3, y sub 3. So negative 6. 
and then negative five, and this is a one. So we need to find the value of this. If this is zero, those three points are on the same line, or we could say they are collinear. What's the quick way to find the determinant? Again, what we wanna do is copy the first two columns. So four, negative one, and negative six. We have one, negative two, and negative five. And we wanna multiply down, okay? So four times negative two times one would be negative eight. And then plus, we wanna multiply down. One times one times negative six is negative six. And then we wanna multiply down. One times negative one times negative five is going to give me positive five. So negative eight plus negative six is negative 14. Then plus five would be negative nine. Okay, so this is negative nine. That's the first part. Remember, you're gonna subtract away. You're gonna go up now. So negative six times negative two is 12 times one is still 12. Negative five times one times four would be negative 20. And then you would have one times negative one times one, which is going to be negative one. Okay. So if I do 12 plus negative 20, that's negative eight. Okay. And then negative eight plus negative one is negative nine. So you see that what you have here, remember you have minus a negative, so that's plus a positive. You have negative nine minus a negative nine. So this is really negative nine plus nine, which equals zero. So because this is zero, because those kind of three vertices that you were given, okay, that were supposed to represent a triangle, give you an area that's zero when you punch them into the formula, you know that those three points lie on the same line. They are collinear points. Let's look at another example. So now we have three comma seven, five comma 10 and six comma six. So again, I'm just gonna label these in order, x sub one, y sub one. This is going to be x sub two, y sub two. This is going to be x sub three, y sub three. So again, just plug into the formula. So you already know this is going to be what? x sub one, y sub one, so three, seven, and then there's always a one. Then x sub two, y sub two, five, 10, always a one. x sub three, y sub three, six, six, always a one, okay? Copy the first two columns, three, five, and six, seven, 10, and six. We're gonna multiply down. Three times 10 times one is 30. Then plus seven times one times six is 42. Then plus one times five times six is going to be 30. 30 plus 30 is 60. 60 plus 42 is going to give me 102. Then minus. For this one, I'm going up. So six times 10 times one is 60. And then plus, we have six times one times three, which is 18. And then plus, we have one times five times seven, which is 35. So we have 60 plus 18, which is 78, plus 35, which is 113. Okay, so it's 113. So at this point, we can stop. We don't even need to do this calculation. Even though the result will be negative 11, it's not zero. So these points are not collinear. All right, let's look at one more of these. I think it's a very easy concept and you just need a few practice problems. You basically have it down. This is a much better formula to use, much faster formula to use versus kind of using the distance formula that we talked about earlier in the course. So this is my x sub one, y sub one. Again, I'm just going in order. This is my x sub two, y sub two. This is my x sub three, y sub three. Okay, so just plug in. So again, I'm going to say I have negative 12 and negative four, x sub one, y sub one, and then a one. Then I'm gonna have my negative six, my zero and my one. Again, x sub two, y sub two, and then a one. And then I'm gonna have six, eight, and one. Again, x sub three, y sub three, and then a one. So find the determinant of this. I'm gonna put negative 12, negative six, and six. Copy the first column. And then I'm gonna copy the second column. So negative four, zero, and eight. And let me make this negative four over here a little better, make it line up a little better. So I'm gonna multiply down starting. So negative 12 times zero times one, there's a zero in there, so you know that's zero, forget about it. Then let me kind of move this down so it lines up. We're gonna have negative four times one times six. That's gonna be negative 24. Then plus, you're gonna have one times negative six times eight. That's gonna be negative 48, okay? So negative 24 plus negative 48 is negative 72. So that's the first part. So let me change colors, it's negative 72 and then minus. We're gonna go up, six times zero times one is obviously zero. Eight times one times negative 12 is negative 96. And then one times negative six times negative four. We know that negative six times negative four would be 24, so plus 24. So what is negative 96 plus 24? Well, that gives us negative 72, okay? So again, if you have this minus a negative, okay? If you have minus a negative, it's plus a positive. So you have negative 72 plus 72, which is zero. So these three points lie on the same line. They are collinear.
In this lesson, we want to talk about finding the equation of a line using determinants. All right, so over the course of kind of the last two lessons, we've been kind of working with this formula, which uses determinants to find the area of a triangle given three vertices. And then we also kind of expanded on that, and we looked at a formula to determine if three points were collinear. So let's just recap that real quick. We know that for the area of a triangle, we can basically get three points or three vertices for that triangle, okay? And we can label one as x sub one, y sub one, the other is x sub two, y sub two, and kind of the final one is x sub three, y sub three. Doesn't matter what gets labeled as what, okay? So you'd plug into this guy right here, you'd take the determinant, and if that result was negative, you'd multiply it by negative one half so that you got a positive area. If that result was positive, you'd multiply it by a positive one half so that you got, again, a positive area. So we found that if the area ended up being zero, well, the only way that can be true is if those three points that you kind of started with were on the same lot. Okay, so that becomes the test for collinearity. So if this part right here, okay, evaluates to zero. So I take the determinant, I get zero. I know those three points that you gave me, which were x sub one, y sub one, x sub two, y sub two, and x sub three, y sub three are collinear. Again, that just means they lie on the same line. Now we can expand on this even further and use this kind of formula to find the equation of a line. So we already talked about how to do this kind of earlier in the course. We use kind of the typical algebra one method, which is if you're given two points that lie on the same line, what you do is you first calculate the slope, okay? And you do that with your slope formula. And once you have that, you can plug into the point slope form of the line, okay? That y minus y sub one equals m, the slope times the quantity x minus x sub one. And from there, you can get the equation of the line. You can solve for y and put it in slope intercept form, or you can put it in standard form if you want. You can do whatever you need to do, okay? But we can do the same thing kind of using this formula here. So you'll notice instead of kind of three given points, now we just have two, okay? So we have x sub one, y sub one, that's one point, and then x sub two, y sub two, that's another point. So the only thing that's changing here is we don't have three points that are kind of known. We only have two. The first point, this x and y, okay, are unknown. So we just leave them as those two variables. Those are gonna be the two variables in our equation, okay, when we set it up. So all you need to do here is just kind of go through your process for getting a determinant, and then you're gonna set that equal to zero. So let's just look at an example real quick. This is not a hard concept. So we're given these two points. So we have three comma one and two comma seven and we wanna find the kind of equation of the line that goes through those points. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do the equation in slope intercept form, the y equals mx plus b form, okay? But you can do it in standard form if you want as well. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of plug into my formula, okay? So I know this equals zero, and again, it's x, y, and then a one. It's x sub one, y sub one, and then a one. And then it's x sub two, y sub two, and then a one. So let's just label these in order. It doesn't matter, you get the same result. So let's say this is x sub one, y sub one. Let's say this is x sub two, y sub two. And we're just gonna plug in. So I'm gonna erase x sub one, y sub one, and I'm gonna put a three and a one. I'm gonna erase x sub two, y sub two, and I'm gonna put a two and then a seven, okay? So from this point, let me kind of copy this. I wanna get some room going. And let me paste this in, and let me just get rid of this stuff. So how do we find the determinant? Let me kind of move this down. How do we find the determinant? We copy the first two columns. That's the quick way to do it. So you would have x, you would have three, you would have two, you would have y, one, and seven. And just go through your normal procedure, okay? And we're gonna set that equal to zero. So the first thing I would wanna do is multiply going down, okay? And this isn't really written too well, so let me kind of scooch this down so everything kind of lines up a little better. So I would start at this kind of top left and I would multiply down this diagonal. So x times one times one is x. Then plus, you'd multiply down here. So you'd have y times one times two. And I can make that a little better. So let me try to angle that a little better. So y times one times two is two y. And then plus, you're gonna multiply down this diagonal, one times three times seven, which is 21. So that's the first part. Let's just put that in brackets. And then we're gonna go minus. I'm gonna erase this so we can see what we're doing. So now I'm gonna go up. So I'm starting at the bottom left and I'm gonna go up. Two times one times one is two. 
and then plus, we're going to go up. 7 times 1 times x is 7x, and then plus, we're going to go up one more time. 1 times 3 times y is 3y, okay? So let me erase all of this. We don't need this information anymore. It's going to scooch this back down, okay? And we'll do that like this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this guy right here, since this is the determinant, I'm going to say it's equal to 0. Okay, so we're just setting up an equation. And it's the same thing as this. I'm saying this determinant is equal to zero. This is the determinant just written out, okay, as the steps we would need to take to find it. And it's still equal to zero. So let's go down a little bit and get some room to work. So I'm going to drop the brackets from kind of the first part. So just x plus 2y plus 21. From the second part, I'm going to be distributing that negative to each part. So it would be negative 2 minus 7x and then minus 3y. Okay, so this equals zero. That's why it's so important to use brackets so you don't make a sign mistake. So now I'm just going to combine like terms. We have x minus 7x, which is going to give me negative 6x. And then we have 2y and negative 3y, which is minus y. And then we have 21 minus 2, which is plus 19. And this equals zero. So from this point, we can, again, we can put it in standard form if we want. We just subtract 19 away from each side. But what I want to do is I want to put it in slope intercept form. So I am going to add 6x to both sides of the equation. And we know that this part would cancel. I would have negative y and then plus 19 is equal to 6x. Let me scroll down a little bit, get a little bit more room. I want to subtract 19 away from each side. And so this cancels, obviously. So we'd have negative y is equal to 6x minus 19. So to finish this up, I'm just going to multiply everything by negative 1. So this would become positive. This would become negative, And this is positive. So I can just erase this and say that my equation in slope-intercept form for this line is y equals negative 6x plus 19. Now, let me copy this real quick. And let me go back up. And let me paste this in here real fast. So we're going to use that as our reference. I'm just going to go through this really quickly with the kind of old-fashioned algebra 1 method, just so that you see that this does work. So again, if this is x sub 1, y sub 1, and this is x sub 2, y sub 2, okay, the slope formula says what? m is equal to y sub 2 minus y sub 1, so 7 minus 1 over x sub 2 minus x sub 1, so 2 minus 3. 7 minus 1 is 6. 2 minus 3 is negative 1, so the slope is negative 6, and we already know that because it's right there. So what we want to do next, now that we have our slope, and let me just label that, I'll say m, m, my slope, is equal to negative 6. I would use one of the points, again, it doesn't matter which one, and plug into that point slope form of the line. So that's the y minus y sub 1, for y sub 1 I'm going to use 1, is equal to m, my slope, which is negative 6, times the quantity x minus x sub 1, in this case, x sub 1 is 3, okay? So what I would do to solve for y, I would distribute this. So negative 6 times x is negative 6x, and then negative 6 times negative 3 is plus 18, okay? And this equals, over here I have minus 1, and then my y. So to solve for y, what do I need to do? Just add 1 to both sides of the equation, and I would wrap this up and say that y is equal to, this cancels, so you have your negative 6x plus 19, which is exactly, okay, exactly what we have here. Those are the same. So it's the same thing. I would argue that kind of using this method with determinants is probably a little bit faster, just depending on, you know, your speed with kind of doing things. Definitely if you use the shortcut for determinants, it's going to be a little faster because you don't have to go through and calculate the slope first and then plug in and kind of get your equation. Let's take a look at another one. So now we have negative 1 comma 5 and 7 comma negative 3. Again, I'm just going to label this as x sub 1, y sub 1, and this as x sub 2, y sub 2. It does not matter the way that you label the points. You get the same answer either way. So what I want to do is plug in to my formula. Again, the first one here, the first row is just x, y, and 1. Then the second row is x sub 1, y sub 1, and 1. And then it's x sub 2, y sub 2, and 1. So it's very easy to remember. Again, this gets set equal to 0. For x sub 1, I have negative 1. Okay, negative 1. And then for y sub 1, I have 5. Then for x sub 2, I have 7. And for y sub 2, I have a negative 3. All right, let's copy this. Again, we're just going to go a fresh sheet so that we don't run out of room. 
And let me just paste this in here. And I'm just going to slide this down. So I'll just put this out here so it's equal zero. Again, I'm just going to copy the first two columns. So x, negative 1, and 7, y, 5, and negative 3. So what we want to do is multiply down to start. x times 5 times 1 is 5x. Then plus, multiply down, y times 1 times 7 is going to be 7y. Then plus, you've got 1 times negative 1 times negative 3. You've got two negatives there, which makes a positive. So it's basically just 3 times 1 times 1, which is 3. So let's put this in some brackets. Again, it's not going to change anything, but we want to do that just to be consistent. Now, this is where the brackets kind of help you because it reminds you to kind of distribute that negative to everything. So let me erase all of this. And now we're going to go up. So 7 times 5 times 1 is 35. And then plus negative 3 times 1 times x is going to be negative 3x. So let me just put minus 3x. And then lastly, you have 1 times negative 1 times y, which is going to be negative y. I'm just going to say this is equal to 0. And the reason that works is because, again, if I go through and kind of calculate the determinant, this is what I would do, and that's supposed to be equal to 0, so that's why this is legal. So let's just go through and erase this. And we can just slide this down if you want, or I can just erase it and kind of redo it. And let's just kind of scroll down and get some room and go through and set this up. So I can drop the brackets from the left side. I don't need to worry about that. So 5x plus 7y plus 3. No change when you drop the brackets. The negative here has to be applied to each term. Okay, so that's why the brackets are very important there. So you'd have negative 35, you'd have plus 3x, and you'd have plus y, and of course this equals 0. So all I really need to do now is just combine like terms. I see that I have a 7y and a y. That's basically 1y. So that would be 8y. So let's write that first. Then you have this 5x and 3x. So you combine those and you're going to get plus 8x. And then lastly, you have this 3 minus 35. So what is 3 minus 35? That is negative 32. And of course, this equals 0. Okay, so what I want to do now, if I want to solve this for y, you can divide everything by 8 now, or you can wait. It doesn't really matter. If I divide everything by 8, what I'm going to get is, and let me kind of scroll down a little bit, I'm going to get y plus x minus 4 equals 0. 8 divided by 8 is 1. 8 divided by 8 is 1. Negative 32 divided by 8 is negative 4. And 0 divided by 8 is 0. So at this point, all I really need to do is subtract away x and add 4 to both sides. So in other words, I would do minus x and plus 4 to both sides of the equation. So minus x and plus 4. And so that's going to give us a final answer of y is equal to, again, this is all going to cancel, negative x plus 4. Okay, so that's the equation of our line. All right, let's just look at one more. It's a very easy concept. Once you kind of look at two or three of these, you basically have the concept down. So we have one point that's negative 2 comma negative 2. Again, let's just say this is x sub 1, y sub 1. And the other point is 3 comma 8. This will be x sub 2, y sub 2. You already know what to do. We're plugging into the formula. So you have x, y, and 1. Then you have x sub 1, y sub 1, and 1. So x sub 1 is negative 2 y sub 1 is negative 2, and then you have a 1. And then lastly, you have x sub 2, which is 3, y sub 2, which is 8, and then 1 again. And this is equal to 0. Okay, always set this equal to 0. And then let's just copy this real quick and come to this sheet here. That way we have lots of room to work. Let me kind of scooch this down a little bit so we have some room. Again, I'm just going to copy the first two columns. So x, negative 2, and 3. You have y, negative 2, and 8. And again, I'm just going to multiply down. x times negative 2 times 1 is going to be negative 2x. Then plus, let me put some brackets around this. We have y times 1 times 3, which is 3y. Then plus, 1 times negative 2 times 8 is negative 16. So let me just put minus 16 there. Close the brackets. And this is minus. Again, we're going to use some brackets so we don't make a sign mistake. So let me erase this. And now we're going to go up. Okay. So we're going to go 3 times negative 2 times 1, which is negative 6. Then plus, we're going to do 8 times 1 times x, which is 8x. And then we're going to go up. 1 times negative 2 times y is going to be minus 2y. Okay, and of course, this equals 0. So let's scroll down a little bit. And let's just apply this negative to everything. On the left side, I can just drop those brackets. They don't do anything. So negative 2x plus 3y minus 16. Distribute the negative to each term over here. So this would be plus 6, minus 8x, and then plus 2y. Again, I'm just changing the sign of each term there. 
So this equals zero. Now I can just combine some like terms. So I have negative two X and negative eight X. That's going to give me negative 10 X. I have three Y and two Y. That's gonna give me plus five Y. I have negative 16 plus six, which is going to give me negative 10. So minus 10 and this equals zero. So everything's divisible by five. So I can just go through and do that now. Divide this by five, this by five, this by five, and this by five. So negative 10 divided by five is negative two. So that would be negative two X. And then plus five over five is one. So this is just Y. Negative 10 over five is again, negative two. And this equals, we know zero divided by anything that's not zero is zero, right? So zero divided by five is zero. So at this point, let me kind of scroll down. I can just solve for Y by adding two X to both sides and adding two to both sides, okay? So this is going to cancel and this is gonna cancel. So you'll have that Y is equal to two X plus two. In this lesson, we wanna learn how to find the inverse of a matrix. So in our last lesson, we talked about how to multiply two matrices together. We found that although the process is quite challenging at first because it's so foreign to us, once we kind of nail down the steps, it's not so bad overall. If you're working with kind of larger matrices, then the process is a bit tedious. But again, once you memorize the steps, it's just some simple arithmetic. It's going to be the same thing when we talk about finding the inverse of a matrix. It's going to be a tedious process when we work with these kind of larger matrices. But again, we're just doing some simple arithmetic, okay? We'll find that when we work with a two by two matrix specifically, there's a little shortcut and I'll get to that in a little while. So the first thing we need to understand when we talk about this topic is the identity matrix, so that concept. So if I have a square matrix, an N by N matrix, that's an identity matrix, what happens is I have ones going down the main diagonal, okay? So what that means is that in my row one, column one, I have an entry of a one. And then in my row two, column two, I have an entry of a one. If I have a bigger matrix, let's say it was a three by three, then in my row three, column three, I'd also have an entry of a one. So those are your diagonal entries. Those are going to be ones. You're gonna have zeros above and below, okay? So you'll see this and say that looks very familiar. When we did our Gauss-Jordan elimination, remember we put the left side in reduced row echelon form, which is this form here, ones down that main diagonal, zeros above and below, and then the right side, that was what we got our answer from, okay? But here we don't have a right side. We just have this that we're working with. So this is our identity matrix, okay? Now, specifically here, when you look at this and you notate the size, because it's an N by N, same number of rows as columns, I can put one single number down here to identify the size. This is a two row by two column matrix. So I can say that this is an identity matrix or I sub two to say it's a two by two identity matrix. If I had a three by three identity matrix, again, I can just say it's I sub three. And notice how you have a one in row one, column one, a one in row two, column two, and a one in row three, column three. Again, your diagonal entries are going down that main diagonal there. Zeros above and below, so that's your identity matrix. It's a similar process if you had a four by four, a five by five, a six by six, so on and so forth. Now, why is this important? Well, this is kind of building up to something. And essentially, we need to understand that when we worked with kind of real numbers, okay, outside of matrices, just real numbers, going back to kind of grammar school, we found that if we multiplied a number by one, it was unchanged, right? One is the multiplicative identity in multiplication with real numbers. Well, what happens is if we take an N by N square matrix like A, okay, so that's what we say, if A is an N by N square matrix, and we multiply it by an identity matrix of the same size, right? So that's why you have I sub N there, you get A back. Now, what's interesting here, we learned in the last lesson that matrix multiplication was not commutative, right? If you change the order around, you generally speaking will not get the same product. And sometimes you could do it one way, but there's no product that's going to exist the other way. Here, you can go in two different ways. So you can say A, times I sub N would give me A, and then also I sub N times A, kind of reversing that would also give me A. Okay, so it's not a problem to kind of switch that around. 
So let's see a quick example of this. So what we have here is a two by two identity matrix. Again, we show this as I sub two, the two tells me I have a two by two. And then we have a matrix A, which is also a two by two. We have negative one and five in the first row, two and seven in the second row. So based on our rule above, we know that A multiplied by I sub two, or again, a two by two identity matrix should give me A back. And then additionally, I sub two, the two by two identity matrix times A should give me A back. So I'm just gonna do this first scenario. I'll let you reverse it and do that scenario as well. Again, you get A back either way. So let's go ahead and crank this out real quick. I'm just gonna erase this for right now. So first and foremost, can we do the multiplication? Of course we can because we're multiplying two square matrices together of the same order. If we think about it, this is a two by two and this is a two by two. So the columns from A, the left one, match the rows from I, okay, I sub two, if you wanna be specific, the right one. Okay, so you always circle these inside numbers and check to see if they're the same. If they are, you can proceed. Again, the size of the matrix comes from the outside numbers, so we know it's a two by two, okay? So let's go ahead and set this up and I'll put my entries in here. And just to stay consistent with what we did in the last lesson, I'm gonna put row one here and row two here, and I'm gonna put column one here and column two here. Again, if you're really good at matrix multiplication, you don't need this anymore. But when you first start out, I find that it really, really helps students figure out what's going on. If I look at this kind of entry here, I'm thinking about, okay, this is row one, column one in my answer. OK, I always get the row from the leftmost matrix. So in this case, that's A. So I want to be in row one of A. So this is the first row. I get my column from the rightmost matrix, or you could say the second matrix if you want. So in this one, I have column one. So I want to be in the first column here. OK, so to get this entry, all I'm going to do is find the product of this row vector times this column vector. That's all it is. OK, so we know how to do this. We go through and we say, okay, the first entry times the first entry. Negative one times one is negative one. Then we're gonna add to this. We're gonna have the second entry times the second entry. So five times zero is zero. So we know this is negative one. So this is negative one. And you can see already that your first entry in this matrix matches what it is in A, okay? So as we continue, now if I move into this position here, I'm still in row one, okay? So for A, I'm still gonna be in row one. But now I'm shifting to column two. So for this guy, I'm gonna be in column two. Okay, so that's all it is. Same process, I'm gonna do this one times this one. So negative one times zero is zero. Then plus, I'm gonna do this one times this one. Five times one is five. We know zero plus five is five. And again, we can see this matches exactly. So now, what I'm going to do is shift because I'm gonna be in row two down here now. So I'm gonna start in row two here and I'll have column one here. Okay, so row two, column one, this guy right here. So two times one is two plus seven times zero is zero. This equals two, so I get a two there. And again, this matches perfectly with A. So let me erase this now. We're gonna move on to kind of this one. So for the last entry down here, you're in row two, column two. So you've got the row from A and the column from I. Okay, so you've got two times zero, which is zero, plus you've got seven times one, which is seven, which gives me seven, so I put a seven there. So you can see that we multiplied our matrix A by our matrix I sub two or the two by two identity matrix and we got A back. Again, if you wanna pause the video and reverse this, if you wanted to do I sub two times A, you would get A back as well. Okay, so now let's move into talking about how to find the inverse of a kind of square matrix. So first we're gonna define a word here. So we have this non-singular word, okay? And that just means that the matrix is going to have an inverse. So when a matrix has an inverse, we say it's non-singular. You might also see the term invertible, okay? So those two words kind of mean the same thing. You might see non-singular in one textbook, you might see invertible in another, just depending on where you're kind of getting your information from. If you have a matrix that doesn't have an inverse, and we'll see an example of this in a little while, it's known as a singular matrix, okay? So if A is a non-singular, meaning it has an inverse, n by n square matrix, then this property is going to be true. If I take A 
and I multiply it by the inverse of A, okay, then I'm going to get an identity matrix of the same order. Again, I just put that in there to say it's an N by N. So if A was a two by two, the inverse of A would be a two by two, and then this identity matrix would be a two by two. So let's show an example of this real quick. I'm giving you A, and I'm giving you A inverse, okay? And what we're saying is that if you multiply A by its inverse, you're gonna get the identity matrix. In this case, you would get an I sub two because it would be a two by two, okay? So let's crank out A times A inverse, and you could reverse this, you would still get the identity matrix, okay, it wouldn't matter. So what this is going to give me is what? Let me kind of write this out. I know that it's a two by two by times a two by two, so the answer will be a two by two, okay? So this is row one, this is row two, column one and column two. So I know for this guy right here, row one, column one, I want this row here from the first one times this column here from the second one. So this row vector times this column vector, what is that? So we have three times one, which is three, plus we have one times negative two, which is negative two, and we know this is going to give me one. So I've got a one there already, okay? Now let's move on. So now I'm gonna erase this, and I'm gonna to move to this column here. So this guy, three times negative one is negative three, then plus one times three is three, and this is going to be equal to zero. So that's gonna be this entry here, okay? So now we're moving into this row down here. So let me kind of switch up my highlighting. I know I'm gonna be in this row here and this column here to start. So two times one is two, and then plus one times negative two is negative two. This equals zero. So let me write that in here. And then let me erase this, one more to do. And let's just highlight this now. So we'd have two times negative one, which is negative two, plus one times three, which is three. And obviously this is one. So we have our identity matrix. We have our I sub two, which is exactly what we were told from this rule here, okay? So now that we've proven that this is true with a simple little example, let's talk about how we could find A inverse if we didn't know it. Okay, so I'm gonna give you the shortcut first, okay? And then I'm gonna show you kind of the long way. This shortcut that I'm gonna give you is only gonna work for a two by two matrix, unfortunately. When you get something larger, you have a few different techniques that you can choose from. The one I'm gonna show you today is the one you're gonna see in your textbook. There's other methods that you can use. They're not a big difference in time. It just kind of depends on which kind of method you find less tedious. I can tell you that this is not a process that is very enjoyable, okay? So for the two by two, the shortcut goes as follows. So I'm gonna define A just generically to have these kind of entries of lowercase a, lowercase b, lowercase c, and lowercase d, okay? Now we haven't yet talked about the determinant of a matrix yet. We'll get to that in two lessons from now. But for now, it's very easy for a two by two matrix. It's just this guy times this guy. So it is A times D, then minus, you're gonna go this times this, so minus B times C. Okay, so that's the determinant of A. A lot of times you'll see DET, of A like this. There's a lot of different notation for this and I'll talk about that when we get to that video. For now, you just need to know this is the determinant of A, okay? So let me erase this real quick and let me erase this. I'm just gonna drag this up here a little bit so that we know what this is. Okay, so the way we find A inverse is that we're gonna go one over the determinant of A and we're gonna multiply this by we're gonna do a little kind of swap a row here. So I'm gonna take A and D and I'm gonna swap them. So I'm gonna put D here and A here. And then I'm gonna make C and B into their opposite. So I'm gonna have the negative of B and the negative of C. Now the first time you kind of see this, you're like, what in the world is going on? But after you do this a few times, it's something you just memorize. And I can tell you this comes up very often. It's a very good shortcut. It's gonna save you a lot of time, okay? So let's say, that I replace this with these numbers here. And I know they're already copied, but let's just say we have three, one, two, and one. And so I know that my A, my lowercase a is three, my lowercase b is one, my lowercase c is two, and my lowercase d is one, okay? So let me start out by going one over the determinant. Again, the determinant is three times one, which is three, 
minus one times two, which is two. So that's going to be one. Okay, so one over one is one. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Then times, I'm gonna do this stuff here. So these guys switch positions. So the three and the one switch. So one goes here and three goes here. And then what's gonna happen is this guy right here and this guy right here, I changed them into their opposite. So this is negative one and this is negative two. We already know that one times this in scalar multiplication just is itself. So I know that A inverse is this. And again, we already know that that's the inverse, right? I have a one and a one, a negative one and a negative one, a negative two and a negative two, and a three and a three. So not too bad overall compared to what I'm about to show you. So let's talk about the long way now. And this is something you'll see in your textbook. I'm gonna show you later on at the very end of the video, for those of you who wanna see it, where this kind of thought process comes from. I'll start out with a two by two matrix and I'll go through the whole thing and I'll show you why this makes sense. But for now, if you don't wanna look at that, you can just take it as a given, okay? So if you wanna find the inverse of an N by N non-singular matrix A, so this works for a two by two, a three by three, four by four, whatever you wanna use it on, okay? You start out by basically setting up this in step one. So you're gonna put your augmented matrix where matrix A goes on the left and the identity matrix of the same size, okay, goes on the right, okay? Then what you wanna do is you wanna use row operations to get this guy into the format of being the identity matrix and then this guy on the right, which we'll call matrix B, okay, the result of doing the row operations to getting this guy into that format, B is now going to be the inverse of A. Okay, and again, I'll show you exactly where this comes from at the end of the lesson. The process takes a little while, so I know some of you don't wanna watch that. All right, so let's go back, and I wanna grab A real quick, and I'll show you that you end up with the same thing. So let's just take this real fast. I'm gonna copy it, and I'm just gonna paste this in here real quick, and I'll show you that you get the same result either way. So what I wanna do is I wanna take this matrix here, this three, one, two, and one. And then I wanna put a vertical bar and I wanna write my identity matrix of the same size. So one's going down the main diagonal, a zero above and below, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use row operations to get this side over here to look like this over here. I want this side to be an identity matrix and then this side would give me the inverse, okay? So what we're gonna find is that we're gonna end up with a right side that matches this, okay? So let's go ahead and do our kind of row operations. We already know that this process kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, is very tedious, okay? So the book usually tells you to get a one here first and then use that to get your zeros. There's other methods you can use. I'm gonna stick with, with that method. I know there's kind of quicker ways, but I'm gonna stick with that because I don't wanna confuse you, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply row one by a third so that that entry becomes a one. So I'm gonna do one third times row one. That's what I'm gonna replace row one with, okay? So this three would become a one. This guy would become a one third. This would be a one third and this would stay zero. So let me erase all of these entries and let me put these in. This is one, one third. This is one third again, and this is zero. Okay, so that's the first step. Now the second step is to get a zero here. And to do that, I'm gonna use my one that's above that. Okay, so I think about the opposite of two, which is negative two, and I would say one times negative two would give me negative two. If I add a negative two to two, that would be zero. Okay, so what I wanna do is I wanna take negative two and multiply it by row one, add the result to row two. That's what I'm gonna replace row two with. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that real quick. So if I did negative two times one, that would give me negative two, and then if I added that to two, I would get zero, okay? Then if I did one third times negative two, that would give me negative two thirds. So negative two thirds, and then I'm gonna add that to positive one or three thirds. And if I add those two amounts together, negative two plus three is one, so I'd have one third, okay? And my screen's gonna get too busy, so let me kind of fill these in as I go. So this is a zero, and this is also a one third. So let me erase this, we don't need this anymore. And then for this one right here, I'd multiply negative two times a third, okay? So that would give me negative two thirds. 
And then I'm going to add the result to row two. So I'm going to add zero. We know that would still be negative two thirds. So this is negative two thirds. And this one's not going to move at all because negative two times zero is zero. Zero plus one is one. Okay. So that part is done. And just a little bit more to go. So now I want to make this a one. Okay. So I would just multiply that whole row by three, right? The reciprocal of one third. So three times row two would give me my new row two. Okay. So zero times three is zero. One third times three is one. If I did negative two thirds times three, I know that the threes would cancel. I'd have a one. Negative two times one is negative two. So this is negative two. And then I know that one times three is three. Okay, so I can just put a three in there. And you can already see that the kind of bottom row here works out to be this. Okay, but we got to fix, we got to make this a zero now. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply row two. I'm going to multiply row two by the opposite of one third, which is negative one third. I'm going to add the result to row one. Okay, that's what I'm going to replace row one with. So I'm going to do zero times negative one third. That's zero. Zero plus one is still one. One times negative one third is negative one third. Negative one third plus one third is zero. So that's going to be zero. And then negative one third times negative two would be positive two thirds. And I can erase that sign. I don't need it. Then plus one third. Well, this would be one, right? Two plus one is three. Three over three is one. So this becomes a one here. And then lastly, okay, I would do a negative one third, a negative one third times three. And we know this cancels with this and gives me a one. Negative one times one is negative one. Okay. And I would add that result to zero. So that would be negative one. Now you can see here, once the process is done, this here matches this here. So that's exactly what we said in our instructions, right? Once you kind of start this way, you use your row operations, you get in the format of the identity matrix is on the left and on the right, you're going to have the inverse of your matrix. And we know that that's true already because we know that A inverse is the inverse of A because we already showed that, okay? So that's another way to go about doing it. If you have a two by two, you know, it's not something you really want to do because it just takes too long. You want to go ahead and use the shortcut. So that's the only time I'm going to use that there. I want to show you an example of a singular matrix. Okay. So I'm just going to do one with a two by two. And what you're going to find is that it's singular or meaning it doesn't have an inverse because the determinant is going to be zero. Okay, the determinant is going to be zero. So if you use row operations here, you're not going to be able to get it into the format that you want. But again, we're going to use our shortcut. So I'm going to say that A inverse is equal to one over the determinant of A. So three times four, which is 12, minus six times two, which is 12. So once you see that this is a zero down here, the determinant, you can stop and say this is a singular matrix. Okay, it's not going to have an inverse. So you don't need to go any further. I know the rest of it was to kind of multiply it by this. These two guys would switch. So you have four here and three here, and these guys become their opposites. So negative six here and negative two here. But the whole thing is blown, okay? Because you have a zero in the denominator and we know we can't divide by zero. So this isn't gonna work. There's no inverse. All right, so let's take a look at an example with finding the inverse of a three by three matrix. Again, as I said earlier, when you get a three by three or a four by four, there are some tricks out there. There are some different techniques, but none of them are pleasant. Okay. And you basically have to pick one of them and then grind through the work. So we're going to look at the method that we learned today. So basically, I'm just going to copy this guy right here. And I'm going to say I have a one, a negative one, and a one, a zero, a four, a negative two. And then I have a two, a three, and a negative one. Okay. So that's the first part. Remember, you copy your matrix you're trying to find the inverse of on the left. You're going to put your kind of vertical bar in here. And then I'm going to write the identity matrix on the right. So I'm going to put a 1 here, a 0 here, and a 0 here. Then a 0, a 1, and a 0. And then a 0, a 0, and a 1. Okay, so again, 1's going down that main diagonal, zeros everywhere else. So you can say zeros above and below. So let me go ahead and copy this because we won't be able to fit this on this page. And let's go ahead and paste this in here and we'll just go through the work. All right. So we want to take the left side here and transform it into the identity matrix, or you could say you're putting it in reduced row echelon form. 
And again, through that process, the right side here is going to give us our inverse matrix of A, okay? So the first entry here, we always want to get a one here if you go by what your book tells you, right? You get your one first in the column, and then you use the one to get your zeros, okay? So that's already done for us. So what I want to do is concentrate on getting a zero here and then getting a zero here, okay? So let's do those one at a time. So I know that I can multiply row one by one, which is just the same thing as having the row itself, and then add the result to row two, because one and negative one are opposites, that's gonna give me a zero for that entry there. So the way I'm gonna write this is I'm gonna say one times row one plus row two is going to give me my new row two. You can get rid of the one if you want, I'm just gonna put it there for kind of emphasis. Okay, so let's go through and basically just say that we're adding row one to row two, and that's what we're replacing row two with. So one plus negative one is zero. Let me make that a little better. And then zero plus four is just four, so that's gonna stay unchanged. Two plus three is going to be five. One plus zero would be one. Zero plus one would be one, so that stays one. Zero plus zero is obviously zero, so that stays as a zero. All right, so that's the first step. Then the second step here, again, we wanna get a zero here. So to do that, I want the opposite of one, which is negative one. So I'm gonna multiply row one by that. So negative one times row one. Then I'm gonna add the result to row three down here. That's what I'm gonna replace row three with, okay? So let me just go through and multiply everything by negative one. So one times negative one is negative one. Zero times negative one is zero. 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. 0 and 0, if I multiply either of those by negative 1, I get 0. Okay, so those are going to be your entries that you add to this row. So negative 1 plus 1 is 0. 0 plus negative 2 is negative 2. Negative 2 plus negative 1 is negative 3. And let me just erase these because we're done with them. Okay, and then negative 1 plus 0 is negative 1. And then obviously if I add zero to something, it's unchanged, so I don't need to worry about the rest of those. Okay, so now let's move into the next column. Again, if you follow what your book tells you, and you don't have to, you can do it different ways, you wanna get a one first, okay? So I'm gonna put a one right there in row two, column two, okay? Considering the left part of the matrix. And to do that, I'm just gonna multiply row two by one fourth, right? The reciprocal of four. So one fourth times row two, is what I'm going to replace row two with. So we know that zero times a fourth would just be zero, so that's not changed. Four times a fourth is one. And then we know this would be what? It would be five fourths, so five fourths. This would be one fourth and this would be one fourth. So let me just change that in each case. And then lastly, we know zero times one fourth is zero. So that's done. So now, conveniently, I already have a zero above. I just need a zero below. Okay, so to do that, I'm gonna use my one and I'm gonna multiply row two by the opposite of this negative two, which is two. So two times row two and then plus my row three, that guy right there is gonna give me my new row three, okay? So let me just multiply everything by two. So two times zero is zero. Then we have two times one, that's going to be two. Then we have two times five fourths. So two times five fourths so this would cancel with this and give me a two down here. So that's gonna be five halves. So five halves. And then two times one fourth, we're doing that twice. So we know that this cancels with this and gives me a two down there. So in each case, I'm gonna have a half. So I'm gonna have a half here and I'm gonna have a half here, okay? And then lastly, zero times two would be zero. So that's the result in each case of doing two by each one of these guys, okay? So now we wanna take these results and add them to the entries in row three. Zero plus zero, obviously that's not gonna change. Two plus negative two is going to give me zero. This one, this one, and this one's gonna be a little bit of work. So let's do those off to the side. So we have five halves plus a negative three. So negative three. So I need a common denominator. I'm gonna multiply this by two over two. So I could say this is negative six over two. So negative six over two. Five plus negative six is going to be negative one. So this is negative one half, okay? So this is negative one half. So that's what I'm going to replace this guy with, negative one half, okay? So let's move on now to this one. 
So what we have is 1 half plus negative 1. So 1 half plus, for negative 1, I'm just going to write it as negative 2 over 2. Okay, And so negative 2 plus 1 would be negative 1. So this is negative 1 half. So this is negative 1 half. And obviously, 1 half plus 0 is 1 half. So that one's easy. And then 0 plus 1 is 1. So we don't have to do anything there. Okay. So now we are getting close to the end. Okay. So we want to get a 1 here as our first thing to do in this kind of column here. So to do that, I'm just going to multiply row 3 by the reciprocal of negative 1 half, which is going to be negative 2. So negative 2 times row 3, that's going to give me my new row 3. And so let's go ahead and do that. We know that this and this would be unchanged because they're zeros. 0 times anything is 0. This guy would obviously be a 1. So I really only need to work on these. And I know that this one right here, this 1, would just be negative 2. So let's work on this one and this one. Okay, so negative 2 times negative 1 half. We know that this would cancel with this and be 1. So you basically have what? You have negative 1 times negative 1, which is positive 1. So this is going to be positive 1. And then in the last case, you have negative 2 times 1 half. And so this cancels with this and gives me a 1. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. So this would be negative 1. Okay, so we have the bottom row here complete. And now what we want to do is get a 0 here and here, and we'll be done. Okay, so I'm going to multiply row 3 by the opposite of 5 fourths, which is negative 5 fourths, add the result to row 2. Okay, you already know what's going on. So for these first two, it doesn't matter because I'm multiplying by 0. So anything by 0 is going to be 0. And then if I add 0 to something, it's not going to change. So I don't need to worry about those entries. I know that if I multiply negative 5 fourths by 1, I get negative 5 fourths. If I add it to 5 fourths, I get 0. So I really don't need to worry about that either. Okay, I only have to work on these over here. So let's kind of do these entries real quick. So negative 5 fourths times 1 is negative 5 fourths. Then we have negative 5 fourths times negative 1, which would be positive 5 fourths. And then negative 5 fourths times negative 2, what would that give me? Well, I know it's going to be positive, so I can just erase these signs. And I can cancel this with this and put a 2 down here, so that's going to be 5 halves. Okay? And let me get rid of this sign here. We really don't need it. It's just for emphasis. Let me kind of drag these up a little bit more. All right, so let me just kind of put commas between them so we know what's going on. All right, so let's start with this guy right here. We would have 1 fourth plus this negative 5 fourths. We have a common denominator already, so we have negative 5 plus 1, which is negative 4. So this gives me negative 4 over 4, which is negative 1. Okay, so this is negative 1. So I can erase this. Don't need that anymore. And erase this. And then now I'd have 5 fourths plus 1 fourth, okay? So 5 plus 1 is 6, so you'd have 6 over 4, which reduces to 3 halves, right? Each is divisible by 2. So this is going to be 3 halves, okay? And then obviously 5 halves plus 0 is just 5 halves. All right, let me make this better because that doesn't look so good. Okay, so we have that completed now, and we just need to get a 0 in this entry here, and we will finally be done. All right, so how can we do that? We multiply row 3 by negative 2, the opposite of 2. So row 3 gets multiplied by negative 2, add the result to row 1, okay? So we don't have to worry about, again, these entries to the left of this because you have negative 2 times 0, negative 2 times 0, it's going to be 0. Add 0 to something, it's not going to change. I know this is going to be 0 because negative 2 times 1 is negative 2, negative 2 plus 2 is 0, so that's taken care of. So I really don't have to worry about these entries over here. Okay, so what is negative 2 times 1? It's negative 2. What is negative 2 times negative 1? It's positive 2. What is negative 2 times negative 2? It's going to be 4. Okay, so let's add these. Negative 2 plus 1 is going to give me negative 1. Then next, you're going to have 2 plus 0, which is going to give me 2. And then lastly, you're going to have 4 plus 0, which is going to give me 4. Okay, so we've completed our process. All right, so just to recap what we did, we started out with A on the left and the identity matrix and I sub 3, because it was a 3 by 3, on the right. We used row operations to basically transform the left side into an identity matrix. We'll say I sub 3 because it's a 3 by 3. And then the right now, let's just call this 
B, or you could just say it's A inverse, right? Because it's the inverse of A at this point, okay? So that's the process, that's how you do it. If you wanted to say, we can just copy this real quick, go back up, and let's just paste this in. We can say that A inverse, okay, is going to be this part right here, okay, on the right. So let me just kind of set this up. We'd say negative one, negative one, and one. You would have two, you would have three halves and negative one. You would have four, you would have five halves and negative two. And so that would be the inverse of this matrix here. And again, this process is gonna work if you you know, have a four by four or a five by five or something like that. Obviously those problems get very, very tedious and there's some tricks out there, but usually in your course, you're only gonna be given a three by three and occasionally maybe for like a bonus question, they'll give you a four by four. These guys who are teaching these classes, they understand how tedious this process is. All right, so let's wrap up the lesson by kind of returning to this generic formula. I wanna show you where this comes from. Some textbooks show you where it comes from and you might get lost if you're trying to read it. Other textbooks just skip it, okay? So if we find the inverse, again, of an n by n non-singular matrix A, again, the first step is to put this kind of augmented matrix there where A, what you're trying to find the inverse of, is on the left and your identity matrix is on the right. Then through your row operations, the left side, you change that into the identity matrix. One's going down the diagonal, zeros above and below. And this matrix that's formed on the right, let's just call it B, is the inverse of A. So where does this come from? Let's go ahead and start with a fresh example, okay? So we have A and it's equal to this. We have five and negative one and we have three and six. So let's start out by using the little shortcut to figure out what we should get. So again, A inverse, if we use our shortcut, is equal to one over the determinant of A, which is five times six, which is 30, okay? Minus negative one times three, which is negative three. Minus the negative is plus a positive, so this should be plus three. So this would be plus three here, so this would be one over 33. So it would be one over 33 times, okay, remember the little trick you have to do over here, you switch these two, so this becomes a six and this becomes a five. These two become their negatives or you could say their opposites. So this would be negative three and this would be positive one, okay? So if I did, let me kind of do this down here, I'll continue. And I need a bigger bracket. So one over 33 times six would be six over 33. Of course, each is gonna be divisible by three there. Six divided by three is going to give me two and 33 divided by three is going to give me 11. So that's my first entry. Then over here, if I did negative three over 33, each is divisible by three, this would be a one, and this would be an 11, okay? And then for this entry here, one over 33 times one would just be one over 33. And then for this last entry, I would have one over 33 times five, which is five over 33, okay? So that would be A inverse. And let me just kind of write this over here. Let's kind of scooch this up. Now, let's say that you didn't know that shortcut and you didn't know the rule that I just gave you, okay? So you didn't know about kind of going through the process. How could you figure this out? How could you derive the formula? Well, if I just started out with the notion that A times A inverse gives me an identity matrix. In this case, it's gonna be a two by two. Well, I can come up with a little formula. So let's kind of go down a little bit. Let me just copy A real fast. So it's five, three, negative one, and six. Let me copy this real fast and I'm gonna to go to a fresh sheet. We'll come back there and we'll check our answer eventually. So we have this guy here, and I know that if I multiply it by its inverse, let's just say I don't know what that is, we'll say it's X, Y, W, and Z. These are just kind of stand-ins for those entries, okay? We know that if we multiply these two together, if they're inverses, I get an identity matrix that's a two by two. So one's down the diagonal, and I've got zeros above and below. So we know this. So what I would do is I would say, okay, I can multiply these two together. So the way I would do that, I know I would get a two by two matrix. And I need a lot of room here, so let me just not put my brackets in yet. I know for this entry here, I would do this row times this column. So five times X is five X. And then I would have plus negative one times W, so minus 
w. Then for this entry, I would do this row times this column. So five times y is five y, and then negative one times z, we'd have minus z. Okay, then for this entry, I would do this row times this column. So I would have three x plus, you'd have six w, okay? And then lastly, I would do this row times this column, three y, okay, plus six z. All right, so, so far, so good. Now I know that this guy, if I set it equal to this, what has to be true? Let's think about what we know so far or what we've learned in kind of previous lessons. We know that two matrices can only be equal if and only if their size is the same. In each case here, we have a two by two and their corresponding entries are exactly the same. So what that means is that this guy right here, this five X minus W, must be equal to one if this is true, okay? We also know that five y minus z must be equal to zero. Again, corresponding entry. So this guy right here, this three x plus six w must be equal to zero. And this guy right here, this three y plus six z is equal to this one here, okay? So, so far, so good. Now, let's go down a little bit and let's continue to think about what's going on. I have four variables that are unknown and I can solve it here because I can split it into kind of two different systems with the same two variables each. So on the left, I'd have a system with X and W. On the right, I'd have a system with Y and Z, okay? Now you can go through and solve this pretty quickly, but what I'm gonna do is solve it. It's gonna take me a little bit longer, but I wanna show you what your book's gonna do. So I would solve this using a kind of augmented matrix. So in the first one, I would have Kind of the way this is lined up, I have my X on the left and my W on the right, okay, of this left side of the equation. So five and negative one and three and six. And notice the order is important. I've got to have the X lined up and the W lined up so that this column is the X's, this column is the W's. So this is for the X's, this is for the W's, right? Then this guy is going to give me my constants, my one and my zero. Let's stop and think about this for a second. I know that if I put this in reduced row echelon form, this guy would be a one, this would be a one, this would be a zero, and this would be a zero. So x, one x plus zero w would be this. So this guy is gonna give me what x is, okay? And similarly, this guy is gonna give me what w is, okay? So let's erase this and let's just keep that information so we keep track of what's going on. Now, Similarly, I can set up this system over here, five, negative one, three, and six. And through a similar thought process, I can say that this guy right here is going to be my answer for Y when it's done. And this guy right here is gonna be my answer for Z, okay? And I'm gonna erase this kind of circling. We don't need that. And it would just get in our way. Okay, now what do you notice here? This is where people get lost in this process. The left side here matches the left side here right? Five, negative one, three, six, five, negative one, three, six. Okay. So what happens is if I'm going to solve this using row operations, what I do on this would match what I do on this. It's this they're the same numbers, right? So what your book's going to do, they're just going to erase this and they're going to squeeze this down and say, Hey, I'm going to combine these two operations because I can. And what's going to happen is I already know, I've already kept track of what's going on. So when I put this guy into reduced row echelon form, or I make it into its identity matrix, okay, then I can get my answer by saying, this is what X is, this is what W is, this is what Y is, and this is what Z is, okay? So let's copy this and go to a fresh sheet. And we'll paste this in, and we'll finally crank this out. And I know this takes a while, but nothing kind of worth seeing is quick, okay? So let's go through and use our kind of row operations. We're trying to get this left side here into reduced row echelon form, or again, you could say the identity matrix. So the first thing I would wanna do is get a one here. So how would I do that? I would multiply row one by one fifth. That's what I'm gonna replace row one with, okay? So I know that this would be a one. I know that this would be a negative one fifth. I know this would be a one fifth and this would stay a zero. So that's pretty easy. Then the second thing I would do is I would make this into a zero. So I would multiply row one by negative three. I would add the result to row two. That's what I'm gonna replace row two with. So 
Negative 3 times 1 is negative 3. Negative 3 plus 3 is 0. Then negative 3 times negative 1 fifth gives me 1. Negative 3 times negative 1 is 3, and then over 5. So this is 3 fifths. And then I'm going to add to this 6. So I'm going to have 3 fifths plus, might as well say 6 is 30 over 5. Okay, so this would be 33 fifths. This is 33 fifths. All right. And then we have negative 3 times a fifth. That's negative 3 fifths. If I add that to 0, it's just negative 3 fifths. So that's pretty easy. And then lastly, we have negative 3 times 0. That's 0. So we don't have to worry about that. So that part is done. Now, let me get this to be a 1. So I'm going to multiply row 2 by 5 over 33. That's what I'm going to replace row 2 with. And so we know this is a 1. We don't even have to worry about this. This right here, if I did 5 over 33 times negative 3 fifths, the 5s are going to cancel. The 3 over the 33, we know they're each divisible by 3, right? So we say this is a 1 and this is 11. So this right here is going to be negative 1 over 11. And we know that, lastly, I'm going to have 5 over 33 here. Right, because 1 times anything is itself. All right, so one more thing to do here. I just have to make this into a 0. And to do that, I'm going to multiply row 2 by 1 fifth. And I'm going to add that result to row 1. That's what I'm going to replace row 1 with. Let me kind of slide that down because it took a little bit too much room. Slide that over here. All right, so 1 fifth times 0 is 0. Don't have to do anything with that. 1 fifth times 1 is 1 fifth. 1 fifth plus negative 1 fifth is 0. All right, so now I'm going to do 1 fifth times this negative 1 over 11. Okay, so that's going to give me negative 1 over 55. Okay, so negative 1 over 55. And I'm going to add to this 1 over 5. So to get a common denominator going, I'm going to multiply this by 11 over 11. Okay, so that would give me 11 over 55. And if I add these two amounts together, I'm going to get 10 over 55. Now I can simplify this because each one of these guys is going to be divisible by 5. If I go ahead and cancel a 10 with a 5, 10 divided by 5 is 2. And 55 divided by 5 is 11. Okay, so that's what I'm going to replace this with. This is going to be 2 elevenths. And then lastly, I'm going to have 1 fifth times 5 over 33. And so this cancels with this and gives me a 1. I'm going to have 1 over 33. So 1 over 33 plus 0 is just 1 over 33. Okay. So let's erase all of this. Didn't mean to erase that bracket. And let's kind of copy this real fast. So let me paste this in here real quick. And I'm saying that this guy right here should be 2 over 11. So this is my x. It should be 2 over 11. This guy right here should be 1 over 33. And this guy right here should be negative 1 over 11. And this guy right here should be 5 over 33. Okay, so we already know that this is the case because we found it using the shortcut. So let me copy this real quick. So let me just paste this in here real quick and let me erase this. So what you see is that you have a inverse, right? This is exactly what we found from the shortcut. You have 2 elevenths and 2 elevenths, 1 over 33 and 1 over 33 negative 1 over 11 and negative 1 over 11, 5 over 33 and 5 over 33. Okay, so it's the same. And what's cool about this is that we ended up deriving kind of this formula that we see in our textbook, right? So we ended up saying that A times A inverse gives me the identity matrix. We had to set up some kind of variables to represent our unknowns for the A inverse. But what we ended up with was solving kind of a system that's set up this way. We had A on the left, and we had the identity matrix on the right. We tried to solve this system, so we try to put this guy in reduced row echelon form, where we have ones down the diagonal, zeros above and below. So that's the identity matrix, right? And then once we got in this format, we found that this guy right here ends up being the inverse, okay, of what we started with, which was A. So really cool to know where that comes from. If you were reading that in your textbook and you got lost, now you know the steps, now you know how it works. And you could really do this with a 3x3, three three, a 4x4, four four, whatever you want. You could extend what we just did out 
to as large of a system as you want it to work with. Again, as long as you're working with a matrix that's invertible or again, non-singular. In this lesson, we want to talk about solving linear systems using inverse matrices. All right, in the last lesson, we talked about how to find the inverse of a matrix. We found that only square matrices had an inverse and not all of them would have an inverse, right? So when a square matrix has an inverse, it's called non-singular or invertible. If it doesn't have a matrix, it's called a singular matrix. Now, we know that for a two by two matrix, there's a very good shortcut that we can use to find the inverse. When you get into a three by three or higher, there are some different options you can kind of employ, but all of them are tedious. They all involve a good amount of work, okay? So what we wanna do here is we wanna take the next step and we wanna show how we can solve a linear system using an inverse matrix, but it's not necessarily gonna be a good method to use, okay? In a lot of cases, this is gonna be way more work, okay? But it's something that you do need to learn because it's taught in every textbook and you're probably gonna get tested on. Now, let's go ahead and start out with this kind of easy system to get started. We have 8x minus 7y equals negative 17, and we have negative 6x minus 8y equals 26. So the very first thing you wanna do is make sure that your equations in your system are in standard form, okay? Just like when we try to set up an augmented matrix, you want the AX plus BY equals C. So everything has to line up, your X's, your Y's, your constants, make sure all that lines up. Now, the next thing you wanna do in this particular case, you don't have to do this, this is just something that I like to do to make things simpler. Notice how everything there is divisible by two. So I can really rewrite this and say this is negative 3x and then minus 4y, and this is equal to 13. So I'm just gonna rewrite my system real quick and say that it's 8x minus 7y is equal to negative 17, and negative 3x minus 4y is equal to 13. Okay, so let's copy this real quick. I'm just gonna go to a fresh sheet because things are gonna get busy very quickly here. And let me just paste that in. So now what I'm gonna do is going to seem a bit strange at first, but I'm gonna set up three different matrices. Okay, so one's gonna be for the coefficients, one's gonna be for the variables, and one's gonna be for the constants. So the way your book is gonna do this, they're gonna say that A is going to be the matrix for the coefficients. So if I just grab them in order, I have eight and negative seven, and then I have negative three, and I have negative four. Okay, so that's gonna be my first matrix of this kind of equation I'm gonna be setting up, which we'll get to in a minute. Then the second matrix is going to be a column vector. So a matrix with one single column. It's just gonna have the two variables of the system. So I have X and I have Y. So I'm gonna put X and Y, okay? So this is for the variables of the system. And then I'm going to have a matrix B, which is gonna contain these constants, okay? So let me write that. It's gonna be another column vector. So I'm gonna say we have negative 17 and then we have 13. Okay, so the way we're gonna set this up is we're gonna say that A, this matrix here, multiplied by X, this matrix here, should be equal to B, this matrix here. So you might be saying, why does that work out? Well, what happens is if I go through the process of multiplying this matrix by this matrix, I'm gonna get entries that exactly match this kind of left side, okay? And it's gonna be set equal to this right side here. Now, let me show you that real quick. Let me just kind of scooch this out of the way. So we have a little bit of room and I'll just move this up. It's gonna be very tight to do this. But first and foremost, can we multiply A times X? We know A is a two by two and we know that X is what? It's a two by one. So the columns from A match the rows from X. So we know we're good to go there. And we know the output of this is gonna be a two by one, right? The outer dimension, so two by one. So if I do AX, I would get a two row, okay, by one column matrix. So I would take this row times this column, eight times X is eight X, and then negative seven times Y would be minus seven Y. And then for this one right here, I'd take this row times this column, negative three times X is negative three X, and then negative four times Y is minus four Y. Now, again, this exactly matches what we have on the left side here. So let me kind of slide this down now and let me put some brackets around this. And if we say this is equal to B, B is down here. This is negative 17 and this is 13. This is exactly what we see with our system. Remember two matrices can only be equal if they're the same size. In each case, it's a two by one. 
okay? And they have exactly the same elements, okay? So we're saying that this is gonna be equal to this. This is equal to this, okay? We're saying this is equal to this, this is equal to this. So that's where this equation comes from. I just wanted to show you that so that you're not confused about why this is mathematically legal. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about how we could solve this equation. Right now, we know what the kind of entries are for A and the entries are for B, but we don't know the entries for X. That's what we'd like to find so we can figure out what X and Y are. So with normal equations, right, linear equations in one variable, it's very easy. We divide both sides, okay, by A, and we can get our solution, right? We would say X is equal to B over A. Well, it's not going to work out that way for us because we can't divide a matrix by another matrix. When we work with kind of matrices, that operation is undefined. So we have to have a different way. And what we're going to do is use some of the knowledge from the kind of previous lessons. And we're going to say that we know if we take A inverse and we multiply it by A, I'm going to get an identity matrix of the same order. OK, so if I took A inverse multiplied it by A, I would get... I sub two, right? A two by two identity matrix. So let's just go ahead and do that real quick. I'm going to slide this down here. I'm going to say I have A inverse times this on this side, and I've got to make sure of the order because it's going to be very important to make sure the order is correct. So I'm going to slide this in on the left. And what happens is on this guy, A inverse times A gives me an I sub two, and this is times X, and this equals A inverse times B. Now, stay with me for a second. We have X, which is two rows by one column, and we have I sub two, which would look like this, right? It would be a one's going down the diagonal, zeros above and below. So this is my I sub two. Now, if I multiply I sub two by X, first off, is that legal? This is a two by two, this is a two by one, so yes it is, and I would get X back, okay? And you can pause the video and do that real quick. You can multiply this by this, you will get X back. So really what I can do at this point is I can just erase this because it doesn't really do anything. It's just like if I had one times five and I said, okay, well, this is just equal to five. That's all I'm doing there. So at this point, I can say that X, this unknown right here is going to be equal to A inverse times B. Okay. So that's where we're kind of going with this. And really quickly, we know that we can do the operation this way because A inverse is going to be a two by two and B is going to be, or is, I would say a two by one. So mathematically, we can multiply these together. If you flip the order though, okay, if I did it like this, if I said I had B times A inverse, you're gonna run into a problem, right? Because this is a two by one, and this is a two by two, you cannot do that operation. Okay, so you gotta make sure that when you're setting these equations up, you pay attention to kind of which order you're multiplying everything in. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is just kind of copy these we're going to go to a fresh sheet because we're going to run out of room. We'll paste this in here. And I'm going to get rid of this for a second. What I need to find right now, I'm just going to get rid of this too. I need to find A inverse to start this off. So I need to find A inverse and then I'll multiply it by B and I'll know what X is. So how do I find A inverse? Again, if you didn't watch the last lesson, let me give you the shortcut real quick. So if we have A and let's define the entries to be lowercase a, lowercase b, lowercase c, and lowercase d. What happens is if I want A inverse, all I need to do is put one over the determinant of A. And we haven't talked about this yet, but it's very easy to find this. It's basically just A times D. So these two multiply together. So A times D minus these two multiply together, B times C, okay? That's very easy. Then multiplied by, what I'm gonna do here might not make a whole lot of sense, but we'll kind of get to this later on. So A and D would swap, so D and A, Notice how those positions swap. And then B and C, these guys are going to become their opposite. So negative B and negative C. Okay, so this is something you probably want to write down for your notes because we're going to use it a few times today. And the main thing here is that don't be frustrated if you can't memorize this with kind of one go. I've been using this forever, so I already know it. But it's one of those things that after you practice enough times, it just gets committed to memory. So write it down, use it when you're solving your problems, and you'll memorize it very quickly. All right, so let me just erase this. I can do this from memory. And so I'll say A inverse is equal to, but it's gonna be one over the determinant. So this guy times this guy, eight times negative four is going to be negative 32. And then minus negative seven times negative three is going to be positive 21. If I did negative 32 minus 21, that's gonna give me negative 53. Okay, so that's the first part of the formula. 
Then we have to multiply it by, remember we have all this stuff that goes on. So these two switch. So the position of this one and this one, so this becomes up here and this one becomes down here. And then these guys get changed into their opposite. So instead of a negative seven, I get a seven. Instead of a negative three, I get a three. So from this point, I'm just multiplying a scalar by a matrix. So very, very simple. Let's just do this down here real quick and then we'll replace everything. So negative one over 53 times negative four would just be four over 53. Okay, so that's gonna be your first entry. So it's gonna be four over 53. So let me erase this and I'll put this over here. So four over 53. We kind of slide that down because we're gonna need some room. So A inverse is gonna be equal to this. Then the next one is negative one over 53 times three. This is just gonna be negative three over 53. And then the next one is going to be times seven. So obviously that's just gonna be negative seven over 53. And then the last one is going to be times eight. So that's just going to be negative eight over 53, okay? So let me erase this from here and let me try to make this a little bit more compact because we're gonna run out of room. So we're gonna have four over 53. We're gonna have negative three over 53. We're gonna have negative seven over 53. And we're gonna have negative eight over 53. All right, so that's about as good as I can do. Now. What we said, and I have to go to kind of the next one. I can erase A, I don't even need it. So what we need to do, let's go back up. We know from this equation, and I can just erase all this, we don't even need this anymore, that X is equal to A inverse times B. Here's B, let me grab this real quick. And again, you gotta do this in the right order. So A inverse is first, B is second. So let me put this in here, okay? So we're gonna say that we have A inverse times B. Again, this is a two by two and this is a two by one. So we can do this, these numbers match, and it's going to be a two by one. So a two by one. So you're gonna have one there and one there. So let's go ahead and crank this out real quick. We wanna start out with this kind of entry here, and that's gonna come from this row times this column. So you're gonna have four over 53 times negative 17. That would be negative 68 over 53. So negative 68 over 53. And then you'd have plus, you have this guy times this guy, so negative seven over 53 times 13. So that's gonna give me negative 91, okay? Negative 91 over 53. So if I add negative 68 and negative 91, I get negative 159. So this would be negative 159 over 53. And if I do that kind of calculation, I'm gonna get negative three, okay? So this first entry here is going to be negative three, all right? So now I just need this entry down here, and all I'm gonna do is get kind of this row times this column. Okay, so negative three over 53 times negative 17. We know negative three times negative 17 would be positive 51. So this is positive 51 over 53. And then you're gonna do this guy, which is negative eight over 53. Okay, times this guy, which is 13. So that's gonna give me negative 104. Okay, so negative 104 over 53. You can add these two together. So you're basically doing negative 104 plus 51, which gives me negative 53. So you know what this is gonna be. It's negative 53 over 53, which is negative one, okay? So at this point, we've found our answer. A inverse times B is X. So let me just copy this real quick, or I can copy the whole thing, okay? So let me paste this in here real quick. And we know that A inverse times B is X. So let me just kind of, replace this and I can replace this and I'll just drag this up here. So we have our solution, right? This guy represented X, this guy represented Y. So we can say that X is negative three and Y is negative one, okay? So let me erase all of this and we can just check this real fast. I know this process is very tedious. And again, it's not a recommended method. If you used any other method, you'd be done a long time ago, right? But it's just something they teach. So we do want to cover it. All right, let's check this real quick. If I plug in a negative three for X, I get eight times negative three, which is negative 24. And then negative seven times negative one would be plus seven. Does this equal negative 17? Yes, it does. And then for this one, you get negative three times negative three, which is nine. Negative four times negative one would be four. So plus four equals 13. That works as well. All right, let's take a look at another example. So we have three X minus nine equals three Y. We have negative eight Y equals 48 plus 16 X. 
So in this case, we have to do some cleaning up, right? We can't just start because everything would get messed up. You want every equation in AX plus BY equals C. And here you have some opportunities to kind of work with smaller numbers. So you want to take advantage of that. I'm going to, for the first equation, I'm going to subtract 3Y away from each side. And I'm going to add 9 to both sides. And then I'm going to divide everything by 3. So this is going to give me X minus Y equals 3. So this is going to be my first equation. Let me just kind of drag this up here. And we're going to bring this to another sheet. So don't even worry about this right now. So I'm going to subtract 16X away from each side here. So minus 8Y. And this equals 48. For this one, everything is divisible by 8, right? Because you divide this by 8, you get negative 2. Then times X. You divide this by 8, you get negative Y. And this equals, you divide this by 8, and you get 6. So you can say this is negative 2X minus Y is equal to 6, okay? So you can look at that and say that, hey, I could solve that with substitution in probably like less than a minute. But we're going to do this using the kind of inverse of a matrix method, which will probably take us about 10 minutes. All right, let's go ahead and paste this in. And let's set everything up. So the first thing I want is matrix A, which is going to be the coefficients. So you have a 1 and a negative 1. You have a negative 2, and you have a negative 1. Okay. Then I want my matrix X, which is going to be, again, a column vector with X and Y. Then I want my matrix B. Okay, let me write that here. B is going to contain a 3 and a 6. Okay, again, another column vector. So we already know that this sets up to be A times X is equal to B. We've already shown that that's legal. And then we also know that if I multiply this side over here by A inverse, and again, slide this down, as long as I do it on the left side, I am good to go, right? A inverse times B. Because again, this is a two by two, this is a two by one. So this way is legal. If I flip it around, it's gonna be illegal. Okay, it's not gonna be defined. So A inverse times A is the identity matrix. And again, it would be a two by two, and this is a two by one, so that's legal. So I would get X back. So X would be equal to this. So I need to find the inverse of A multiplied by B. And again, I'll have my solution for X. So let's copy A real quick and go to the next sheet. And we're going to quickly find the inverse now that we know the method. So again, it's 1 over the determinant. Multiply this by this. 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. Then minus this times this. Negative 1 times negative 2 is positive 2. If I have negative 1 minus 2, that's going to be negative 3. So this is negative 1 third times interchange these two. So what I want to do, again, this one and this one, they change positions. So this becomes negative 1 and this becomes positive 1. And then what I'm going to do for these, for this one and this one, I change the signs. So this one becomes positive 1, and this one becomes positive 2, okay? So again, when you see that, it might not make sense the first few times, but then after you practice, you're going to very quickly memorize this kind of formula. It's a very good shortcut. All right. So if I multiply everything by negative 1 third, I'm going to get basically positive 1 third here. I'm going to get negative one third here. I'm going to get negative two thirds here. And I'm going to get negative one third here. So this is the inverse of A. So this is A inverse. And let's just move this over here. And I'm going to erase A at this point. I don't need it anymore. It serves me no purpose. I need to go back up and get B. So let's copy this. And let's go back down and paste this in. And so now I want A inverse times B again in that order because it's only defined in that order. So A inverse times B, again, this is a two by two and this is a two by one. So the dimensions will be two by one. Okay, so let's go ahead and set this up. We do this row times this column. So you have one third times three and then plus you're gonna have negative one third times six. So what's that going to give me? One third times three is one. And then you have negative one third times six. This cancels with this and gives me two. Negative one times two will be negative two. So this is negative two. So what's one plus negative two? That's negative one. So this is negative one. And then for this one, and I shouldn't put that bracket in there. For this one, I'm gonna go this row times this column. So negative two thirds times three plus negative one third times six. And of course, this is gonna cancel, you'll have negative two. And this cancels with this and gives you two. Negative one times two is negative two. 
And so this is going to give me negative 4, right? Negative 2 plus negative 2 is negative 4. So we found our solution. We know x is negative 1 and y is negative 4. So let's go ahead and copy this real quick. Just go back up and prove that to you real fast. So let me just paste this in here real quick. So we know that a inverse times b is x. So let me erase this and I'll just slide this down. Okay, so we can record our solution. We know this one is x, so x is negative 1. We know this one is y, y is negative 4. I'm just going to erase everything at this point. We don't need it anymore. I'm just going to list our solution and be done. So we'll say that this is negative 1 comma negative 4 as an ordered pair. Again, if you want to check, I highly recommend it when you start. Negative 1 minus a negative 4, so plus 4 equals 3. Yeah, that works out. And then this one is negative 2 times negative 1, which is 2. And then minus a negative 4 is plus 4. Does that equal 6? Yes, it does. So that's the correct solution. All right, so let's wrap up our lesson and look at a more challenging problem, or you could say a more tedious problem. We're going to look at a linear system with three variables. And again, we're going to solve it by kind of finding the inverse of one of the matrices that we set up. Now, again, I just want to emphasize this. This is definitely not the best method to do it. It's just something we're showing you because you will probably be tested on it. All right, so the first thing you want to do if you get a three-variable system, again, 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 you've got to make sure these equations are set up correctly first. If you don't, it's going to give you the wrong answer, right? So you got to make sure that the x's are lined up, the y's are lined up, the z's are lined up, the constants are lined up, so that when you load the information into your kind of matrices that you're setting up, everything corresponds correctly, okay? So you're going to have a column with the coefficients for x's, then a column with the coefficients for y's, you know, so on and so forth. So in this format, we have everything as ax plus by plus cz equals d. So we're good to go. But again, if it wasn't like that, you'd have to set it up correctly. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a coefficient matrix just as I always have. I'm going to call it a. And so I'm grabbing all the coefficients. So this has an implied coefficient of one. This is going to be negative three. This is going to be positive two. So that's from the first equation. That's this one. That's this one. And that's this one. Okay. From the second equation, I would have a two. I would have a negative 5, and I would have a positive 3. Okay, so again, just to highlight, that's from here, here, and here. Okay, and then from the last one, I've got a 3, a negative 6, and a 4. And again, that's from this one, from this one, and this one. Okay, so all I did was I set up a coefficient matrix, and I'm just calling that matrix A. Now next, I'm going to set up a matrix that's going to represent the variables of the system. We're going to call that capital letter X. And so that's going to have three variables, x, y, and z. So x, y, and z. So this is just a column vector. And then lastly, I'm going to have my matrix B. Okay, so I'm going to write that up here. So B is going to be a column vector with my constants. So again, it's going to be negative 24. It's going to be negative 39. And it's going to be negative 49. Okay, so we know from the previous two examples that if I do A, the coefficient matrix times x, the variable matrix, I can set this equal to b, right? This kind of matrix with my constants in it, and that would represent kind of our system, right? So you can prove that to yourself. You can stop the video and you can multiply a times x and set this equal to b, and you'll see that you get the same thing. All right, so what we wanna do now is kind of set up the solution for this, and we already know how to do it. So let me kind of slide this down just a little bit so we have a little room to work. It's going to be pretty tight. So we already know this is going to set up as A inverse times A times X. And you don't need those dots there, but I'm just putting them there for emphasis, is equal to A inverse times B. Okay. Now, we know that A inverse times A is going to give me an identity matrix. And in this case, it's going to be a 3 by 3. So this would be an I sub 3 times x is equal to a inverse times b. Now, we already know that if I multiply a 3 by 3 identity matrix by a 3 by 1 matrix x, I'm just going to get x back, okay? So I can really erase this. I don't need it anymore. And I can just declare that x is equal to a inverse times b. Of course, we already knew this from kind of previous examples, but again, it's just good to go over it again. So really, all I need to do here is find a inverse, multiply it by b, and then I'll have my values for x, y, and z, okay? So let's copy A, and let's find the inverse first. That's going to be the hardest part. All right, so what we want to do right now is find the inverse of A. Again, we talked about this in the last lesson. For a 2 by 2 matrix, if it's got an inverse, it's very easy to find. There's a shortcut. 
For a three by three, there's a variety of methods that you can use. And we'll talk about another method kind of later on after we talk about determinants. For now, it's a little bit beyond us. But the method that we know, the method that we learned in the last kind of lesson that works for any kind of invertible square matrix, what we do is we set up an augmented matrix and it's gonna look something like this, okay? So let's say A is an N by N matrix. In this case, it's a three by three. And then you have I, which is the identity matrix. In this case, it would be a three by three. So you're setting up an augmented matrix where A is on the left, the identity matrix is on the right. You're gonna use row operations to put it in this form. So you want the identity matrix on the left and your A inverse is going to be on the right. And again, we talked about why this works in the last lesson. So let's go ahead and set this up real quick and we'll get our solution. So I'm gonna start with just this guy right here. I'm just gonna erase the A equals. I'm gonna put a vertical bar here and I'm gonna put a one, zero, zero, a zero, one, zero, and a zero, zero, one, okay? So this is just the identity matrix on the right and this guy on the left is our A, the matrix we're trying to find the inverse of. So we're gonna use our row operations to put this side, you could say in reduced row echelon form, or we could say it's going to become an identity matrix. It's just gonna match this over here. So the very first thing we wanna do if we follow the method that's given in every textbook is we wanna get a one there. And we already have that, so we don't really have to do that. And then based on that one, we're gonna get our zeros. So we want a zero here, and we want a zero here, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to multiply this top row here by negative two, and I'm gonna add the result to row two. So I'm gonna notate that by saying I have negative two times row one, and I'm gonna add the result to row two. That's what I'm gonna replace row two with. So let me just go through and multiply negative two by everything in row one. So negative two times one is negative two. Negative two times negative three is positive six. Negative two times two is negative four. Negative two times one is negative two. And then negative two times zero is gonna be zero in each case, so for both of those, okay? Now, what I'd wanna do is add each of these to the kind of entries in row two. That's what I'm gonna replace row two with. So negative two plus two is zero. Then six plus negative five is one. Then negative four plus three is negative one. Then negative two plus zero is obviously negative two. And then in each case, I'm adding zero to something, so it's not gonna change. So that part's done. So now I move to this row right here and I want this to be a zero. So what I do is I multiply row one, okay, row one by negative three, okay, and then I add the result to row three. That's what I'm gonna change row three with, okay? So let me just multiply everything by negative three first, get that out of the way. Negative three times one is negative three. Negative three times negative three is positive nine. Negative three times two is negative six. Negative three times one is negative three. And of course, negative three times zero in each case is zero, okay? So now we're gonna add each of these to the entries in row three. So this is going to be a zero. Nine plus negative six would be three. This is going to be a negative two, right? Four plus negative six would be negative two. And then in each case, here and here, I'm adding to zero. So it's just gonna be negative three and zero. And then here, zero plus one is just gonna be one, right? So this is going to be my row three. So now we're gonna to move to this column here and conveniently we already have a one again so we don't have to do anything there. We just need to use that one to get our zero here and our zero here, okay? So I'm gonna multiply row two by, I'm gonna get rid of this one first, I'm gonna make this a zero. So I'm gonna multiply row two by positive three and I'm gonna add the result to row one. That's what I'm gonna replace row one with, okay? All right, so let me multiply everything by three. So I'm gonna go ahead and say zero times three is zero. And then one times three is three. And then three times negative one is negative three. Three times negative two is negative six. Three times one is three. And then three times zero is zero. So let's add everything. So zero plus one is still one. Three plus negative three is zero. Negative three plus two is negative one. Negative six plus one is negative five. And then we have three plus zero, which is three. And then obviously zero plus zero is zero. So that takes care of that. Now we move into kind of making this into a zero. So multiply row two by negative three, add the result to row three. That's what I'm gonna change row three with. So negative three times zero is zero. Negative three times one is negative three. Negative three times negative one is three. Negative three times negative two is six. Negative three times one is negative three. And negative three times zero is zero. 
So let's add now. Zero plus zero is zero, so I don't have to do anything there. Negative three plus three is zero. We have three plus negative two, which is positive one. Now we just have six plus negative three, which is positive three. We have negative three plus zero, which is negative three. And of course, zero plus one is one. All right, so looking pretty good so far. As we move to the next column, again, conveniently, we already have a one. So we just need to get a zero here and here. Now, we have the same number in each case. We have a negative one and a negative one. So whatever I do to make this into a zero, we'll also make this into a zero. So we can kind of do this as one step. I'm gonna break it up into two just so you don't get lost, but you could do it as one step. So really what I need to do is just multiply row three by one, okay? Or you could just say you have row three and add the result to row two. That's what I'm gonna re replace row two with. And again, it's gonna be the same thing. I'm gonna multiply row three by one and add the result to row one. That's what I'm gonna change row one with. Again, because in each case, one plus negative one would give me zero there. Now, if you wanna write a one there just for emphasis, that's fine, but it's the same thing either way. So let's start with kind of this one. I'm just gonna add the entries in row three to row two. That's what I'm going to replace row two with. So zero plus zero is zero, no change there. Zero plus one is one, no change there. One plus negative one is zero, okay? And then three plus negative two is going to be one. Negative three plus one is going to be negative two. And then one plus zero is one, okay? So that one's done. And then lastly, we're gonna have zero plus one, which is one, zero plus zero, which is zero, one plus negative one, which is zero. And then we have three plus negative five, which is negative two. We have negative three plus three, which is zero. And we have one plus zero, which is one. Okay, so now we're finished. And essentially you see that you have the identity matrix. You have an I sub three here on the left and you have your A inverse on the right. Okay, so we can just copy that real quick. A inverse is gonna be equal to, you're going to have this negative two, zero and one. Then you're gonna have one, negative two, and one. And then I didn't make my bracket big enough. And then three, negative three, and one. So let me copy this real quick. And we'll go to a fresh sheet. And let's paste this in here real fast. All right, so let's get rid of all this. Now, we need to, let me kind of go back up. We need to multiply A inverse, which we just found, times B. And that's gonna give me X, these three entries here that are gonna give me the solutions for my system. So let me copy B real quick and let me paste this in. And remember, we've got to do this in the correct order. If I do A inverse times B, it's defined. If I do B times A inverse, it's not defined, okay? It's not gonna work. So A inverse times B is gonna be equal to what? Well, again, I know that this is a three by three and this is a three by one. So it's gonna end up being a three by one. So you're gonna have one, two, three entries here. Let me make that a little better. So for the first entry, let me kind of slide this up just a little bit. For the first entry, what I'm gonna have is this first row times this column. So in each case, let me just kind of set this up so we can blow through this. In each case, when I'm multiplying a row by a column, this isn't gonna change. So in other words, I'm gonna have negative 24, I'm gonna have negative 39, and I'm gonna have negative 49, okay? So let me just kind of wrap these, and I'm gonna copy this real quick. And I'm gonna paste it twice, right there. And I'm gonna paste that again, just to save us a little bit of time, okay? So what's gonna happen is, I'm gonna multiply again this row by this column. So you'd have negative two times negative 24. So let's put negative two here. Then plus, you're gonna have negative 39 times zero. And then negative 49 is gonna be multiplied by one, okay? So we can do that real quick. Negative two times negative 24 is 48. This is zero, okay, so you have 48 here. This is going to be negative 49, so this is gonna be negative one. So that is your first entry. So this is negative one. Then for this one, again, you're doing this row times this column. So one times negative 24 is negative 24. Then plus you have negative two times negative 39. We know that's positive, and two times 39 is 78. So let's just say this is 78, and then you have this one times this negative 49, so that's just negative 49. So what does this come out to? If I do negative 24 plus negative 49, I get negative 73. If I add that to 78, I get positive five. So this will be five. I can kind of get rid of these bars at this point. I just have this one left. So this row times this column. So you have three times negative 24, that's negative 72. 
Okay, so negative 72. Then plus, you'd have negative 3 times negative 39, which is positive 117. So let's put 117. And then lastly, you'd have 1 times negative 49. So let's put plus negative 49. Okay, so what is negative 72 plus negative 49? That's going to give me negative 121. So I'm going to put plus negative 121. And if I do 117 plus negative 121, I get negative 4. Okay. All right. So again, it takes a lot longer to do it this way. I think it's kind of cool if you do this just a few times just to kind of get the concept down. But then again, it's not an efficient way. If somebody gave you the inverse to start, then maybe it'd be pretty quick to use this because all I'm doing is some very simple matrix multiplication to get my answer. But if you don't have the inverse, if you have to calculate it, even with the shortcut that we're going to learn kind of in a few lessons, it's still going to be a very tedious process. And it's going to be easier to use other methods like Kramer's rule, which we'll be talking about here shortly. All right, so let me kind of copy this and let's go back up. And I don't know where I'm going to fit this. Let's just kind of paste this in here for a second. And let me just erase some stuff here. We know that X is equal to this. So I'm just going to erase this and just kind of slide this down. We know that this first entry was X, this was Y, and this was Z. Okay, so X is negative 1, Y is 5, and Z is negative 4. So let's erase everything now. We don't need anything anymore. We've found our solution. So as an order triple, I'm going to say it's negative 1, it's 5, and it's negative 4. Okay, and we can just check this real quick just to make sure we didn't make a mistake. So in this first one, you'd have negative 1. You would have minus 3 times 5, then plus 2 times negative 4 should be equal to negative 24. Well, if I do my multiplication first, this is 15, and this is negative 8. So you can say that you have negative 1 minus 15, which is negative 16, minus 8, which is negative 24. So this one's good. All right, for the next one, we have what? We have 2 times negative 1, which is negative 2, minus, you have 5 times 5, which is 25, plus, you have 3 times negative 4, which is negative 12. This should equal negative 39. Negative 2 minus 25 is negative 27. And if you add negative 27 and negative 12, you do get negative 39. This one's good to go. So for the last one, you have 3 times negative 1, which is negative 3. And then minus 6 times 5, which is 30. And then plus 4 times negative 4, which is negative 16. This should equal negative 49. And of course it does, right? If you do negative 3 plus negative 30, you get negative 33. And negative 33 plus negative 16 is negative 49. So it works in all of them. Again, not the fastest way to kind of go about this. But it's good to have the concept down. It's good to understand how you can kind of solve something using this method. Again, if somebody gave you an inverse to start, it would be a decent kind of technique to use. But if they didn't give it to you, it would probably be a much slower method to use. In this lesson, we want to talk about how to find the transpose of a matrix. All right, so finding the transpose of a matrix is a very, very simple concept. We're just going to jump right into an example. So suppose I have matrix A. And it's a two by two matrix, two rows and two columns, with the first row being negative nine and eight, and the second row being four and two. So if I want to find the transpose of this matrix A, I would take that name A, and I would just put a superscript T up here. And it's going to be equal to, all we need to do is take the first row, which again consists of negative nine and eight, and make that the first column in the transpose. So this will be negative nine and eight like this. And then similarly, the second row, will become the second column, so four and then two. So basically, when you see the definition for this in your textbook, what they're trying to tell you is that the transpose of a matrix is formed by kind of swapping, or you could say interchanging the rows and columns. So in other words, if I kind of go back through this, this first row became this first column. This second row became this second column. Okay, or you could also say this first column became this first row. This second column became this second row. So it's very, very easy to do this. Let's take a look at another example. So here we have our matrix A, and we want to find the transpose. Now, this is a good point to stop. In the last example, we saw a two by two matrix, which is a square matrix. So when you look at the order of the transpose, and you look at the order of kind of the matrix you started with, it's going to be the same. But if you look at kind of the order of the transpose of a non-square matrix, it's going to be reversed. So what do I mean by that? Well, this is a two row and three column matrix. It's a two by three. 
Well, what happens is when I find the transpose, the A with the superscript T, it's going to be a three by two because this row will now become a column and this row will now become a column. So it's going to have three rows and two columns. So let's see this real quick. So I'm going to take this guy right here and make it a column. So negative one, five and negative seven. So the first row became the first column. And then I'm going to take this second row and make it my second column. So it's going to be zero, eight, and nine. Okay, and it's just that simple. And now let me kind of move this over here. So this is a two by three. And this guy, again, the order is reversed. So it's a three by two. So again, just to go through this, this first row became this first column. This second row became the second column. Or you could also say that this first column became this first row. This second column became this second row. And this third column became this third row. Let's look at one more. For the final one, again, we have our matrix A, and this guy is gonna be a three by four, right? It's a three by four. We've got three rows and four columns. So again, when I find the transpose, that order is gonna be flipped. It's gonna be a four by three. So the transpose of A, again, we're gonna put A with a superscript T here, is gonna be equal to, again, the way I always do it is I just take the row, the first row, and make it the first column. That's how I go about it. I take the second row, make it the second column, third row, make it the third column. But again, it's just as valid. We'll just kind of do this in the opposite way now. Let's take the first column and make it the first row. So it would be five, 11, and then five. Okay, and then take the second column, make it the second row. So nine, three, and six, and then take the third column, make it the third row. So zero, negative two, and zero. And let me kind of slide this up just a little bit. And then for the last kind of column we have here, the fourth column, it'll be the fourth row. So you're gonna have negative four, you're gonna have 44, and you're gonna have 19. Okay, so that would be your transpose of your matrix A. Okay, so remember, the first row became the first column. The second row became the second column, and the third row became the third column, or again, you could say the first column became the first row, the second column became the second row, the third column became the third row, and the fourth column became the fourth row. In this lesson, we wanna talk about how to find the adjoint of a matrix. So when we talk about the adjoint of a matrix, which is also referred to as the classical adjoint if you're in a linear algebra course, or the adjugate, it's found using kind of two easy, but I would say tedious steps. So the very first thing you wanna do is make a matrix of cofactors. Now, we talked about cofactors when we did our lesson on determinants, and specifically when we looked at our method known as the kind of Laplace expansion method or the kind of expansion by cofactors method. Now, after you've kind of got your matrix of cofactors, the next thing you wanna do or the second part of the process is to find the transpose of that cofactor matrix. So like I said, it's two easy steps because you're basically just doing some arithmetic, but it's quite tedious, especially if you get into something like a three by three, a four by four, a five by five. These are kind of matrices that when you find the adjoint for them, it takes a little bit of time. So without further ado, let's just look at an example real quick. And we're just gonna start out with something that's very generic. And I'm gonna show you that you've seen the adjoint of a matrix already, you just didn't know it. So first we have our matrix A, and it has A and B in the first row and C and D in the second row. Now we already said that the inverse of A, the little shortcut method was one over the determinant of A. Okay, so that's why I have those vertical bars surrounding that A there times, it's going to be the adjoint of A. Okay, so this is the adjoint of our matrix A. What we're gonna do is we're gonna swap these two. So I'm gonna swap A and D. So D comes up here, A goes down here. And then these two, the C and the B, I'm gonna make them into their opposite. So I'm gonna put a negative B and a negative C, just to say, hey, whatever we have in those positions, we're going to take the negative of it or just change the sign. Now, this is the a, D, J of A, or again, the adjoint of A, or the adjugate of A, however you wanna think about that. So where did this kind of come from? Well, again, what we could do is we could start out with this guy right here. We could make a matrix of cofactors, and then we can take those cofactors, that matrix, and we can find the transpose of that guy, and it will give us this exactly. So to see that real quick, let me just kind of copy this. Let's go to a fresh sheet. And I'm just gonna paste this in, and let me just kind of clean this up a little bit. So what we're gonna have here 
I'm going to put a dj of a is equal to this, okay? So our original matrix A was what? It's A, B, C, and D. And the reason I'm going through this generically is that once you kind of look at this, you'll know the shortcut for two by two to find the kind of adjugate or again, the adjoint. And you can quickly do it with a two by two just from that shortcut. When you get to a three by three or higher, you're gonna have to do more work and I'll explain why in a little while. So the very first thing with this guy is to make a matrix of cofactors. Now. When we talk about a cofactor, remember there's kind of two parts to it. The first part is you have to calculate a minor. Okay, so how do we find the minor? Well, let's say I wanted the minor of this element here. I would delete the row and I would delete the column and I would look at the determinant of the matrix that's left. Well, if you do this with a two by two, the determinant of the matrix that's left is just the entry that's left. Because the determinant of a one by one matrix, if I wanted the determinant of this, it would just be this itself. So when you work with these, you're just grabbing the entry that's left. That's all you have to do. But if you go into a three by three or higher, you're gonna end up having to actually go through the work of finding a determinant because it's not just gonna be the single entry that's left, okay? So what we wanna do is say that the minor and I'm gonna notate this as M sub one one, because again, this is row one, this is row two, this is column one, this is column two. This is telling me I have the minor element for row one, column one. So it's this entry right here. And what is it equal to? Again, if I mark out this row, mark out this column, it's the determinant of what's left. In this case, it's just D, okay? So that is how I find the minor, but that is not the cofactor. There is an extra step. And there's a few different ways you can do this. Let me show you the long way and then I'll show you how to make like a little sign table so you can speed this up. So the cofactor C sub one one, okay? So of this entry right here, you take the minor and you multiply it by negative one raised to the power of the row plus the column. So in this case, you can get that information from here. So one plus one is two. Now notice how if you're raising negative one to an even power, you're going to get one and the sign of the minor is not gonna change. So this guy is equal to positive one times D, which is just D. So the cofactor for this kind of entry in row one, column one is just gonna be D. So let's erase all of this. And let's put that C is equal to, okay, we're just gonna put a D here to start. Now, for the rest of these, if you wanna kind of make it a little bit quicker for yourself, when you set up the kind of cofactor matrix, instead of having to go through and multiply negative one raised to the power of the row plus the column each time, you can predetermine the signs. You'll see a lot of different sign charts out there and basically they alternate. So again, if I look at the kind of row and the column I'm in in each case, this is a row number of one and a column number of one right here. One plus one is two, two is an even number. So we know negative one raised to an even number, okay, is going to be positive one. So the sign is going to be positive or just stay what it is, okay, that's what that means. Then if I go here, it's gonna be row one, column two, one plus two is three, it's negative. See how it alternates? Then if I come down here, it's row two and column one, so it's two plus one, which is three, which is odd. Okay, so again, that's gonna be negative. And this last one is row two, column two, so two plus two is four, that's even, so it's positive. So if you have this as a little reference, you can find your minor and just attach the sign that way. So you don't have to go through and multiply by negative one raised to kind of the power of the row plus the column each time. So let's just keep this here for reference and let's just burn through the rest of this. So if I want the minor for this guy, again, all I do is I delete the row and the column it's in and I take the determinant of what's left. In this case, it's going to be C. And for this one, let's delete the row and the column and I'm left with B. And for this one, I'm going to delete the column and the row it's in and I'm gonna be left with A. Now, we already did the sign change for this one. There was no sign change. But for this one, notice how again, there's a sign change. So I'm gonna put a negative here. For this one, there's a sign change. So I'm gonna put a negative here. And for this one right here, there is no sign change. So when you have a plus, you don't change the sign because the minor and the cofactor are the same. But when you have a minus, you do change the sign. So you want the negative of whatever's there. So this is the cofactor matrix now. We've taken all the minors and applied the sign changes when they were necessary. Now, to get the adjoint, you'll notice that this is still not the same. The entries along the diagonal are same, but these two are not. So what you have to do is take the transpose of this guy, 
So the transpose of C, of C, and we put that capital letter T, the superscript above our kind of letter C there to show this. All we need to do, this is a very simple process, we take the first row and make it the first column. So we'll take D and negative C, then we take the second row and make it the second column. So negative B and A. So basically, if you've never taken a transpose before, you're just interchanging the rows and columns. So I took the first row and made it the first column. The second row became the second column. Now, another way you could do this, you could say that the first column became the first row and the second column became the second row. So however you want to do that. So I'm done with this matrix here. And basically, at this point, I can say that the adjugate or the adjoint of our matrix A is equal to the transpose of our matrix C, which is this guy right here. And you'll notice that these two match up perfectly. You've got a D and a D. You've got a negative B and a negative B, a negative C and a negative C, and an A and A. So what happens is when you work with the two by two matrix, you can always use this little shortcut by just remembering the generic entries here and remembering the adjugate, or again, the adjoint turns into this one. So these two switch and these two on the kind of opposite diagonal are going to be their opposite. So let's look at an example real quick. So we have our matrix A and it's equal to, we have negative one and three in the first row and five and two in the second row. So what we can do here, again, if it's a two by two, it's very easy. We can just use our shortcut. So I can switch these two. So I can say this is two and this is negative one. And I can say that these two are gonna be their opposite. So this is negative three and this is negative five. So look how fast and easy that is using that shortcut. Unfortunately, in a moment when we start looking at three by threes, we've got a lot more work to do. But let's just do this the slow way real quick, just so we get a little bit of practice before we get into the three by three and we have something more difficult. So if I want the adjugate of this guy the slow way, I would find a cofactor matrix first. And again, let me just set up the signs. So in this kind of first row, first column here, again, it's row one, column one. So one plus one is two, that's even. So there'll be no sign change. And then it alternates. So this guy's gonna be negative. And then down here, it will be negative, And here it will be positive. Again, just look at the sum of the row number and the column number. Row one, column one, one plus one is two, two is even. So that's why it's positive. If it's row one, column two, one plus two is three, it's odd, so that's why it's negative, okay? So you can just look at that, sum the row number and the column number. If it's odd, it's gonna be negative, okay? If it's even, it's gonna be positive, meaning there's no sign change to your minor. All right, so let's go through this real quick. If I want the minor of this guy, delete this row, delete this column. If we want the determinant of this, which is just this number itself, so it's going to be two. So let's write our two in there and I'll put it in a different color. So let's move on to this one now. So I'm gonna delete the row and the column. I'm left with just five. Again, you take the determinant of that, it's just that. But notice how I put the negative five there. I want the opposite of this because there's a negative sign there, okay? I'm basically just multiplying it by negative one. Then as I move down here, I'm gonna delete the row and the column. I'm left with just three. The determinant of that would obviously be three, but again, there's a negative there. So I want negative three, the opposite of that number. Then lastly, for this entry here, I want to delete the row and the column. I'm left with negative one. So obviously the determinant of that is negative one. Okay, so we had a plus there, so there's no sign change. Again, 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 I can't stress this enough because this is what confuses people. If you end up with kind of a negative sign there, if you're looking at a sign table, take the opposite, or you could say multiply by negative one by what you get for your minor. If it's a plus there, leave the minor alone. There's no sign change needed. All right. So now that we have this, we're not quite there yet because we have to take the transpose. So the transpose of C is equal to the adjugate, or again, the adjoint of A, which is equal to what? Well, let me kind of move this out of the way because we're going to run out of room. So I'm going to define this down here. So what we would do is take this first row and make it our first column. So two and negative five. The first row became the first column. And then the second row will become the second column. So negative three and negative one. So you'll notice this matches our shortcut exactly, two and negative three in the first row, negative five and negative one in the second row. Okay, let's look at an example that's a lot more tedious, but again, the concept is the same. So we have a three by three here, and obviously what we wanna do is start out by making a matrix of cofactors, then find the transpose of that, and that's gonna give us our adjoint. Okay, so C is gonna be equal to, that's my cofactor matrix. I'm just gonna go through and put some signs in so we don't have to deal with them. So this guy is row one, column one, so it's plus, and then all the signs are gonna alternate. 
So it's going to be minus and then plus. Okay, and you can go through and see that for yourself. But then going down here, this is going to be minus, plus, and minus, and then plus, minus, plus. So the signs always alternate. Okay. So now what I want to do is go through and find those entries. So I'm going to start with this one right here. I'm going to mark out the row and the column and take the determinant of what's left. Okay. So here's where it's more work because before with the two by two, you really didn't have to, you do take the determinant, but the determinant is just the number that's presented because you only have one number. Here I actually have a two by two matrix that I have to find the determinant of, so it's much more work. So I'm gonna do two times zero, which is zero, minus, you have three times negative one, which is negative three. Zero minus a negative three is zero plus three, which is three. Okay, so no sign change here, so this will just be three. So let's go through the next one. So we want this one, so I'm gonna mark out this column and this row. So I would have five and negative four and negative one and zero. And I'm just writing this out because it's kind of hard to see this with kind of this highlighting in between. So the determinant here would be five times zero, which is zero minus, you have negative one times negative four, which is four. So this is negative four, but you have a sign change there. So this is positive four, okay? All right, so let's go to the next one. So now we're here, we're gonna mark out this column in this row. So what we wanna do is find a determinant of this, five times three is 15, then minus, you have two times negative four, which is negative eight. 15 minus a negative eight is gonna give me positive 23, and there's no sign change here, so we'll put just 23, okay? All right, let's erase this, and let's do this one. So I'm gonna delete this row, and I'm gonna delete this column. So what we're gonna have here is one and negative six, and then three and zero. So we want the determinant of this, one times zero is zero, minus, three times negative six is negative 18. Again, minus a negative is plus a positive, so this would be positive 18. So we're doing a sign change here because it's right here where there's a negative. So this is gonna end up being negative 18. So let me write that in, negative 18. All right, let's go to the next one now. So we're gonna do this one. So I'm gonna delete this column in this row. So what do we have? We have three and negative six, then negative four and zero. So the determinant of that, three times zero is zero, minus negative six times negative four is 24. So we have zero minus 24, which is negative 24, and there's no sign change there, so it's just negative 24. All right, let's go to the next one. So now we have this one right here, so delete the column, delete the row. What's left, we have three and one, negative four and three. So the determinant of this guy, three times three is nine, minus one times negative four is negative four. Nine minus a negative four is the same as nine plus four, which is 13. But again, you've got that negative there, so you've got to do the sign change, so this is negative 13. All right, let's look at this final row. So we have this guy right here, so I'm gonna delete the column, I'm gonna delete the row. So what I have left is this guy right here, so the determinant of that, one times negative one is negative one, then minus, you have negative six times two, which is negative 12. Again, minus a negative is plus a positive, so it's negative one plus 12, which equals 11. No sign change, so it's just going to be 11. And let me change colors there. So now we're here, so we're gonna delete this column in this row. So we would have three and five, negative six and negative one. So the determinant of this guy, three times negative one is negative three, minus negative six times five is negative 30. And this equals, we would have negative three plus 30. Again, minus a negative is plus a positive. So this is going to be positive 27. Now, when we look at this, we have to do a sign change. So this will be negative 27. All right, last one. So we wanna find the cofactor of this guy. So delete this row and this column. So what do I have? I would take the determinant of this matrix, three times two is six, minus one times five is five. So this is one. And there's no sign change here. So this is just going to be one. All right, so now I have my cofactor matrix or my matrix of cofactors. At that point, it's pretty easy. I'm gonna say that the transpose of this cofactor matrix is equal to the adjoint of A, which is gonna be equal to what? We're gonna transpose this guy. So I'm taking this row and making it this column. So let me use a different color. We're gonna have three, four, and 23. Again, first row becomes first column. Then the second row becomes the second column. So negative 18, negative 24 and negative 13. Then the third row becomes the third column. So 11, 
negative 27, and then 1. Okay. Now, if you want, you can delete this notation because you're done with it. If you're asked for the adjoint, just give them this. You don't need to tell them it's the kind of transpose of the cofactors because they already know that. Okay, so this would be your answer, your adjoint or your adjugate of A. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at another one. It never hurts to practice a little bit more. If this is something you're already comfortable with, you can already start doing your practice problems. Otherwise, let's go ahead and knock this guy out. So we want to find the adjugate or again, the adjoint of A. So the first thing I want to do is find the kind of cofactor matrix. And the first thing I'm going to do again is just make a matrix of signs because I know that that's going to help me, right? I don't have to go through and do negative one raised to the power of the row plus the column each time. So again, if you can just remember that this first one's positive because it's in the first row and first column, one plus one is two, raising negative one to that even power gives you positive one. You just alternate from there. So this is negative, this is positive. Then you would come down here and you alternate. So this is negative, positive, negative. Come down here and alternate, positive, negative, positive. Very easy to remember that this first one's positive and that they alternate. So if you remember that, then you're basically good to go. Make your first row, then drop down here and say, okay, if I'm alternating, it was positive, now it's gonna be negative, and you just alternate. That's how you can keep going. So once we have this kind of set up, we just go through and get our minors and then apply the sign change if we need to, find the transpose of that matrix, and we're good to go. All right, so the first one here, to find the cofactor, delete the row, delete the column. What's the determinant of what's left? Negative two times nine is negative 18, and then minus zero times one is zero. So this is just negative 18. There's no sign change, so let's just put negative 18 in there. And then let's move on to the next one. So now I'm going to be here. I'm gonna delete the row and the column. And let's just do this from where it is. We would take the determinant of this matrix here. It would be six times nine, which is 54, minus, you have zero times zero, which is zero. So this is 54, but again, you have that sign change. So this is going to be a negative 54. All right, let's move on to this one. So I'm gonna delete the column and the row. And the determinant of this guy, six times one is six, then minus, negative two times zero is zero. So this is just six. No sign change because it's positive, so let's just put a six there. So let's start right here now, we'll be in the second row. So I'm gonna delete this row, and I'm gonna delete this column. So what do I have left? I have this matrix with negative one and three, and one and nine. So the determinant, negative one times nine is negative nine, then minus three times one is three. Negative nine minus three is negative 12. You've got a sign change there, so this would be positive 12. So now I'm going to be here, so I'm gonna delete this column and this row. So the determinant of this, one times nine would be nine, then minus three times zero would be zero. So this is nine, no sign change. So it's just going to be nine. Then let's move on to the next one. So I'm gonna be here, delete this row, delete this column, and take the determinant, one times one is one, minus, you have negative one times zero, which is zero. So this is one, but again, you have a sign change there, so it's gonna be negative one. All right, let's erase this. And let's highlight this guy right here. So we're gonna delete this row and this column, okay? So now what we're gonna have is the determinant of this. So negative one times zero is zero. Then minus three times negative two is negative six. Zero minus the negative six is zero plus six, which is six. So this is six. All right, now let's look at this one right here. So I'm gonna delete the row it's in and the column it's in. And I'm gonna take the determinant of this guy, so it would be one times zero, which is zero. Then minus, you have three times six, which is 18. Zero minus 18 is negative 18, but you have your sign change there. So it's gonna be minus a negative 18, or you could say negative one times a negative 18, however you wanna think about that. It's gonna be positive 18. And let me just change the color of this guy real quick. I like for my rows to have different colors. So let's do the last one. We're almost there now. So this guy right here, I'm gonna delete the row and the column. And so the matrix that I have left, the determinant of it, one times negative two is negative two, then minus negative one times six is negative six, minus a negative is plus a positive, so negative two plus six, which is four. So this will just be four here. So let's erase this. So now we have a matrix of cofactors, and what we wanna do is find the transpose of this guy, and that's gonna give us our adjoint. So you can say C transpose is equal to the adjoint of your matrix A, and this is equal to, again, you can just take the first row and make it the first column, or you can take the first column and make it the first row. Let's do it a little differently. So let's take the first column and make it the first row. So negative 18 
12, and 6. Again, all I did was I took the first column, made it the first row. Now I'm going to take the second column and make it the second row. So negative 54, 9, and 18. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take the third column and make it the third row. So I'm going to have 6, negative 1, and 4. Okay. Again, it's equally valid to take the first row and make it the first column. It's the same. You can take the second row, make it the second column. Take the third row, make it the third column. You are interchanging the rows and the columns when you find the transpose. So either way, we found our adjoint for A, and I can erase this notation, we don't really need it. This guy right here is the adjoint of our matrix A. In this lesson, we want to talk about how to find the inverse of a matrix using the determinant and its adjoint. So at this point, we're kind of finally ready to talk about an alternative approach that can be used to find the inverse of a non-singular, or you can say invertible square matrix. So let's suppose we have our matrix A, and it's an n by n. Again, that just tells you you have a square matrix, same number of rows as columns. Invertible matrix. Again, invertible or non-singular just means that you can find an inverse, okay? If you can't find an inverse, that's a singular matrix. So if this is true, then A inverse can be found using this formula. So we say that it's 1 over the determinant of A times the adjoint of A. Now, we already know how to find the determinant. If you didn't watch kind of the last two lessons, okay, you probably don't know what the adjoint of A is, but I'm going to cover that again here. Okay, I'm not going to cover it in as much detail, but we're going to go through it really quickly. So let's go down. And let's just start off with an example. And the very first thing I want to do, we know for the two by two, we have a nice little shortcut. And you're going to see where this shortcut comes from in a minute. But for now, let's just use the shortcut. So we know that if I generically define A to be equal to, let's just say it's A, B, C, and D, then A inverse is found as what? It's equal to one over the determinant of A times what you do is, you take A and D, these guys along the main diagonal, and you swap them. So D goes up here. Let me change colors real quick. D goes up here, and A goes down here. And then these other guys, the B and the C, you just change the sign. So this becomes negative B and negative C. Okay. So following this format, if I want A inverse really quickly, what I can do is I can say it's 1 over the determinant of A. Now, let's just stop and get that for a minute. It would be what? It would be 0 times 3, which is 0, minus, you'd have 1 times negative 1, which is negative 1. Be careful there, it's minus a negative 1, so that's plus 1. So the determinant is 1, so 1 over 1 is just 1, so you can just get rid of that. You don't even need it. So really all I need to work on is this part of the formula. And again, what do I want to do? I want to swap A and D, so I want to swap this one and this one. So 3 goes up here, 0 goes down here. And then these two, I want to make them into their opposite, so negative 1 and positive 1. So this is the inverse of A. We already know how to do that. It's really easy and cool. But where did it come from? Well, let's talk about that for a minute. If you go back to that formula, and let me just go back up here. This is something you probably want to write down in your notes because we're going to use it all day. Again, A inverse is 1 over the determinant times the adjoint of A. Now, we did this, but we really didn't know we were doing it. Okay, so let's go back. And I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to need a fresh sheet to go through all this. So 0, 1, negative 1, and 3. And let me just copy this real quick. And let's go to a fresh sheet so we have some room to work. And we're going to see that we're going to get the same answer. So let's paste this in. Okay, so the first thing is we know the determinant is 1. So let me just kind of write that off here. The determinant of A is 1. So we don't really need to work on that. How do we find the adjoint of A? Well, we talked about this over the course of the kind of last two lessons. First, you need to find a matrix of cofactors, okay? And then you need to take the transpose of that. It sounds kind of fancy, but it's really not that hard. It's just more tedious than it is hard. We know that finding a cofactor is kind of a two-step process. The first thing is you have to find the minor, and then you have to apply a sign change in some cases. So really what we would say is a given entry in our cofactor matrix, which I'll call C, Let's just say that C sub IJ, this is just some generic entry, is equal to negative 1 raised to the power of the row plus the column. So I plus J, okay, and then times your minor element, so M sub IJ. 
And if this doesn't make any sense, if this doesn't ring a bell from our lesson on determinants or the last two lessons, it's okay. It's very easy to do. When you see generic notation, sometimes it's a little bit confusing. What this means is, let's first start out by calculating a minor. Okay, to calculate a minor, let's say I want the minor of this guy right here. Well, all I do is I mark out the row and the column. What's left, I take the determinant. In this case, I'm just left with a kind of one by one matrix, just the number three is involved. So the determinant of that is just three, okay? So I can say that if I'm building a minor, my M sub one, one, because it's in the first row, first column, remember I'm taking the minor of that guy right there. Well, that's gonna be equal to three. Now, if I want the cofactor, if I want C sub one, one, well then I just multiply by negative one raised to the power of the row plus the column. So we know this is row one, row two, this is column one and column two. So if it's row one, column one, one plus one is two. If I take negative one and raise it to an even power, it's positive one. So there's no sign change. So in this case, the minor and the cofactor are the same. Let me erase this, we don't really need this anymore. And let's just say the cofactor C sub one, one is three. And I'm just gonna put a capital letter C to be my matrix of cofactors. And the first one up here is gonna be a three, okay? So let's put that in. And now I wanna find C sub one, two, okay? So the first thing I look at when I look at this, is I say, okay, this is row one, column two, okay? So one plus two is three. I know that three is an odd number. So whatever I get for the minor, I wanna make it negative. And you can go through and do that and apply your signs before you start. A lot of people like to have a table of signs just to refer to so that they don't have to go through this each time. Okay, so we have C sub one, two, and again, this is equal to negative of the minor. Okay, and the minor will be found by what? Let me put that zero back in. We would look at this guy right here in row one, column two. I would mark out the row. I would mark out the column. What's left, it's a negative one. So the negative of negative one is what you're gonna have there. And I put a negative out in front, but I can just erase that now because I have the negative of negative one, which would be one. All right, so let's look at the other two entries. So moving into this bottom row, you're gonna have your row number as two, your column number as one. So C sub two, one, okay? And so two plus one is three, that's an odd number. So we know this is gonna be negative. And again, if I mark out the column in the row, what's left, it's the number one, okay? So it's just negative one there. So C sub two, one would be negative one. And then lastly, I want C sub two, two, so let me erase all this and let me highlight this guy. So that's what I want. Two plus two is four. Again, negative one to the power of four, negative one to, the, to an even power is positive one. So we don't need to change the sign. Whatever the minor is, that's what we're gonna keep. Mark out the row, mark out the column, you get zero. So that's what we have there, okay? And I can just erase this, I don't even need it. So that's my matrix of cofactors. Now I'm not done, I don't have my adjoint yet because what I need to do, so C, and then I'm gonna put a T up here, is going to be equal to, remember to find the transpose of a matrix, I've gotta take the kind of rows and interchange them with the columns. And all that means is that I would take this first row here, and it would become my first column here. So three, one would go like this, you would have three, one. That would now be my column. It was a row, now it's a column. And then for this guy, negative one, zero, it would now be negative one, zero. It would be a column there. So this is my transpose of C, which is my adjoint of A. So we found the adjoint of A, and that's equal to this guy right here, which is three, negative one, one, and zero. Now, remember the formula. Let me just go back up. It's one over the determinant of A. In this case, the determinant of A is one times the adjoint of A. Now, if we go back, the adjoint of A is this. So if I just copy this real quick, I'm just gonna copy it and go back up and I'm just gonna paste this in and you'll see that we got the same thing. The adjoint of A here is three, negative one, one, zero, three, negative one, one, zero. So because I don't have to multiply by anything because the determinant is one, so one over one is one, it just becomes this guy by itself. But normally it doesn't work out that way. In this case, we just happen to have an easy example. So again, we could say A inverse is this guy right here. So let's go ahead and look at a harder example now. So we're gonna have this matrix A, it's gonna be a three by three matrix. We're gonna use the same procedure. Unfortunately, there's no shortcut for this. You just have to kind of grind through the work. 
So we know we need to find the determinant of a, and we need to find the adjoint of a, and then we're gonna multiply kind of one over the determinant of a by the adjoint of a. So let's just start out by finding the kind of cofactor matrix. I think that's the one that takes the longest. So let's go through and figure this out. So if I start with this one, first off, let me just go through and get the signs so we can just take care of that right away. You already know that these alternate in signs. So this is row one, column one. So it's a plus. Then as you move, it's row one, column two. So this is a minus, right? The signs are gonna alternate. So this is plus, this is minus, plus, minus, and this is plus, minus, plus, okay? So this is what we're gonna have. When I get the minor, I'm just gonna apply the sign and I'll erase this, okay? That's one thing you can do to just kind of speed things up. There's a lot of kind of tricks out there, but that's a good one that you can use. So if I want the kind of cofactor for this one right here, I would delete the row and the column, and I would take the determinant of what's left. So this is what's left. So we would multiply down here, negative one times negative one is positive one. And then minus, I would do four times negative two, which is going to be negative eight. So one minus a negative eight is going to be one plus eight, which is nine. So again, it's positive. So I'm not gonna change the sign. So it's just nine. All right, let's move on now. So for the next one, let's just go to this one. If I, again, highlight this row and this column, what's left, I'm gonna have four, negative two, negative two, and negative one. And I'm gonna write this out here because it's kind of hard to see. So again, if you want the determinant of that, four times negative one is going to be negative four, and then minus, negative two times negative two is positive four, negative four minus four is going to be negative eight. Now, when you put this up here, remember you gotta change the sign. So this is minus a negative eight, which is going to be positive eight. All right, let's move on now. So the next one is this guy right here. Again, delete the column and the row. What am I left with? I want the determinant of this, four times four is 16, minus negative one times negative two is positive two. 16 minus two is 14. Again, I don't need to change the sign here because that's already a plus. All right, let's erase this. And let's move on to this one right here. So I wanna delete this row and I wanna delete this column. So what's left? And let me write this one out because it's a little hard to see. So negative three, one, four, and negative one. So I want the determinant of that. Negative three times negative one is three. Four times one is four. So three minus four is negative one. And of course, in this particular case, we're changing the sign, right? We have minus the negative one. So this will be plus one. So now let's move on to the next one. So we have this one now. And so I'm going to delete this column and this row. So what's left? Again, I'm gonna write this out because it's kind of hard to see. So you have one and you have one. You have negative two and negative one. So if I take the determinant of this, one times negative one is negative one, and then minus, if you do negative two times one, it's going to be negative two. So negative one minus a negative two is the same thing as negative one plus two which is positive one. So again, there's no sign change here. So I'm just gonna put this as positive one. So now we want this guy right here. So I'm gonna delete this column and this row. So what I have is one, negative three, negative two, and four. Again, if I want the determinant of this, one times four is four minus, negative three times negative two is six, four minus six is negative two, but I've got a negative here, so I've gotta change the sign. So this becomes positive two. All right, let's move to the kind of final row. And so what we wanna do here is we wanna delete this row and this column. So what am I left with? I'm left with this matrix here. So negative three times negative two is six, and then minus one times negative one is negative one. Six minus a negative one is the same thing as six plus one, which is seven. There's no sign change there, so let's just put a seven. All right, just two more. And I know this gets very tedious, but sometimes it's faster, sometimes it's not. So let's put this guy and we'll kind of highlight this column and this row. So the matrix that's left is a one and a four in the first column and a one and a negative two in the second one. So let's go ahead and say one times negative two is negative two minus one times four is four. Negative two minus four is negative six. You've got a negative there, so you've got to change the sign. So this would be positive six. All right, one more of these, not too bad. So I want this one. So again, I'm gonna highlight this column and this row. If I deleted that, this is the matrix that's left. So one times negative one is negative one. 
then minus negative 3 times 4 is negative 12. Again, negative 1 minus a negative 12 is negative 1 plus 12, which is 11. So there's no sign change here, so I'm just going to put an 11 in. So now I have my cofactor matrix, okay? And when I take the transpose of this guy, that's the adjoint of A. So C, and then I'm going to put a T up here, a superscript T, okay? And that's equal to, again, you take the row and you make it into the column. So row 1 becomes column 1. So I'm going to write that we have 9, 8, and 14 for the first column because it was the first row. The second row becomes the second column. So 1, 1, and 2. 1, 1, and 2. And then the third row becomes the third column. So 7, 6, and 11. So now we have this guy. So I can erase this. I don't even need it anymore. And I can say that the adjoint of A is going to be equal to this guy right here. So we have our 9, our 8, and our 14. We have our 1, our 1, and our 2. We have our 7, our 6, and our 11. Okay, so that's my adjoint of A. Now, the other thing I need is the determinant of A because I have to take this guy and multiply it by 1 over the determinant, or you could say I could take this guy and divide it by the determinant, however you want to think about that. So the fast way to get the determinant, let me kind of scooch this out of the way, we want to copy the first two columns. So 1, 4, and negative 2, and then negative 3, negative 1, and 4. So let me multiply down. 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 would be 1. Then plus, you'd multiply down again. Negative 3 times negative 2 times negative 2. We know that's going to be negative, okay? 3 times 2 is 6, times 2 again is 12. And then you're going to multiply down one more time. 1 times 4 times 4 is going to be 16. So let me just find the sum real quick. We know 16 plus negative 12 is 4. 4 plus 1 is 5. So the first part of this formula is 5. And then you're subtracting away the second part of this formula, so you use brackets or parentheses, something to let you know that you need to kind of make sure you respect that sign. So now I'm going to start at the bottom left and go up. So negative 2 times negative 1 times 1 is going to be positive 2. Then plus, we have 4 times negative 2 times 1. That's going to be negative 8. Then lastly, plus. Negative 1 times 4 times negative 3. We know that's positive, and it's basically just 4 times 3, which is 12. So inside here, 2 plus negative 8 is negative 6. Negative 6 plus 12 is positive 6. So you would have 5 minus 6, which is negative 1. So that's going to be your determinant. Okay, that's going to be negative 1. So the determinant of A is equal to negative 1. So now we're ready to find the inverse. Again, the formula, let me just show you one more time. A inverse is equal to 1 over the determinant of A times the adjoint of A. So if I know this is negative 1, 1 over negative 1 is just negative 1, right? So really all I have to do is say I'm going to take this guy right here and I'm going to multiply everything by negative 1 because that's all you're really doing. So I can say that A inverse is equal to, I'm just multiplying this guy by negative 1, multiplying by a scalar. So every entry, I'm just going to put a negative in front of it. They're all positive, so they'll all become negative. So negative 9, negative 1, and negative 7. You have negative 8. You have negative 1 and negative 6. And then you have negative 14. You have negative 2 and negative 11. So that is your inverse of A. Again, is it quicker than if we had used kind of row operations? Maybe, maybe not, depending on how fast you are at that. I'm kind of quicker at using row operations. The times I go through it with you, I go slow. When I use row operations, I can usually go pretty quickly. So for me, this method is a little bit more time consuming, but not by a great deal. So just another method you can use. All right, so suppose we have matrix A. And again, we want to find the inverse of this matrix kind of using this new method. So again, you've got to find the determinant of A and you've got to find the adjoint of A. Whichever one you want to do first is fine. Last time we found the adjoint first, I think that's a little bit harder to do. So let's just do that first again. So I'm going to start by finding a matrix of cofactors. So again, the signs, if you think about it, they start out in this one as positive, right? Because it would be negative 1 raised to the power of, you have row 1, column 1. 1 plus 1 is 2, that's even. Then it alternates. So this would be minus, this would be plus, this would be minus, this would be plus, this would be minus, this would be plus, minus, plus. If you could just remember that this one's plus and that they alternate going this way and this way, 
you're good to go, right? Because you basically go plus, minus, plus. Then when you come down here, you know it's minus, plus, minus. Then when you come down here, you know it's plus, minus, plus. Again, it's not hard to do because you're just looking at the row number and the column number. You sum those numbers, okay? And if that result is even, it's going to be a plus because negative 1 to an even power is going to give you a positive 1. If that result is kind of odd, then we know it's going to be negative or negative 1 because negative 1 to an odd power is negative 1. All right, so with that being said, let's find the minors, apply the sign changes. That's going to give us the kind of cofactors. And then we'll find the transpose. And from there, we'll have our adjoint. So the first thing is we're going to start right here. I'm going to mark out that and that, right? The row and the column. I'm left with this guy right here. So I find the determinant. 3 times negative 3 is negative 9. Minus 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. Negative 9 minus a negative 1 is negative 9 plus 1, which is negative 8. There's no sign change applied, so this is just negative 8. All right, now we move to this one. So again, I'm going to mark out this column and this row. And what's left? And you can write this one out because these are kind of hard to see. So 0, 4, 1, and negative 3. We want the determinant of this. 0 times negative 3 is 0. Then minus 1 times 4 is 4. 0 minus 4 is negative 4. There's a sign change there because there's a negative. So let's just say this is positive 4. Okay. So let's go ahead and go to the next one now. So again, if I go on this one, I'm marking out this column. I'm marking out this row. So what's left is this guy right here. 0 times negative 1 is obviously 0. Then minus 3 times 4 is 12. So this is negative 12. There's no sign change. So negative 12. All right, let's move down to the second row now. So I'm going to mark out this row and this column. And what's left? You'll have negative 4, negative 3, negative 1, and negative 3. Let's find the determinant of that guy. Negative 4 times negative 3 is 12. Then minus negative 3 times negative 1 is 3. 12 minus 3 is 9. We're going to put a negative on that because, again, there's a sign change there. So this would be a negative 9. And so I'm here now. So I'm going to delete this row and this column. Let me write this one out again. So you have 4 and 4, negative 3 and negative 3. So we want the determinant of that. 4 times negative 3 is negative 12. Minus negative 3 times 4 is negative 12. We know that minus a negative is plus a positive. So negative 12 plus 12 is 0. So this guy is going to be 0. And of course, you don't put a plus or minus with 0. It's just 0. So now I'm going to move to this guy. So I'm going to highlight this row and this column. So I'd want the determinant of this matrix. So we have 4 and negative 4, and then 4 and negative 1. So 4 times negative 1 is negative 4, and then minus negative 4 times 4 is going to be negative 16. We know minus a negative again, again, again is plus a positive. So this is negative 4 plus 16, which is going to give me 12. Now we have a sign change here, so I'm going to put this as negative 12. So now we're going to start with this one. So I'm going to highlight this row and this column. So the matrix that's formed is this guy right here. So negative 4 times 1 is negative 4. And then minus negative 3 times 3 is negative 9. Again, minus the negative is plus a positive. Negative 4 plus 9 is going to give me 5. So no sign change here. This is just going to be 5. All right, let's erase this. Two more to do. So now I have this guy right here. So I'm going to highlight this column and this row. And what do we see? We see that we would have 4 and 0 and then negative 3 and 1. So if I take the determinant of this guy, 4 times 1 is 4, then minus negative 3 times 0 is 0, so this is just 4. But then I want to apply that sign change, so this is going to be negative 4. All right, then lastly, let me kind of erase this. We have this guy right here, so it's this column and this row that I'm going to block out. And the determinant here, 4 times 3 is 12, and then minus negative 4 times 0 is 0, so this is 12. And there's no sign change here. So this is just 12. All right, so we have our matrix of cofactors now. And what we want to do is find the transpose of this. So C, and then we're going to put that superscript T up here. And this equals, again, this is very easy to do. Take the first row, make it the first column. So you have negative 8, 4, and negative 12. Take the second row, make it the second column. So you have negative 9, 0, and negative 12. Take the third row, make it the third column. So 5, negative 4, and 12. So this is your transpose of the cofactor matrix, which is the adjoint of A. So let's put that the kind of adjoint of A is equal to this guy right here. So let me kind of slide this down so I have some room. 
And let me just rewrite this. So it's negative 8, negative 9, and 5. We have 4, 0, and negative 4. And we have negative 12, negative 12 again, and positive 12. Okay. Put my brackets around this. And I'm just going to erase this at this point. I don't need it anymore. And I'll just kind of drag this down here. So now let's find the determinant. So we have 4, 0, and 4. Again, I'm copying the first two columns. Negative 4, 3, and negative 1. I'm going to start by multiplying down this diagonal. 4 times 3 times negative 3 is the same thing as 4 times negative 9, which is negative 36. So that's the first part here. Then plus, we're going to go down this diagonal. Negative 4 times 1 times 4 is going to be negative 16. Then plus... We're going to go down this diagonal. Notice there's a zero in the multiplication, so you don't even need to do that because it's going to be zero. So what's negative 36 plus negative 16? That's going to give me negative 52. So we'll have negative 52 minus, again, I'm going to put some brackets there so I don't make a sign mistake. So what I want to do now is just start here and multiply up. So 4 times 3 times negative 3 is, again, 4 times negative 9, which is negative 36. And then plus you would do negative one times one times four. That's just gonna change the sign of four, so it would be negative four. And then this one, you know you have a zero involved, so you can just leave that off. Zero times anything is always zero. So negative 36 plus negative four is negative 40, okay? So what we see here is we have minus a negative. So this is gonna be negative 52 plus 40, which is negative 12. So that's my determinant for A. So let's erase all of this, and we'll say that the determinant of A is equal to negative 12. Now, the formula tells us that A inverse is equal to 1 over the determinant of A, which in this case is negative 12, times the adjoint of A, okay, which we have down there. So let's go back. So basically what I'm going to do is just take 1 over negative 12 and multiply by each term here. That's how I'm going to get my inverse. So let me erase this and say A inverse is equal to, and let me just erase this notation. We don't really need it. We'll say this is negative 1 over 12. Again, this is just multiplying by a scalar. So everything in here is going to get multiplied by negative 1 over 12. So let's start out with negative 8 over negative 12. And we know that this would be positive, and 8 divided by 4 would be 2. 12 divided by 4 would be 3. So the first entry is going to be 2 thirds. Let me erase that. So then moving over here, I'd have negative 9 over negative 12. And so everything there is divisible by 3. So this divided by 3 would be 3. This divided by 3 would be 4. Of course, negative over negative is positive. So the second entry would be 3 fourths. Then when I look at 5, there's nothing really to simplify. It would just be negative 5 twelfths. So negative 5 twelfths. So let's move on to this next row. So you have 4, 0, and negative 4. So let's figure out 4 first. So 4 over negative 12. We know each is divisible by 4. 4 divided by 4 is 1. 12 divided by 4 is 3. So this would be negative 1 third. Let me erase this so it'll fit. So again, negative 1 third. We know 0 would be unchanged because 0 times negative 1 12th is still 0. And then this guy is just going to be different by the sign, right? It's the same thing as this. It'd just be positive 1 third. So looking at this final row here, we have negative 12, negative 12, and 12. Well, we know that negative 1 12 times negative 12 would just be 1. And you have that again here. And then for this one, it would just be negative 1, right? Because basically, if you had 12 times negative 1 12, of course, these cancel and give you 1, but you still have the negative, so it's negative 1. So this is going to be the inverse of A. Again, it can be faster to do it this way or it might not, just depending on your kind of speed of doing kind of row operations. But I will say that this is another tool that you can use to find the inverse of a matrix. In this lesson, we want to talk about Kramer's rule for a two by two linear system. All right, so up to this point in our course, we've learned kind of a variety of methods that can be used to solve linear systems with kind of these matrices that we've set up. But probably the best or the quickest method that we can use is known as kind of Kramer's rule, okay? So not in every scenario, but in most scenarios, this will be true. So what I want to do today is just show you Kramer's rule. I'll show you how easy and effective it is. And then at the end of the lesson, I'll show you where this comes from. A lot of students will kind of read how it's derived in their book and get a little bit lost because you use a lot of generic notation. So I'll take the time to show you where it comes from at the end of the lesson for those of you who want to see that. 
So I'm just going to start out today with a simple system. We have two variables and we have two equations, right? So we have this negative 6x plus y equals 19, this negative 3x minus 2y equals 7. So again, the very first thing you want to do is put the equations in standard form. Okay, so that's something that we've been doing for a while now. So the ax plus by equals c, and a, b, and c could just be any real number that you want them to be, okay? So after that, you're going to start out by making a kind of matrix. So the matrix is just going to contain the coefficients for the system. Your book's going to call this capital letter D. Okay, so this is going to be equal to, and we're going to be looking for the determinant of this matrix. So we're going to be putting our kind of vertical bars here. So I'm going to take my negative 6, which is the coefficient for x. This has an implied coefficient of 1. This has a coefficient of negative 3, and this has a coefficient of negative 2. Okay, so notice how everything is in order. So I have my negative 6 and my negative 3 on the left, right? Those are the coefficients for x. I have my 1 and my negative 2 on the right, okay? Those are my coefficients for y. So you've got to make sure that you set this up correctly, and that's why it's important to put this in standard form. All I need to do, let me just kind of drag this over here. We're going to say d, okay, and then sub x, and this is going to be a determinant, okay, of this matrix we're going to form. So again, I'm going to use my vertical bars. What you do is you think about the columns you've set up. So this is for the x's, right, the coefficients, and this is for the y's, right, the coefficients. So I'm going to replace, if this is an x, I'm going to replace the column with the x's, those coefficients, with these constants, okay? So I'm going to put a 19 here and a 7 here. Okay, and then the y's, those coefficients stay the same. So a one and a negative two. And if the first time you see that, you're like, how am I gonna remember that? Just trust me, after you do this a few times, it's really, really quick and easy. Then similarly, if I do this kind of D sub Y, okay, it's gonna be the determinant of this kind of matrix we're gonna set up. It's the same thing. So the X's will now stay. So negative six and negative three. So you're gonna take the coefficients from that Y variable, okay, so the one and the negative two, replace it with the constants, so 19 and then seven, okay? So what we wanna do at this point is kinda of calculate these three. So let me copy these. I'm gonna to go to a fresh sheet, and then I'll give you the actual formula, which is really easy. So I'll paste this in, and let's just do this one at a time. So for my capital letter D, what's, what's the determinant? What is D equal to? So to calculate D, which again is the determinant of this guy, D is gonna be equal to, you're gonna multiply down, so negative six times negative two is 12, then you're gonna subtract away. You can multiply up or you can go down, it doesn't matter. Negative three times one is negative three. So we all know at this point that minus a negative three is plus a positive three. So this is 12 plus three, which is 15. Okay, so that's my value for D. Let me go back up and I'm gonna erase this now and I'm just gonna put that the value is 15. Okay, because we're gonna use that in a moment. Now let me calculate this D sub Y and this D sub X. So let's go back and I'm just gonna erase this because I don't really need it anymore. Okay, and I'm gonna erase this, I don't need it anymore. So for this guy, let me just kind of drag this over here. My D sub X, again, I'm going to multiply down. 19 times negative two is negative 38. And then minus seven times one, if I go up, that's seven. So negative 38 minus seven would be negative 45. Okay, so let me go back up. And my D sub X would be negative 45. Okay, and let me just kind of drag this over here so that everything's kind of in line. And now I need my D sub Y. Okay, so let me go down here. We'll erase this, we don't need it anymore. My D sub Y, again, I'm just gonna multiply down. Negative six times seven is negative 42. And then minus negative three times 19 is negative 57. So remember, minus a negative is plus a positive. So this is negative 42 plus 57, which is going to give me 15. Okay, so that's the value of D sub Y. All right, so let's go back up and I'll show you how easy this is now. So D sub Y is 15. Okay, so you can get your solution once you have these kind of values calculated, these determinants. So your X will be equal to you're going to take your D sub X, so this always matches this here, okay, over your D, okay? And then if you want your Y, it's equal to your D sub Y. Again, this always matches this right here over your D, okay? So it's very simple, very easy. We already know that D sub X is negative 45, okay? And we already know that D is 15, okay? And then for D sub Y, we already know that that is 15, and we know that D is 15, so that tells me that x is negative 3. Negative 45 divided by 15 is negative 3. 
and that tells me that y is 1. So really quick overall, and let's check this. So negative 3 comma 1 would be our ordered pair solution. So negative 3 comma 1. We don't need this anymore. Let's get rid of it. And let's plug in. So negative 6 times negative 3 would be 18. Then plus, we'd have 1 times 1, which is just 1. And this equals 19. Of course, it does. That works. Then the next one we have negative 3 times negative 3, which is 9. Then minus, you have 2 times 1, which is just 2. This equals 7. And of course, it does. So really, really easy to kind of calculate this, especially with the 2 by 2. When you get into a 3 by 3, obviously, it's harder to find a determinant, but we have the shortcut for that, so it's not that bad. But if you start getting into a 4 by 4 or 5 by 5, no matter what you do, those are kind of hard systems to solve. Let's look at another example. All right, so for this one, we have 5x minus 3y equals negative 5. And we have 2x minus 6y equals negative 26. So again, it takes you a few times to kind of remember what's going on. The first thing is to make sure the equations are set up in standard form. Okay, again, if you don't do that, you're going to not set up the correct matrices and you're going to end up with the wrong answer. Okay, so once that's done, which it's already done for us here, okay, we want to set up our capital letter D, okay, and that's the determinant of the kind of coefficients from your system setting up that matrix. So you would have five and you would have two. Again, these kind of coefficients correspond to that X variable, right? The X's. And then for the Y's, again, you're grabbing these. So you have negative three and you have negative six. Okay. So you take the determinant of that. So we can go ahead and kind of set this up over here, get out of the way. And then you want to have your D sub X. Again, how do we find that? Well, we look at the column where the coefficients from the X variable came from. So that's the five and the two. And we replace it with the constants in the system. So this guy and this guy. Okay. So you're going to say that you have your negative five and your negative 26 there. And then this part stays the same. So the negative three and the negative six, those don't change. And then for your D sub Y, again, it's the same thought process, but now you're taking the column with the Y coefficients, right? The negative three and the negative six, you're replacing them with the constants. So the X part stays the same, the five and the two, and then these get switched. So it's going to be a negative five and a negative 26. Okay. And again, the first few times you do this, it is a little bit confusing. It takes a little while to kind of remember what's going on. But after you do it a few times, it becomes something you just commit to memory. OK, so let's copy these just as we did before. And let's go to another sheet and I'm just going to paste these in. We'll calculate the values real quick and then we'll use them to get our solution. So for this one, for capital letter D, this is equal to what? Five times negative six is negative 30 and then minus you have negative three times two, which is negative six minus the negative six is plus six. So this would be negative 24. OK, negative 24. Let's erase this, and now let's do this one. So it multiply going down, negative five times negative six is positive 30, and then minus negative 26 times negative three is positive 78. 30 minus 78 is negative 48. So this is negative 48. So let's erase this and just say this is negative 48. And let's erase this. So now five times negative 26 is negative 130. And then minus, if we go up, two times negative five is negative 10. Again, minus a negative 10 would be plus 10. So this would be negative 120. Okay. So negative 120. So let me drag this over here. And let me kind of drag this down. And we'll just copy these and we'll bring them to the next sheet. Okay. So we don't need any of these things anymore. We'll just erase all of it. Again, once you've calculated your determinants, you set everything up and calculated it, you don't need that stuff anymore. We just need the values from them. Because again, if I want the solution for X, it's what? It's D sub X. It's always this guy matches this notation here. So D sub X over your D, okay? This guy's always in the denominator, okay? And then for Y, it's what? It's D sub Y over D, okay? So again, you do this a few times, it becomes very easy. D sub X is negative 48 and D, okay, is going to be negative 24. Obviously that's positive two. And then D sub Y is negative 120. And then D is negative 24. And that's going to give us positive five. Okay. So the solution here is two comma five. So let's erase this now and we'll check it real quick. It's always good to check things when you're first starting out because Again, you might make some silly mistake and then you turn in your test and you got it wrong and it's something you could prevent, right? Just by checking. So five times two is 10 and then minus three times five is 15. Does this equal negative five? Yes, it does. 
2 times 2 is 4, then minus 6 times 5 is 30. Is this equal to negative 26? Yes, it is. Okay, so 2 comma 5 is the correct kind of ordered pair solution. Again, x is 2, y is 5. All right, let's look at one more of these, and then I want to talk to you about what happens for like a special case scenario. What if you have no solution or an infinite number of solutions? What do you do there? And then I'll go through the process of kind of deriving the formula for you. Okay, so what we have here is x plus 2y equals 7 and negative 2x minus 7y equals negative 35. Again, everything's in standard form already, so we don't need to do anything there. We just want to set up our, again, capital letter D. It's the determinant of, again, take the coefficients. So you have 1, you have 2, you have negative 2, and you have negative 7. Again, this is for the x's, this is for the y's. Okay, you've got to know where kind of everything is because you're going to be replacing stuff. So when I do my d sub x, again, what I do is I replace the column with the kind of coefficients for x with the constants. So 7 and then negative 35. Okay, I just grab that from there. And then I'm going to keep my y kind of coefficients the same. So my 2 and my negative 7, there's no change there. Okay, and then for d sub y, it's the same thought process. But now I take these y coefficients and I swap them with the kind of constants in the system. So you're going to have your 1 and your negative 2. You know, from the x's, that's going to stay the same. And then this part right here is going to change. It's going to be the 7 and the negative 35, okay? So now that we have this, again, let's just calculate these determinants. And I'll just paste this in right here real quick. And this was a D. It didn't copy, but we can just write it. All right, so for our kind of determinant for this D, we have 1 times negative 7, which is negative 7, minus you have negative 2 times 2, which is negative 4. Again, minus the negative 4 is plus 4. So this is negative 7 plus 4, which is negative 3. Okay, so this is negative 3. And then the next one we want to do, let's do d sub x. So 7 times negative 7 is negative 49. Then minus, you've got 2 times negative 35, which is negative 70. Again, 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 minus the negative is plus a positive. So negative 49 plus 70, which is going to give us 21. Okay, so this is going to be 21. Okay, and then let's find d sub y. So d sub y, we're going to go 1 times negative 35, which is negative 35, minus, you have negative 2 times 7, which is negative 14, right? Minus the negative is plus positive. So you have negative 35 plus 14, which equals negative 21. Okay, so let's erase all of this, and we'll put negative 21 here. And let me just kind of line these up, and then we'll go back, we'll kick our formula off, and we'll have our solution really quickly. So let's go up, and we'll erase all this. We don't need any of it anymore. Again, once you've calculated all those determinants, you're done with that information. Okay, so let's just paste this in. We have the values. And so we can say that, again, x is what? It's d sub x. Okay, that part matches over d. d is always in the denominator. Then for y, it's what? It's d sub y over d. So d sub x, we know is 21. And d, we know is negative 3. Okay, so this is going to be negative 7, right? 21 divided by negative 3 is negative 7. Then for d sub y, it's negative 21, okay? And this is over d, which is negative 3. So this is going to be positive 7. So the solution here is that x is negative 7 and y is positive 7 or the ordered pair negative 7 comma 7. All right, so let's go ahead and check this. It's always good to check stuff, just in case, again, you made a silly mistake. So for the first one, you'd have negative 7 plus 2 times 7, which is 14, equals 7, which is true, right? So this one works. For the second one, you'd have negative 2 times negative 7, which is 14, minus 7 times 7, which is 49, equals negative 35. That's true as well. All right, so let's take a little bit of time and talk about the scenario where you have kind of a special case scenario, right? So you have an infinite number of solutions or you have an inconsistent system, meaning you don't have a solution at all. So you won't be able to use Kramer's rule to kind of identify which scenario you have, okay? Unfortunately, what's going to happen is you're going to have that kind of capital letter D, that determinant for that matrix you set up with the coefficients, is going to end up being zero. OK, so let's go ahead and see that real quick. Everything's already in standard form. If I set up my D, OK, again, this is the determinant of we have our four and our negative two, just grabbing the coefficients and then our six and our negative three. If we multiply down four times negative three is negative 12 and then minus if you do negative two times six, that's negative 12 as well. 
minus a negative is plus a positive, so you might as well just say this is plus 12, which is zero. Okay, so why is that a problem? Let's think about the formula one more time. If this is zero, well, when I try to find x, it's d sub x, whatever that is, over d. Well, d is zero, I can't divide by zero, that's undefined, okay? So once you see that, you've gotta stop and say, okay, I'm dealing with a special case scenario, and I can't use Kramer's rule to kind of identify which one it is. Do we have an inconsistent system, meaning there's no solution, or do I have an infinite number of solutions? I can't figure that out with Kramer's rule, so I've got to use some other method, right? I can use kind of Gaussian elimination or Gauss-Jordan elimination if I want to do kind of matrix methods, or I can go through and just kind of use simple substitution or elimination or whatever you want to do. In this particular case, I would probably just use elimination, right? I would multiply this first equation by, let's say, positive 3, so that would give me 12x minus 6y is equal to negative 60. And then the second equation, I would multiply it by negative 2. So that would give me negative 12x. That would give me positive or plus 6y. And that would be equal to negative 36. Now looking at this, we don't need to go any further. We can just say there's no solution, right? That's very obvious that there's no solution. Because again, if you go through this, this is gonna cancel and become zero. It's equal to something that's not gonna be zero. Okay, so you know it's not going to have a solution. Negative 60 minus 36 would be negative 96. But again, because this ends up being a false statement, okay, you can say there's no solution. If you go through this and it ends up being a true statement, you know there's an infinite number of solutions. All right, so what I wanna do now is just kind of wrap up the lesson and show you where this kind of Kramer's rule comes from. It's very easy to do. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing because although it's easy to do, it is a little bit tedious and time consuming. So I'm just gonna show you where we get that x is equal to that d sub x over d, okay, where that comes from. And to do that, I wanna start out by just talking about the setup in general. So you have two equations. Let's just label this top one as equation one and this bottom one as equation two. You'll notice that this system just contains x and y, and each equation is already written in standard form for us, okay? Now, the coefficients look a little bit weird. You have a sub 1 and a sub 2 as the coefficients for x. What we're doing here is we're saying, hey, this is just something generic. We don't have numbers involved, so we're using a as a stand-in. And to kind of tell the difference between this coefficient here in the first equation and this coefficient here in the second equation, we have the a sub 1 and the a sub 2. Okay, so that's what that notation is for. Similarly, you have the b sub 1 and b sub 2 as the coefficients for y. And then c sub 1 and c sub 2, those are your constants, okay? So let's start out, before we even get into anything, let's just write what we know. And we'll compare it to how we could get a general solution. So we know already that d, okay, is equal to the determinant of, if I set up a matrix of just the coefficients. So in this case, everything's already in standard form, so I'd want my a sub one, my b sub one, my a sub two, and my b sub two, okay? So that's my capital letter D, that's this matrix here, and again, I'm taking the determinant of that. And if you wanted to make this super clear for you, remember, this leftmost column corresponds to the kind of coefficients for the x variables. So that's why I'm putting x's. And then this is going to be for the y's. These are the coefficients for the y variable. And so you want to make sure you know what's going on with that because when you do your d sub x, remember what you want to do, since this is sub x, I take this column that has the coefficients for the x's and I replace it with the constants. So what I would want here is c sub 1 and c sub 2. And then this part would stay the same. So b sub 1 and b sub 2. And then similarly, if we do d sub y, then what? I'm gonna replace the column with the coefficients for y with the constants. So c sub one and c sub two goes there. And then on the left, it's the same as over here. So a sub one and a sub two. So generally speaking, if you are setting these things up, again, if you have d sub x, you just take d and you take the column with this guy in it, so the coefficients for that variable, and you replace it with the constants, okay? And so the same thing, for d sub y, I take the column with the coefficients for that kind of variable, in this case, again, it's y, so I take that and I replace it with the constants. So very easy to remember once you do this a few times. Let me copy this real fast. I'm gonna bring it to another sheet. And let me put this over here. I'm just gonna paste this in. And really quickly, I'm just gonna drag this over here. And generically, we wanna say that this is equal to what? This is a sub one times b sub two. Again, I'm just multiplying down. And then minus, if I multiply up, I'll do a sub two 
times my b sub 1, okay? And this is equal to what? It's equal to c sub 1 times b sub 2, and then minus, you're going to do c sub 2 times b sub 1. And then lastly, this one's equal to a sub 1 times c sub 2, and then minus, you're going to have your a sub 2 times your c sub 1. So this is our value for d, this is our value for d sub x, and this is our value for d sub y. Okay, so we have that. Let me go to another sheet. So I just want to write really quickly that x is equal to d sub x over d, and y is equal to d sub y over d. Now I'm not going to show the y one, I'm just going to do the x one, okay? But you can do the y one on your own, so you can kind of continue this process. So if we go back, and I'm just going to copy this real fast. And trust me, once we get to the other parts, this is going to go really quickly. So let me paste this in. So this is D in each case. So let me put equals here. And let me put equals here. Let me kind of paste this in. And all I'm doing is I'm just pasting in a value for D. We already figured that out, that it was A sub 1 times B sub 2 minus A sub 2 times B sub 1. Okay? Then for D sub X, I can grab that from here. Let me copy that. And I will paste that in and just get rid of that extra equal sign, that's not necessary. And then let's go back up, and we'll grab this d sub y, okay, copy that. And we'll come back down and paste this in. Okay, so now we're gonna come back to this in a moment. I'm gonna, again, show you how you can get this result. So let's go up. Let's say I wanted to solve this using elimination, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to eliminate the variable y. Again, you could use a similar thought process to eliminate x and kind of go through the other scenario. I'm only going to do one, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first start out by multiplying equation 1 by b sub 2. So that would be a sub 1 times b sub 2, then times my x, then plus I would have b sub 1 times b sub 2, then times my y, and this equals c sub 1 times b sub 2. So all I did was I multiplied equation 1 by b sub 2. So every term has a factor of b sub 2, okay? So now, what I'd want to do, again, if I'm trying to eliminate the y variable, I want this to be the opposite of this, so negative b sub 1 times b sub 2 times y. So how could I accomplish that? Well, I would multiply equation 2 by negative b sub 1. So this one right here would be negative a sub 2, times b sub 1 times x, okay? So again, I'm just multiplying by negative b sub 1. That's what I did there. This is already done, so you can skip that. And then it's equal to, it's going to be negative c sub 2 times the b sub 1, okay? So now, if I use my elimination process, we know on the left sides, if I add those together, this is going to be gone, okay? So all I'm going to have, let me kind of scroll down so we have enough room. On the left, I have my a sub 1 times b sub 2 times x, then minus my a sub 2 times my b sub 1 times x, and this equals, you're going to have your c sub 1 times b sub 2 minus your c sub 2 times b sub 1, okay? Now, at this point, it probably looks like a lot of nonsense, but I want you to realize that you can solve for x. You have x here, and you have x here. So to solve for x, we want to factor that out, okay? So if I factor that out inside the parentheses, I'd have what's left. So I'd have that. So a sub 1 times b sub 2, then minus my a sub 2 times b sub 1, okay? That guy right there. And then let's just close the parentheses and say this is equal to c sub 1 times b sub 2 minus c sub 2 times b sub 1, okay? So how can we solve for x? Well, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to divide both sides of the equation by what's multiplying x. And in this case, it's this a sub 1 times b sub 2 minus a sub 2 times b sub 1. Okay, I'm going to do that on both sides. So a sub 1 times b sub 2 minus your a sub 2 times b sub 1. Okay, so notice that this would cancel with this. It's just a complicated form of 1. And I'm left with a solution to say that it's x is equal to your c sub 1 times b sub 2 minus your c sub 2 times b sub 1 over your a sub 1 times b sub 2 minus your a sub 2 times b sub 1, okay? So let's copy this real quick, and let's go back to this page here, and let me paste this in right down here. So I want you to notice something, and what you're going to notice is that this formula right here for x and this is the same. Okay, so you have c sub 1 times b sub 2, c sub 1 times b sub 2, minus c sub 2 times b sub 1, minus c sub 2 times b sub 1. Then down here, it's the same as well. It's the exact same thing. 
So that's where this comes from. You just realize that all you really need to do is find kind of this determinant and this determinant, and basically you found your solution for x, okay? Now, if you wanted to prove this for y, you could do it in the same way. You can go back to the original kind of setup here, and now you would want to make kind of these two terms here opposites. You could eliminate the x variable, and you could solve this guy for y, and all you're going to find is that your solution is this guy right here. Okay, it's just going to turn out that way. So y is equal to your d sub y over d. In this lesson, we want to talk about Kramer's rule for a 3 by 3 linear system. So in the last lesson, we talked about using Kramer's rule to solve a 2 by 2 linear system. Now we're just going to take the next step, and we're going to look at some examples with kind of a 3 by 3 linear system. This is no more difficult. It's just a little bit more tedious, okay, because it takes more time to kind of calculate things. So let's just start out with this example here we have our system. And notice how every equation is already written in standard form for us. Again, this is something that's very important to check, okay? If you have a three variable system, okay, and you have three equations, you wanna make sure every equation is ax plus by plus cz equals t, okay? And you might get different notation. You might have x sub one through x sub three, but you wanna make sure that everything lines up, right? So the x's line up, the y's line up, the z's line up, the constants line up, because when you load information into your kind of matrices, it's gotta make sense, okay? All the columns have to correspond to kind of the same thing, whether it's, you know, the coefficients for x or y or z or the constants, it's all got to line up and make sense, okay? So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started with this problem. The very first thing we want to do, as we saw in kind of the last lesson, we want to set up our kind of D, okay? And this is the determinant of the coefficient matrix. So if I take my coefficients from the system, in the first equation, I'd have negative 3, I'd have 2, and I'd have a negative 1, okay? So that's an implied coefficient of negative 1. So let's just write that in the top. So negative 3, we'd have 2, and then negative 1. And then for my second kind of row here, I'd have a negative one, and you could write that in if you want, okay? Let me make that a little bit better. So again, a negative one, we would have a three and a negative three. So a negative one, a three, and a negative three, okay? Then we're gonna have a negative one again. So let me write that in, so negative one. You're gonna have a two and a negative three. So negative one, two, and negative three. Okay, so this is finding the determinant of the coefficient matrix. Now, we need three other kind of setups like this. We need d sub x, d sub y, and d sub z. So let me kind of write d sub x first. And each time I write one of these, I'm going to go ahead and just move it to another page because we're going to very quickly run out of room. Okay, so d sub x would be equal to what? Well, essentially what I do is I take this guy right here and I take the column where the kind of coefficients correspond to this variable that I'm looking at. So in this case, it's x. You know, if it was y, if it was z, you've got to look at that kind of column that corresponds to the coefficients for that variable. In this case, I'm looking at this guy because this column represents the coefficients for the kind of x variable. What I want to do is I want to replace that column and that column only with the constants of the system. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and put negative 15, negative 9 and negative 13. So I just took these values, put them here, in this place here, okay? And this, the rest of it's going to stay the same. So you have 2, 3, 2, negative 1, negative 3, and negative 3. So that part's the same. And I'm just going to cut this away. I'm going to go to a fresh sheet, and I'm going to paste this in, and I'm going to put that right there. Okay, so that's going to stay there. And we'll come back to this in a little while. Let's get the rest of it going. So I'm going to erase this highlighting here. And now what I want to do is I want to find d sub y. Well, again, it's the same thought process, except now the kind of column that corresponds to the coefficients for the y variable, that's going to be this middle column here. So everything else would be the same. So negative 3, negative 1, and negative 1. Again, this guy is the coefficients for the x variable. This is what's going to change in the middle. So I'm taking the constants. So negative 15, negative 9, and negative 13. Write that in. And then this, this guy right here, the coefficients for the kind of z variable, that's going to stay the same. So negative 1, negative 3, and negative 3. So let me cut this away. And I didn't grab all of it. So let me cut this away. Okay, so let me go back up. So now we just need to find d sub z. Okay, so that's the last one. 
So again, it's the same thought process. So these first two columns will be the same. So negative three, negative one, negative one, two, three, and two. And again, I'm looking at the kind of column here that corresponds to the coefficients for this variable, okay? So I'm gonna replace this with the constants of the system. It's just that easy. So negative 15, negative nine, and negative 13, okay? So let me copy this and get rid of it from here. And let me paste that in. So each one has its own page, okay? So let me go back up. And the very first thing we wanna do is copy this and figure out what this kind of D is gonna be equal to. So let's calculate the determinant of this first because it's gonna be used in every formula. And again, if you don't remember that, I'll talk about that in a second. But the first thing is we need to calculate the value of D, okay? So I'm going to use the shortcut here. I'm going to copy the first two columns. So negative three, negative one, negative one. We have two, we have three, and we have two, okay? So what I want to do is multiply going down first. So I wanna start here and I wanna multiply down. So you'd have negative three times three times negative three. So you know that would be positive. And three cubed is 27. So I would say this is 27, then plus. I'm gonna multiply down this diagonal here. So two times negative three times negative one. That's going to be six, then plus. I'm gonna multiply down this diagonal. Negative one times negative one times two is two, okay? So I'm gonna put some brackets around that or you can do the operation now if you want. But basically you're gonna subtract away put some brackets around this. Now I'm gonna multiply up. So this is getting kind of busy to where we can't see stuff. So let me erase these arrows and we'll get rid of that so we can see what's going on. So negative one times three times negative one is going to be positive three, okay? Then plus, we're gonna go up. Two times negative three times negative three. I know that would be nine times two, which is 18. Then plus, if I do negative three times negative one times two, that's gonna be positive. Three times two is six. Okay, so what's this going to be equal to? Well, 27 plus six is gonna be 33, and then plus two is 35. And then minus three plus 18 is 21, plus six is 27. If I do 35 minus 27, I get eight, okay? So D here is equal to eight. So let's just erase all of this, okay? I'm gonna erase this. And I'm just gonna say that the value here is going to be eight. And again, this is gonna be used in every formula. So let me go back up to this part right here. I'm just gonna erase all this highlighting. We don't need it anymore. And I'm just gonna put that D is equal to eight, okay? Now I also need to know what D sub X is. I need to know what D sub Y is. And I need to know what D sub Z is because in each case, we're gonna be using this to get our answers. So let's go down and let's calculate these guys. So again, I'm gonna use my shortcut. I'm just gonna write this as negative 15, negative nine and negative 13. Just copy the first two columns. So two, three and two. So I'm gonna start by multiplying down. Okay, so I'm gonna multiply down. So negative 15 times three times negative three, which is gonna be 135, okay? Then plus, I'm gonna put some brackets around this. We're gonna multiply down again. So two times negative three times negative 13 is gonna be 78, okay? Then plus, I'm gonna multiply down again. So negative one times negative nine times two is gonna give me positive 18, okay? So then we're gonna subtract away I'm just gonna erase this. Normally I leave it, but it's a little bit heavy, so it might block us from seeing stuff. I'm gonna multiply up now. So negative 13 times three times negative one, which is gonna be 39, okay? And then plus, we're gonna multiply up. So you've got two times negative three times negative 15. And so that's going to be 90, okay? And then plus, we have negative three times negative nine times two. So that's gonna be 27 times two, which is 54. So let's go ahead and crank this out. So 135 plus 78 is 213, plus 18 is 231. Okay, then minus, if we do 39 plus 90, we get 129, plus 54 is 183, okay? So what we want is 231 minus 183, which is 48, okay? So this is 48. So let's erase all this and just put that this is equal to 48. Okay, so let's go back up and let's say this is 48. So now let's find D sub Y. So again, copy the first two columns. So negative three, negative one, negative one. You've got negative 15, negative nine, and negative 13. Again, I'm gonna multiply down to start. So I'm gonna multiply this way. So negative three times negative nine times negative three is negative 81, okay? Then plus, I'm gonna multiply down here. So you've got three negatives, so you know it's gonna be a negative. And then 15 times three is gonna be 45. And then plus, if I go down this way, negative one times negative one is positive one, then times negative 13 is negative 13, okay? 
So let's just go ahead and find this sum real quick. So negative 81 plus negative 45 is negative 126. Then if I add negative 13, I get negative 139. So let me just put that in there. So negative 139 and then minus, I'm gonna multiply up now. Let me get rid of these kind of arrows. So I'm gonna start here and go up. So you've got three negatives, so you know it's negative, and it's just gonna be nine there. Then for this guy, you've got negative 13 times negative three times negative three, so you know that's negative. And 13 times nine is basically what you'd have, and that's 117. So this would be minus 117, or you could put plus negative 117 if you want. And then lastly, you wanna do this one. So you've got negative three times negative one, which is three, times negative 15, which is minus 45, or plus negative 45. So negative nine minus 117 is negative 126. If I subtract away another 45, I get negative 171. So this is negative 171. Now you have minus a negative here, which becomes plus a positive. You get negative 139 plus 171, which is equal to 32. Okay, so this is 32. So let's erase all of this and say that this is equal to 32, okay? And let's go back up, and let's say this is 32. Okay, let's go back down. Okay, so this is the last one to do. Let me erase that highlighting, we don't need that. And I'm just gonna copy again the first two columns, and so I would have negative three, negative one, negative one again, two, three, and then two. So I'm gonna multiply down. So negative three times three times negative 13 is 117, okay, then plus, You've got two times negative nine times negative one, that's 18. Then plus, you've got negative 15 times negative one times two, that's going to give me positive 30, okay? So 117 plus 18 is 135, plus 30 is 165. So the first part is 165, then minus, let me kind of erase these, because they just get in our way. So let me go up now. So this way, negative one times three is negative three, times negative 15 is positive 45. Then plus, if I go up here, two times negative nine is negative 18, then times negative three is positive 54, okay? And then plus, let me go up here, negative 13 times negative one is 13, then times two is 26, okay? So 45 plus 54 is 99, plus 26 is 125, okay? So this is minus 125, and this would be equal to what? 165 minus 125 would be 40. Okay, so pretty simple. So let's erase all of this and erase that and just say this is equal to 40. So let's go back up and say this is 40. It does take a while to kind of go through and get your determinants, but once you have that set up, you're basically at a point where you have your solutions. So your x is equal to your d sub x over d, your y is equal to your d sub y over d, and your z is equal to your d sub z over d, okay? So in each case, the denominator is the same, it's gonna be eight. So let me just erase this, or I can actually just slide this down. So I'll just say this is equal to, equal to, equal to, I'm gonna put an eight in each denominator, okay? And the only thing that's gonna change is the numerator. So d sub x is 48, d sub z is 40, okay? And d sub y is 32. Okay, so if you go through and do the calculations, so let me slide this down just a little bit more so we can fit everything. 48 over eight is obviously six, 32 over eight is four, and 40 over eight is five. So X is six, Y is four, and Z is five. Okay, so as an ordered triple, this is six comma four comma five. Remember, this is your X, this is your Y, this is your Z. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at another example. Again, it's the same thing. It's just a tedious process, but we're gonna get through it. So in this example, we already have all the equations written again in standard form, that ax plus by plus cz equals d. So let's go right into it. We wanna start out with d. Again, this is the determinant of the coefficient matrix. So for the coefficients here, I've got negative five. I've got negative five again. I've got a negative one. I can go ahead and write that in, so negative one, okay? And then for this one, I've got a negative five, a negative four, and again, a negative one. And then for this one, I've got a negative one, I've got a negative three, and then a two, okay? So let's recap. I got negative five, negative five, and negative one, negative five, negative five, negative one. Negative five, negative four, negative one, negative five, negative four, and negative one. And then negative one, negative three, and two, 
negative one, negative three, and two. So you always wanna check stuff to make sure you got it right because the simplest error for getting a negative or something like that, you're gonna get the wrong answer, okay? So the next thing I wanna do is find my D sub X. So what's that equal to? Again, I just take the column with the kind of coefficients for X, in this case, it's gonna be this one, and I replace it with the constants of the system. So I'm gonna take and put a negative 21, a negative 22, and a negative 11. And then the rest of this is the same. So it's negative five, negative four, and negative three. And then it's negative one, negative one, and positive two, okay? So let me cut this one away and I'll drag this over. And now let me find my D sub Y, okay? So what is D sub Y? Again, the same thing. I'm going to kind of look at my column that is the coefficients for the Y variable. So that's this middle one here. And I'm gonna replace that with the constants. So everything else is the same. So you have your negative five, your negative five, and your negative one. This is going to be my constants. So negative 21, negative 22, and negative 11. And then for the last column, again, it stays the same. So negative one, negative one, and positive two, okay? So let's cut this one away. I'll just kind of slide this down and let's get the last one. So we want D sub Z as well, okay? So that's gonna be equal to what? So now I'm gonna look at this kind of last column. These are the coefficients for Z. I'm gonna replace that with the constants. So everything else is the same. So you've got your negative five, your negative five again, your negative one. You got your negative five, your negative four, and your negative three. Again, the last column, I'm just gonna replace it. So negative 21, negative 22, and negative 11, okay? So let's go ahead and get rid of this. Okay, so let's go back up and set everything up now. So I'm gonna grab this and move it to another sheet. And I'm just going to erase all of my highlighting. And let me go to that other sheet and paste this in for us, and then we'll be ready to go. Okay, so I can erase all this highlighting. I don't need any of that. And let me go back up here, and we're just gonna write some things down. So we know that we wanna find D, we wanna find D sub X, we want to find D sub Y, and we want to find D sub Z, okay? So we're going to have these values, and we're going to use them to calculate our X, Y, and Z. So we already know that X is equal to D sub X over D, okay? And then Y is equal to what? It's D sub Y over D. Let me give myself some space. I'll come over here and say Z is equal to D sub Z over D, okay? So we have all this set up, and let's go down. And let's start out with the value for D because this is gonna be used in everything. So let's just knock this one out first. So again, the quick way to do this is just to copy the first two columns. So you have your negative five, negative five, and negative one, negative five, negative four, and negative three. Again, you're gonna multiply down on that diagonal. So I'm gonna go down this way. So negative five times negative four times two. Negative five times negative four is 20. 20 times two is 40. Then plus, you're gonna go down this diagonal. So you have negative five times negative one times negative one, which is negative five. And then you're gonna go down this diagonal. You've got negative one times negative five, which is five, times negative three, which is negative 15, okay? So negative five plus negative 15 is negative 20, plus 40 is 20. So this first part of this is 20, then minus. Let me kind of erase these. And let me go up now. So if we go up, you have negative one times negative four times negative one, which is gonna be negative four. So this is negative four, then plus, if I go up again, negative three times negative one times negative five is going to be what? Well, it's basically just negative three times five, which is negative 15. Okay, so negative 15, again, because you have three negatives there. And then going up here, two times negative five times negative five, I know that's positive. And basically five times five is 25, then times two is 50, okay? So what is this gonna give me? Negative four plus negative 15 is negative 19, plus 50 is 31, okay? So basically what you have here is 20 minus 31, which is negative 11, okay? So we can erase this stuff. We have our first one. We'll say this is negative 11. We'll go back up and just put that this is negative 11. So in each case, I can go ahead and write negative 11 down here, okay? It's gonna be in every formula. And now we can go back and start getting some solutions, okay? So I find the determinant here I can go and plug it into my formula for X, and then I'll find the determinant that's D sub Y and then D sub Z, plug those in for their respective formulas, and we'll be done. So to calculate the determinant the fast way, again, I'm gonna copy the first two columns. So negative 21, negative 22, and negative 11, and then negative five, negative four, and negative three. Again, I'm gonna multiply going down first. So I'm gonna go this way. Negative 21 times negative four times two is gonna be 168, then plus, 
I'm going to do negative 5 times negative 1 times negative 11. So I know that's negative, and 5 times 11 is 55, so this would be negative 55 here. Then plus, if I go down this way, you have negative times negative times negative, which is negative, okay? And you basically have 22 times 3, which is 66. So what's this sum here? 168 plus negative 55 is 113 plus negative 66 is 47. Okay, so the first part of this is 47. Then minus, let me erase those, okay? And then I want to go up now. So negative 11 times negative 4 times negative 1. Well, we know that's negative. So it's going to be negative 44, right? 11 times 4 is 44. So negative 44 goes there. And then going up here, negative 3 times negative 1 is 3. And then times negative 21 is negative 63. So let's put plus negative 63. And then lastly, we have 2 times negative 22 times negative 5. If you do 2 times negative 2, you get negative 44. And then times negative 5, that's going to be 220. So plus 220. So what is negative 44 plus negative 63? That's going to be negative 107, okay? So if I did negative 107 plus 220, I get 113, okay? So I'm going to put minus 113 here. So this is going to be negative. And basically, what is 113 minus 47? That's going to be 66, so this would be negative 66, okay? So let's erase all of this. And we'll say this has a value of negative 66. And of course, we can just go back up and get our solution real quick. So for this one, it's negative 66. So we plug it into this formula. Negative 66 over negative 11 is positive 6. So we know that x is going to be 6, right? That's my x value, okay? So let's go down, and now we'll find y, okay? So let's go ahead and expand this by copying the first two columns. So negative 5, negative 5, and negative 1, negative 21, negative 22, and negative 11. Okay, so let's go ahead and just multiply down. Negative 5 times negative 22 is 110. And if I multiply by 2, I get 220. Okay, so that's the first one. And then plus, if I multiply going down here, so we would have negative 21 times negative 1 times negative 1. That's just negative 21. Okay, and then plus, if I multiply down here, I know that's negative. I'll go ahead and put that in. And 5 times 11 is 55. So what is the sum of 220 plus negative 21? Well, that's 199. And then plus negative 55, that's 144. So the first part of this is going to be 144. And then minus, remember, we're going to go up now. Let me erase these. When I go up, I'm going to start here and go up. So I know that's negative 22. If I go up here, that's going to be negative 55, right? Because, again, it's three negatives. 11 times 5 is 55. So it's negative 55, okay? Then this one, 2 times negative 5 is negative 10. Then times a negative, okay, so I know that's going to be positive, 21. Well, 10 times 21 is 210, okay? So what is negative 22 minus 55? That's negative 77. Then if I add 210, I get 133, okay? So what is 144 minus 133? That's going to give me positive 11. So let's erase this. And let's put an 11 here. And let's go back up. And we'll say that this is 11. And if I put an 11 here, 11 over negative 11 is negative 1. So my y value here is negative 1. Okay? So now I just need to find z. And I just need to find the determinant of this guy first. So I'm going to copy negative 5, negative 5, and negative 1. Negative 5, negative 4, and negative 3. Okay? So we're going to multiply going down. Negative 5 times negative 4 times negative 11 is going to be negative 220. Okay? Then plus negative 5 times negative 22 times negative 1. Well, we know that's negative. What's 5 times 22? Well, that's 110. So this would be negative 110. Okay? Then plus you've got negative 21 times negative 5 times negative 3, which is negative 315. Okay? All right, so now let's just go ahead and sum these. So negative 220 plus negative 110 is negative 330. Then if I add negative 315, I get negative 645. So the first part is negative 645. Again, then we subtract away this kind of second part where we're going to multiply up. So if I go up here, negative 1 times negative 4 is 4. Then times negative 21 is negative 84. Okay, so that's negative 84. Then plus... Negative 3 times negative 22 times negative 5. Well, negative 3 times negative 22 is 66. Then times negative 5 would be negative 330. Okay? So then lastly, I'm going to do this one. 
So you have a negative there because it's three negatives. So let's just put that in first. We know that five times five is 25, then times 11 would be 275. So this would be negative 275 here, okay? So what we wanna do is sum these amounts. So negative 84 plus negative 330, that's negative 414 plus negative 275 is negative 689. So this would be minus a negative 689, which is negative 645 plus a positive 689, which is equal to what? It's just 689 minus 645, which is nothing more than 89 minus 45, which is 44. Okay, so this is going to be 44. So let's write that in. We'll just erase this. Okay, we'll say this value is 44. We can erase this. We don't need it anymore. And we can go back up now. We have our solution. So this is 44. So this is 44. So my solution here would be negative 4. Right, so 44 over negative 11 is negative four. So I'll just write a negative four in here for Z, okay? And so my order triple here is six, comma negative one, comma negative four. Again, X is six, Y is negative one, Z is negative four. 